Hello and welcome to 7 hours of Node.js tutorials and instruction. This video is made up of 15 tutorials for learning Node.js that build upon each other much like the chapters of a book. You will build projects and learn the fundamentals of Node.js, the Express.js framework, and MongoDB. Before beginning, I recommend that you already know the basics of JavaScript. This tutorial is for Node.js beginners, but not absolute beginners in JavaScript. Throughout the lessons in this video, I will mention links being available in the description below. I've compiled all of these links into one GitHub resource that you will find in the description. Hi, I'm Dave Gray, and I'm the creator of these Node.js tutorials. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel for more tutorials like this one. You can also follow me on Twitter, and if you're feeling generous, you can even buy me a cup of coffee. Let's get started learning Node.js with Chapter 1. Here we can see Node.js is a JavaScript runtime. It's not a new language, it's not a different language, it's a JavaScript runtime, and it's built on Chrome's V8 JavaScript engine. It's not a framework or a library either, but it does run on the server, and that's what makes it different. We're used to JavaScript running in the browser where the HTML and CSS is, and that's all on the front end, but Node.js is on the back end. So you'll want to go to nodejs.org if you haven't already download, no, downloaded Node.js, and you'll want to download the recommended for most users version is fine, or if you want to get the one with the latest features, either way, download Node.js, and you probably already have it or are familiar with it, but if you're not, I just want to mention I will be using Visual Studio Code, and you can download that code editor. You can also use others that you're familiar with. However, my examples will be with Visual Studio Code, and you can get that for free at code.visualstudio.com. Okay, with Node.js and Visual Studio Code both downloaded and installed, let's get started. Okay, I've got Visual Studio Code open, and you can see I have created a new folder just for this tutorial called 01tut. You can create a folder and name it whatever you want to, but open that folder up in Visual Studio Code, and then go ahead and create a new file named server.js. Now with that said, I want to mention you should already know some HTML, CSS, and JavaScript before this tutorial series. Possibly maybe some experience with other libraries and frameworks like React or Vue, but that's not necessary. But you will need the basics of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So while it is a Node.js beginners tutorial series. It's not an absolute beginners for web devs. If you haven't already learned HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, you should probably start there before attempting this series. Now with that said, we need to focus on how Node.js differs from vanilla JS, just plain old JavaScript. First of all, and what will be the running theme throughout the differences, is that Node runs on a server not in the browser, and that is a big difference. So you're working on the back end, not the front end. We're not relating to the browser anymore. And because of that, the console is now in the terminal window. It's not in the console window of DevTools in the browser because we're not using the browser at all. Let's open a terminal window by going to the terminal menu and choosing new terminal in VS Code. And with the new terminal window open, we will be able to run node right inside the terminal. So if I type node, we're now running the console directly in the terminal. So if we can add in any actual JavaScript that would be an expression such as two plus two, and we get four in return. So this is just like the DevTools console, except we're now using the terminal for node. And with that said, we can also exit by pressing Control C, and then it will tell us to press Control C one more time. And now we've exited Node. But what if we put a console statement in our file? So if I just put in not condole, console, there we go, console log, and I put in your standard hello world and save, we can also run any JavaScript file from the terminal with Node. We'll just type Node and then the name of the file. We don't need to put the JS extension after. I'll press Enter, and now we get Hello World in the terminal. Another difference between Node and vanilla JavaScript 
is that there is a global object instead of a window object. The window object, once again, referred to the browser where we could do window dot inner height and different properties like that. The global object is much smaller, but it does have some of the same properties we were used to seeing in the window object. So what I'm going to do is just say console.log and I'll put global in here because global is the key word for the global object and I'll save. And now we can run our file once again by typing node server in the terminal and it logged the full global object. I'll expand the terminal window up and scroll just so we can see this object here. So we have our hello world again. Then here's the global object and you can see there's a clear interval, clear timeout, set interval, set timeout. Those are things that we already had in vanilla JavaScript that we're used to. And it's a much smaller object than the window object if you were to go into a browser and to log that. But that is another difference in Node.js. A fourth difference in Node.js is that there are common core modules that we will explore and vanilla JavaScript doesn't really have those. These are modules that relate to the operating system, the file system, and other things that we can do on the server. And to import those common core modules, as well as any other modules, we use common JS modules, common JS imports, instead of ES6 imports. And now there is some work being done to use the same syntax that we typically use in vanilla JavaScript, that is such as import whatever name from whatever file. And that is how we do it in ES6. However, CommonJS uses a require statement. So let's go ahead and import something and we can learn how to do that with, so let's call this OS and set this equal to require dot OS. And that's pretty much all there is to it. It's just a different syntax than we're used to seeing with the import. And now that we've imported the OS, let's go ahead and get some information about the OS from it. So we can say OS.type and we'll go ahead and log that. And I'm going to copy this down a couple of times and change type to a couple of other values we can get about the OS, such as version and home directory, and that is abbreviated with home dir, you can see that. I'll comment out the global object log because it takes up a little more space. Let's go ahead and save this, and once again, call node server in the terminal. And here we get our hello world, and then you can see OS type delivers Windows NT, OS version is Windows 10 Pro, and then OS home directory shows my home directory in users slash Dave Gray. There are a couple of other values that we always have access to in Node. And let me type the first one out. It's dir name for directory name. And it starts with two underscores. And that will always give us the directory name in Node. And then the other one is two underscores and file name for the file name we're using. Here I can see I'm being inconsistent on the semicolon, so if anything, I'll just remove the one I typed. Let's go ahead and save that, and once again, call node server in the terminal. And here's what we get. After the home directory that was delivered from the OS common core module in our console log statement right here, you can see directory name, the value that we have. We don't even have to import a module to get that. Is this full length here? to my 01 tut directory. And then you can see file name gives that same full path, but also includes the file name at the end. There's another common core module that we can import, and I'll do that right now, and we'll call it path because it is called path as well. So there is path with the common JS import, and now we can use file name within path. So let me give some examples of that to get more values. Here we'll log the path directory name and pass in the file name and we'll see that it is very similar to what we just got by using the directory name here. However, if we're using path, that might come in handy as well. There's also path.base name and we'll also pass in the file name there. And I'll copy this down one more time. And there we'll just change base name, and this will be extension name. 
and we'll go ahead and save that. Now let's run the file one more time with Node in the terminal and see what we got in return. So after our directory name and file name here, if I drag this up just a little, we can see it all. So we have the directory, that's the value before we used the path import, and here's the server file name before we used the path. Now the final three that we used with the path import, we got the same as we did above for the directory. So using the path directory name is the same as using this value in this instance. And then the base name was just server JS. So that allowed us to just pull the file name out instead of having everything included as the file name value does up here on line 22. And then the extension name gave us just the extension of the file, the .js. Now what I've found to be even more useful than any one of those individual values is to, whoa, I had my fingers on the wrong keys, console.log path dot parse and then pass in the file name and we'll see what we get in return once we call this one more time in the terminal node server and here we get an object with all of these values so we have the root the directory the base the extension and the file name itself. So we can really pull all of that together in any way we want to if we just go ahead and parse and then get each individual value as well. Now besides the common core modules, we can also pull in packages that other developers have created and some of you may be familiar with Node Package Manager already and I will cover that in some detail in the near future. But we can also create our own modules and so we have a couple of imports here. We'll make room to import one more. But first in the file tree, let's create another file and I'll just call this math.js. Inside of math.js, I'm going to create some functions. I'll call the first one add and set it equal to a anonymous function. It's an arrow function, really. And from there, it'll just be a plus b, which would return the sum of the two parameters a and b. Now, I'm going to copy this down three times, and we can just change these. So here we'll have subtract. They'll all have the two parameters a and b. We can also have multiply, and we can have divide. So instead of a plus b, of course, it would be a minus b, a times b, and a divided by b. Right now, though, we, while we have these four functions, we have not exported them in any way. So we can have a statement at the bottom that says module.exports, and then we can set that equal to an object and we can pass in the names of all the functions. There is another way to do this that I'll show you right afterwards. But first, let's attempt this way, which is a common way to see this. So we're exporting all of the functions that we defined. To import these back in the server, we need to come over here and let's just define math. And we'll set this equal to require and now since it's not a common core module, we can't just say math. We have to say dot slash, and now math is available to us there. But we don't need the JS extension. So we can save that, and then let's go ahead and comment out all of these console logs. And we'll add the console log for the math underneath here. So console.log, and then we could say math.add, and we could pass in two variables, two and three. And let's go ahead and call that below with our node server. And we got hello world, of course, it's still in there. And then we got the total, five. So there is math being called. However, we don't need to call it as an object where we use dot notation. We could destructure right here. So instead of math, we could destructure and just say add and remove the math dot and save. And this should work in the same way. So if we go ahead and call the server again, and we got five once again with our hello world. Now we could go ahead and destructure and pull in the rest of the functions as well. Subtract, 
multiply and divide. We have all those functions available to us now. So if we go ahead and copy down and we'll change each one to subtract, multiply and divide, we can save, go ahead and call the file once again. And here are the values. Looks like I'll need to move this just a little bit to see all the values, but we've got five and then two minus three is minus one. Two times three is six and two divided by three is essentially two thirds, 0.66 and on. Now before we're finished with the custom module, let's go back to math and I'll show you one other way this could be done. Instead of combining all of these at the end, there we go, if I'll comment out this export here, instead of the const here with each definition, I'll just select all of those, we could change this to exports dot and then it's essentially adding each of these functions to the export. So exports.add is equal to this anonymous function, and exports.subtract is equal to this anonymous function, and so on. But this will work in the same way. So once again, if we go ahead and call the server file from Node, we've still exported all of those functions and we actually deconstructed them over here to pull them in. So you can also export in that way instead of using module exports at the bottom. Okay, with that said, we have covered quite a bit, but there's one more difference to point out that we will see down the road, and I'll just put it here under number five, and that is Node.js is missing some of the APIs that are available to vanilla JavaScript, and one notable one is Fetch. But of course, we can always pull in packages into Node, and there is a large amount of packages available through NPM for Node, so we won't miss it that much. In the next tutorial, we'll be working with files as far as reading, writing, creating, updating, deleting, all of the things that we can do with files, and we'll be using the File System Common Core module for that. Today we're going to look at the file system common core module for Node.js. It allows us to create, read, update, and delete files and work with directories on the server. And that's because Node.js is a JavaScript runtime that actually runs on the server instead of in the browser. Now I'm going to click Docs at nodejs.org because nodejs.org is the source of truth for information about Node, much like MDN would be the source of truth for information about vanilla JavaScript, as well as HTML and CSS. Currently, the stable version that I have installed is 14.17.5. As you view this tutorial, the versions that are stable may change. So go ahead and click on whichever version you have. And now you can see we have Node.js documentation. Today we're looking at the file system module, so I can click that right here. And there are many things you can do with the file system, with directories and different files. So amongst all of those things, what I usually do is press Control F, I'm on Windows, and then I type what I'm looking for. And we're going to start out by reading files. So when I type read file, I can see the fs.read file, and it shows the structure here for what I want to call and then you can click it and get details about that. I just wanted to show you how to find the different documentation on Node.js. And now let's get started in Visual Studio Code as we work with the FS, the File System Common Core Module. I've got Visual Studio Code open with an empty index.js file. I've also got a files directory here in the file tree and you can see a couple of starter text files, a lorem text file that has a lot of text in it and a starter text file that just says, hi, my name is Dave. We're going to start by importing the FS Common Core module here, and we use CommonJS imports for that, and so it's just require FS. After that, let's go ahead and read that starter file. So we need to specify the file, and it's in files, and then it's at starter.text. From there, we have a callback function that has an error and data that we read. And so we'll say if error, we need to throw the error. And otherwise, 
let's log the data to the console. Now, if you remember, the console in Node.js is in the terminal. So I'm going to press Control and Backtick to open a terminal window. You could also do that from the terminal menu. Now here to run our little node file in index, we just type node and then index. We don't need the JS. And let's go ahead and take a look at this data from starter. And notice after we read the data, it's presented as buffer data. So that's what we get right here. If we want to be able to read the data, we can put a toString method afterwards. I'll save and I'll go ahead and call this again. And now we can see, hi, my name is Dave in the console. But instead of to string, we can also put in a parameter here that says the encoding or defines the encoding. So we'll say UTF-8 before the callback as a perimeter. And now let's go ahead and run it again, node index in the terminal. And once again, we get, hi, my name is Dave. Now notice the throw error here. According to the node documentation, if we get an uncaught exception, we need to go ahead and catch that. And I'm just going to paste this in. If we have an uncaught error, we should exit. So we listen for this uncaught exception using process. Now process is one of those values that node has available to us. We don't need to import it. It's already there. So we're listening for an uncaught exception. Then we pass in the error to the callback here and we're just logging the console error. There was an uncaught error and then we put the error there. And then we exit the application. And this is direct from the node documentation. So let's go ahead and throw an error on purpose. I'll just look for a file to read that doesn't exist named hello. And once again, we'll call node index. And you can see we get an uncaught error. And here it is, there is no such file or directory. Now let's change this back to starter so we can keep reading the data that exists. And I'm going to put a console log statement underneath. And this is to demonstrate that read file and node in general, the functions or methods you'll find from node will be asynchronous. And so we're logging the data here, but we're also logging hello here. And Node has the ability to say, I'm going to process this, but let's go ahead and tackle the rest of the tasks in the program. And when I finish reading the file, I'll get that data to you. If you're familiar with async await, this should be a familiar concept. But let's go ahead and save this, and let's see which we get in the console first, hello or the data. And we get hello, and then we get, hi, my name is Dave. So Node said it would read the file, but it went ahead and processed this console log statement, and it actually was logged to the console first. And then when Node completed reading the file, it logged the data to the console. Instead of hard coding the path like we see here in read file, there is a better way. And let's pull in the path module to do that. So we have path, and then we use require, and we're requiring path. And the reason is, is the slashes sometimes, if you're familiar with different operating systems, are sometimes backwards, sometimes forward. There can be some problems, not always, but there can be when you hard code file paths like that. But if we use the path module, we can eliminate this problem. So let's use path.join. I typed JSON, there we go, join. And then we need to specify first the directory name and that's two underscores first and remember that's a value that's always available to us in node after the directory name we'll say the files directory to attach on to concatenate to that directory name and then we need to say the actual name of the file itself so now we've got starter text so if we supply this instead of hard coding a file name, it's a much better approach. Let's go ahead and save and run this one more time. And everything still works as it did. And now that we know how to read files and catch an error, let's go ahead and copy the read file. And underneath this console log statement, I'll paste this in and we will write a file, but it's just a little different. I can change just a little bit of the copy and paste. So instead of read file, we've got write file. And this path here will change the file name because we're going to write a new file. This will be reply.txt. 
Now we don't have to specify the UTF-8. That is by default now. We will have a callback, and the callback will only have an error. We're not reading data, we're writing it. So if we have an error, we'll throw the error. And here, instead of data, we can just say operation complete, or more specifically, let's say write complete. And we can save this, and now let's go ahead and run this code. And we got an error. Oh, and that's because I forgot to specify exactly what we're writing to the file. I'll just say, nice to meet you. And then we have our callback, had things out of order. So again, path name, content we're going to put in the file, and then the callback. With that saved, let's run it. And there we go. We've got, hello, hi, my name is Dave, and then the write is complete. Let's look at the reply file we created, and it says, nice to meet you. I'm going to copy all of this write file operation down one, and then we can change it to append file, which is updating a file, adding more content to it. We'll go ahead and create a different file here, and that is to show you that a append file, we'll go ahead and create a file as well if it doesn't exist. So let's just call this test, and we'll say testing text or something like that here. And other than that, it is basically the same syntax as write. We'll save this and go ahead and run the code again. And we got write complete and append complete. And then notice, due to the asynchronous fashion of Node.js, the read completed last this time. And we have, hi, my name is Dave, after the other operations completed. In the file tree, we now have our test file as well, and it has the testing text in it. So append file, worth noting that it will modify an existing file and can append content to it, but will also it will create a file if it doesn't exist. So due to the asynchronous nature of Node.js and these different methods we're calling here from read file, write file, and append file, if we wanted to modify the file that we created, such as reply, it would be better to put append file, I'm going to cut this, and put it inside of the callback of the write file operation. That way, it would definitely create the file, and then we would be ready to append to it, instead of wondering if we would possibly create the file first with append, and then write over it with write file. So here, let's change this to reply.txt, and it says, nice to meet you. Let's give a couple of line breaks, and then say, Yes, it is. And if we save that, we'll go ahead and delete the test that we're no longer using. And our reply, because we will create it once again. So we've got reply, and then we will modify reply with append, and it's inside of the callback of write file. Call node index in the terminal. Hello, write complete. And then we got the read operation completed, and then the append completed. So if we look at reply now, it says, nice to meet you, and yes it is, in the order we expected. Now as you might imagine, if we wanted to do something to this file after we added more content, and we wanted to make sure it happened in the order it needed to, such as renaming the file, then that would need to be in the callback of the append file. I'm going to go ahead and copy append file, and then inside of the callback, I'm going to paste it and change this append here to rename. So we can rename the file, and we're grabbing the reply file, and then we're going to replace this parameter with what we're going to name it, and we'll just call this new reply. And then, of course, it has a callback with an error as well, and then we can put rename complete. Now let's go ahead and call all of this in the terminal with node index. And it does happen in the order we expect. We got write, append, and rename, and you can see this time the read operation completed before the others. Once again, asynchronous, so we don't know which will happen 
before the next, but in this way we're controlling it because we're putting the append inside the callback of the write, and we're putting the rename inside the callback of the append. Let's go ahead and look at our new reply, and it does have the content we expected. Now, if you've worked with JavaScript for a while, at this point you would be saying, yes, this is nice, Dave, but this is starting to look like what is called callback hell. And yes, it is, because we're putting one inside the next, inside the next, and they're all inside the callbacks of the other. So we are controlling the flow, but at the same time, we're able to avoid this in vanilla JavaScript using async await. And now we can look at how to avoid it in Node by doing the same. I'm going to comment all of this code out. And up here we can get rid of the console log hello as well. And then at the top where we have fs, we'll switch this to fs promises and let's attach dot promises to our import here. So we are now importing the file system promises instead of just fs. And now I'm going to create a function and I'm going to call it file ops for file operations. And this will be an async function. And then inside this function, we can use try catch. So here we'll have our catch for any errors. And now inside here, I'll just say console.error and pass in the error. Or we could throw the error, but that's actually what's happening here. And we're catching them, so it will not be an uncaught error. And then inside the try block, I'm going to define data and set that equal to fs, or sorry, before that, await fs promises dot read file. And now we need to specify our file path. And that's what we have here. Part of why I saved that so I could just copy it up. And I'm going to hide the file tree momentarily so we can see a little more. After that, we can still specify utf8. And then we don't need the callback here that has the error and the data because we're using await and we're catching the error down here. So this should be just fine now. Now once we have the data, let's go ahead and log the data once again. And I didn't remember my semicolon after that being a little inconsistent. Okay, so we have file ops. I'll delete the read file operation. And now here, we're just going to call file ops into action. We'll have node index in the terminal. Oh, and I didn't save the file yet. There, I'll save the file. Hopefully we don't have unexpected results now. And node index in the terminal. And we got, hi, my name is Dave, the data that we expected to get. Let's add another await in this process of file operations. We'll say await fs promises. And now we will write a file. And this file is going to be promise write. So we'll have the same type of path once again, which I can just copy and paste but we'll just call this promise write. And after that, we wanna pass in the data that we just read. And now I'm going to copy down once again. And after we write a file, let's go ahead and append to the file. And now in the append area, we'll just say, nice to meet you. Oh, let's put a couple of line breaks here with backslash lowercase n, so two line breaks. And one more copy down. And now let's rename. And we're renaming promise right, so we'll just copy this once again. And instead of content now, we need to put the new name of the file, and this will be promise complete. And we can save that. So you can see we're taking the data from the starter, then we're writing a new file called promise write, then we're appending to the file, and then we are renaming the file. And finally, let's go ahead and copy these two lines once again and put them right here. 
And now we'll call this new data. And here we want to read the new file, which is promise complete. And then we'll go ahead and log that data as well. So you can see there's several different operations happening here. We are reading data from a file, then we're writing it to a new file, then we're appending to that new file, then we're renaming that new file, then we're reading the new file and logging the data from that file. So I hope that's not confusing. I just wanted to show all the operations that we have gone over and then use them in an async await fashion. So here is node index. And here was the original content. Hi, my name is Dave. But then the new file has hi, my name is Dave and nice to meet you. And let's go ahead and look at the file tree. There it is. And we've got promise complete right here that has hi, my name is Dave. Nice to meet you. Let's go back to the index and let's add one more thing right here. I'm just going to copy this one line and above it, I'll paste in again. And here, instead of write file, I'm going to say unlink. And after that, we don't even need to pass in data because unlink is actually a delete. So we can delete this original file that is called starter text. There it is. And now that we have it being deleted, and I can get rid of the space here as well. So we're reading the file, logging the data to the console, and then deleting that file, then creating the new file. And we can even get rid of promise complete here again. And we'll get rid of new reply. We're not using that anymore. And let's make sure we save the index and we'll call it into action. Once again, we got the same in the console and we have promise complete over here, but no more starter text. It's gone because we deleted it with the unlink right here. And this is also available without FS promises as the first examples I showed that were just FS and then read file, write file, and so on. Unlink is what you would use to delete a file. Okay, now I'm going to create a new file over here, and I'm just going to call this stream.js. Now, if we have larger files, sometimes it is good to not grab all of the data at once. It could be too much, just like moving a large pile of sand bucket by bucket, or moving all the water in a swimming pool bucket by bucket, rather than attempting to grab everything all at once. So this could be more efficient and a little bit easier on the application if we do this. So let's say const fs, and once again, let's require fs, not fs promises, just fs. And here, I'm going to define rs, and we're going to set this equal to fs.create read stream. From here, I'm going to specify our files slash lorem.txt. Once again, you could use the path module, would probably be a better option. I'm just doing this quickly, so I'm hard coding that in. And now putting in the encoding, and this is UTF-8 once again. So we've created a readable stream, and we've specified the encoding in the options. Now let's go ahead and specify a writable stream. And this is going to be ws.create write stream. And now what do we want to write this to would be the question. So let's call this from stream. Ah, let's call it new dash lorem because it is our lorem text still. That works. So we have new lorem. And really, we don't need to specify anything else here. We already specified what was being read is UTF-8. So we're good there. And I did make a mistake here. I needed to make this FS, not WS, because this is getting this from the FS module, the create write stream. And that's why it didn't help me out when I was typing it. Okay, so once we have that, we need to listen for the data coming in from the stream. So here is our readable stream, and we can say on. Now we're listening for the data that's coming in. And here, let's say this is a chunk of data or a data chunk, if you will. And inside of here, we could console log the chunk or we could just write 
to our writable stream and pass in that data chunk. So let's do that and I will save. And now let's go ahead and run this. So we'll type node stream. And notice now we have new lorem as well. And this will be a large file of lorem, probably about a thousand lines. Yes, so it did it very rapidly, but once again, a example of a large file, just a test example. We could have much larger files, but in that case, when you're working with a large file, this is much more efficient. Now, speaking of efficiency, I'll go ahead and comment this out. There is even a better way to do this. Instead of the listener, just take the readable stream and use pipe, and then you can pass to the writable stream. This will accomplish the same thing, and piping is more efficient than this structure with the listener here. I'm going to save this. I'm going to delete the new lorem file. And now let's go ahead and run our stream once again by typing node stream in the terminal. And you can see we once again got our new lorem text file and it has all 1000 lines of lorem ipsum text. Okay, I'm going to create one more new file in the file tree and call this dir.js, which is short for directory. Once again, let's go ahead and define fs at the top and require it. And after we do that, what I want to do is create a directory with fs.mkdir, which stands for make directory. And we'll have, let's just call it new. We're specifying what we want to call it right here. And then there's a callback that has an error. And this is the same as we've seen previously. So if error, we could throw error. Now I won't go ahead and copy and paste the uncaught error handling code in here that I showed you earlier just to save time, but you could use it in the same way. So if we have an error, throw an error, and if not, we've created the new directory. So we'll just log uh, directory created. And we can save this. Let's go ahead and run our code. So here we'll type node dir, which is our new file, dir. And directory is created. And now we can see here is our new directory. Now, earlier in the tutorial, we threw an error on purpose because we attempted to read a file that did not exist. Well, we can check to see if files and directories exist or not, so we don't get those errors. And we also might want to check in this regard to say if the folder, if the directory already exists, let's not create it because we don't want to write over what we already have. So we can use the exists sync method. And let's start out with if, and then we'll say if it does not, and not would be the exclamation mark, fs.exists, is it exists? Yeah, two s's, exists sync. And then we'll say the same folder slash or the same directory dot slash new. So if it does not exist, then go ahead and do what's inside of the if statement. And we'll put that right there. Let's go ahead and close that out and close this out and save. And now let's see if we create the directory when we run it in the terminal. And no, no directory was created because it exists. So this says, if it does not exist, create it. So let's go ahead and delete the directory. And now let's run this once again. And now it created the directory again because it did not exist. You might find checking for file existence fairly useful before you attempt to delete a file if it exists or not, or before you attempt to even rename a file or copy a file, several things that you want to make sure the file exists. Likewise, you can check directories in this regard. Now let's go ahead and write some code that deletes the new directory. Okay, let's copy this down, highlight everything, and bring it down here to line 10. And now let's check to say if it does exist, and this is the folder, we're going to remove the directory, and that is rmdir for remove directory. So this would be a zero sum game here. If it does not exist, create it. And if it does exist, remove it. So now let's say directory removed. And 
We'll be able to tell by the console, but in the file tree, we should not have a directory when these operations are complete. And the directory was removed. It already existed, so it wasn't created, but it was removed. Let's go ahead and run it again. And now it was created and removed. And so it's still not in our file tree, but we can see both operations completed. Today we're learning about Node Package Manager, which is also commonly known as NPM. And when you install Node.js from Node.js.org, which I have open right here, you also install NPM. However, NPM also has its own site and documentation at npmjs.com. So let's take a look at that. And you can see the npmjs.com site here. One little quirk I really like about npmjs.com is they give wrong answers for what NPM stands for in the top left. So every time you come back to the site, you'll see something different here. Right now it says new prog mixtape. It really stands for Node Package Manager. And NPM provides thousands of packages for us to use in our applications. The difference between a Node Common Core module and an NPM package is that NPM packages are Node modules that are created by third parties, in other words, other developers. So let's search for something here like Axios, which is a Node package, and we see the results. Axios is at the top with an exact match, and you can see they're also ranked by popularity, quality, and maintenance, and you see the little chart over here to the right. So essentially, other developers create reusable modules and share them through NPM. So instead of recreating the wheel, we can search for a module that already exists and then we can import that module into our applications. Now today I'm going to go over what I consider to be essential NPM knowledge, and we're also going to install some packages that we'll need in the near future when we create an event logger. Now I'm gonna start by showing you where the documentation is at npmjs.com. Click on documentation at the top, then it takes us to docs.npmjs.com. Now when we're there, what we're really working with is the CLI. And that's what developers typically use when they're integrating NPM into their projects. And there's CLI commands, configuring NPM, and using NPM. There's quite a few commands. I'll just go over what I consider to be essential, what I use the most, and what you really need to get started. But I always want you to know where to find that documentation, and reading the docs is definitely a big part of being a developer. Okay, let's move over to Visual Studio Code. I've got Visual Studio Code open, and I have a new folder for the tutorial, and then an index.js file that is completely empty right now. We're going to start off by just putting a console log statement and saying testing inside of our index.js, and we can save that file. Now I want to open a terminal, so we can go to the terminal menu, or since I'm in Windows, I'm just going to press Control and the back tick, and it will open up a terminal. Now in the terminal, we can install a node package globally that we can just call from the command line without adding it to a specific project. So I'd like to do that first. I'll type npm, and then the word install works, but you can also use the alias i, or there's also an alias add. I typically use just i. From there, I want to install node mon. And this is a great development package, but it's also good to install globally because you might just want to call it from the command line. And with node mon, we want to put dash G. Now, what NodeMon does is it monitors your files, and as you save, it automatically restarts the server. So we're not always typing node and the file name in the terminal. It just kind of does it for us. So I'm going to go ahead and press Enter to install this package globally, and then when it finishes, we'll see how it works with our index.js. Okay, and the package installed, we're ready to try out NodeMon. So let's type NodeMon instead of Node, and it's going to look for the index.js by default, so I don't really need to type that name. But if I had a different file name like server, I would type server or something like that. Right now I'm just going to type NodeMon, and it will know to look for the index.js. And it says it is watching the extensions JS, MJS, and JSON, and it started our index.js. And here we can see the message testing. So it did go ahead and log to the console testing. Now I'm going to change the file, add an exclamation mark, and save. 
And then you can see it was restarting due to changes, and then it went ahead and ran the file and we got testing in the console. So that's how Nodemon works. Now to exit Nodemon, you can press Control C, just like we would to exit a Node application that we were running if we tested it by typing Node Index. And now that you know how to install a package globally, let's go ahead and add a package to our project. But before we do that, we have to initialize NPM for our project. I'll type npm and then just like when we initialize git, if you're familiar with working with git, we type init. Now it will ask some questions at the beginning. If I want to skip those questions, I'll just put in the flag hyphen yes to answer yes to all the defaults. But I'll go ahead and not do that just to show you the questions it will ask. And then I'll just press enter on each one to go ahead and accept the defaults. But first it's going to initialize npm. Okay, it's asking me the package name and the default would be 03 tut, what I named the folder. And then the version by default is 1.0.0. Description, you don't have to enter one. Uh, entry point by default is index.js, but we could change that to server.js or something else if we wanted to. Test command, nothing to enter there. We don't have a Git repository yet, no keywords. You could put your name for author if you want to. And there's the license by default. And then it says, is all of this okay? And the default is yes. So I'll just press enter one more time. Now, if we look over in the file tree, we see a package JSON file. And this pretty much has all the information that we answered those questions to. Now the package JSON file is important because this is what NPM reads to know what packages to install for your project. And that is because this file will stay with your repository if we send it to GitHub, but we won't send the packages itself. And that way we don't have to transfer as much data or store as much data. And then when somebody else clones or installs this application, it can just read the package JSON. Or likewise, if we were to host it and build the application, at a host and run a build command, then it would install those packages there without having to transfer them over from GitHub. So now that we have this, let's go ahead and add a package to our program. And I'm going to say npm i, and then I'll type date-fns, which stands for date functions, and press enter. And it will install this package as a dependency, which we will see in our package JSON file. Okay, that completed installing, and we now see dependencies listed in our package JSON file. And these are production dependencies we see listed here. So when the project would build with a build command, it would include this package because we would know it would be part of the overall application that needed to go into production. But we can also have dev dependencies. Before we get to the dev dependencies though, let's go ahead and look at the file tree because now we have a package-lock.json and we don't want to change anything in there. That's just handled by npm, but you will see it show up in its file tree. We just work with package.json. We also see a node modules folder and this can get fairly large fairly fast because there will be a lot of files and folders in here. And that's because any dependency that we add can also pull in other dependencies. And if this package needs all of these dependencies, this gets very large. And that's why we don't wanna store that in GitHub. So what we should do is always add a dot git ignore file. Oh, and I didn't press dot, I got a slash. There we go, dot git ignore. And in this git ignore file, the first thing you should add should be node underscore modules. And I'll go ahead and press save. And now if we were to initialize git and save this to GitHub, the node modules folder would not be included. And that's important because there is a lot of data in node modules. Now I'm not going to delete the node modules folder right now, but if you were to clone another repository and it had the package JSON but did not have the node modules, you would get an error if you tried to run or tried to start the project. So what you want to do is type npm install 
And if you just type npm install and press enter, it's going to read the package JSON file and go ahead and install the node modules you need. And that's important, of course, when you're pulling down another repo, say from GitHub, maybe you cloned it, and then you want to install the node modules that are used in that application. Okay, with the date FNS dependency, let's go ahead and use it now in our index.js. I'll get rid of this console log statement that we have here. And at the top, we want to go ahead and import, and we're going to destructure because we'll just import format. And this is using common JS again, so we use require, and then we'll say date dash FNS. And now that we have that imported, we can use it in the statement. So I'll just put another console log here. And I'm going to paste in the format, but then we can go over it. So we're calling the format function from date FNS, and it accepts a new date. And after it accepts a new date, we have to tell it how we want it to format it. And of course, you have to read the docs to know how to format it. And I am pulling in the year, the month, and, and I didn't mean to do that. Let's undo that the month and the days, and then I'm putting a tab in, and then I'm putting in the hours, minutes, and seconds. And so this will be tab delimited, so we'll have two columns. We'll have the date and the time, and we could use this in a log format, and that will be the end goal eventually as we learn about events. But right now, let's just format this date and go ahead and send it to the console. Now remember, we're not running NodeMon again yet, so let's go ahead and add NodeMon as a dev package to our project. Okay, back in package JSON, we're going to add a dev dependency. Now easily, I could run NodeMon right here from the terminal as a global dependency because we'd already installed it, but I just want to use this as an example of installing a dev dependency. So here we type npm i once again, and I'll type nodemon, but then I want to give the flag, you could do dash dash save dash dev, but there is just a shorthand for that, and it's dash with a capital D, and this will save nodemon as a dev dependency. So I'll go ahead and press enter and let that install. All right, now with NodeMon installed as a dev dependency, you can now see that in the package JSON as well, and it lists a dev dependency. So let's talk about scripts and how to run our application using scripts, because that's what a server would use if we were to host this somewhere. And you often see a start script, a dev script, and a build script. If you're familiar with React or something similar, you have definitely seen some of those before. So let's go ahead and add a start script. And now in the start script, we need to just go ahead and call node, not node mon, but node. And we can say index right here because that is what we want to run our project with. But then let's go ahead and we don't need a test script. So let's change this to dev and I'll go ahead and replace the test script now with node mon, and we'll go ahead and we can specify index here as well, but remember it defaults to index.js anyway. So let's go ahead and save that. Now, if we're to start the project, start is one of the few words that works without the word run. So we could just type npm start and start our project, but we don't need to do that yet. We want to use dev. So let's say npm run dev and press enter. And you can see nodemon started and we've got the date over here with the format I gave it, which is year, month, and day. And then there's a tab spacing and then we have the time and you can see we're using military time, which would be zero through 23 hours and then minutes and seconds. Now back in the index, if we were to make any other changes, NodeMon will continue to watch this and go ahead and restart the server. So then if I just put another console log and said, hello, save the file, NodeMon restarts, and we should get the new information in the console as well. And that's what we get with the hello. Now I wanna go ahead and stop this again because we wanna add another dependency to our project. While you don't have to look at the package JSON while you install dependencies, I'm going to go ahead and do that so we can see the new dependency added. And here I'm going to type npm i for install once again, and this is a production dependency, so we don't need to put a flag after it, it'll go directly to the dependencies. 
and we're going to install UUID, which allows us to generate IDs that of course are different for each entry. So I'll go ahead and press enter. And now we can see UUID installed here as a dependency in our package JSON also. So let's go back to index and use this package as well. So we need to import it at the top and here we'll say const. And now this is a little different. Now with ES6 imports, we would say import UUID as and give the name that we want to give it. Now here we need to import a version, which is a specific version, it's V4 but we want to import that as UUID. And then we can say equals require and then specify UUID here. Now you may see this done in different ways as well. So instead of the V4 this way, some could just use it as V4, or you might see an import and just here have UUID and let me get rid of that curly brace there. And then in the code, they could possibly use it as UUID dot V4 and call it that way as well. What we're going to do is use it as UUID. So back here, we wanna make sure it is V4. So I'm going to say import V4 as UUID. And now we can use this and this will log a different ID or generate a different ID to the console and then of course our console log statement is what will log that. So let's go ahead and save this and now once again in the terminal I'm going to type npm run dev to start NodeMon. NodeMon started up and you can see we've got the format of the date with the date and time and then on the next line the second console statement we got the result of calling UUID. And if we just make any change basically to the console, it's going to generate another UUID that's different than the one we got before, of course. So you can see how it generates a different ID each time. And that can be very useful, including with something we would log, such as an event, whether it's an error or a request or anything like that that we might write to a log file. We might want to give each entry its own ID. I want to jump back to Chrome really quickly just to draw your attention to how we can search for these packages because you might be wondering, how do I know about these packages? Well, you could search for ID and see what would come up. And remember, they're also ranked by popularity. And we got nano ID, short ID, but we don't see UUID. But somewhere I learned about it along the way. And if you do search for UUID, it will show up. Here it is, the exact match. Popularity is huge, quality is good. And so then when you go to the page, you can read about the details for the package you want to use. So here's some good information about it. It tells you how to install it. And of course, it quickly tells you how to install it here. It shows you where the GitHub repository is. Weekly downloads, that's a very popular package right there. So this is a good example. Of course, there's some docs as well. And you can look that up. And of course, you can search again at the top. I'll look for date-fns. Many times a package will have its own website as well that has documentation and date FNS is definitely one of those that do. <laughs> of course, notice it changed nomadic people migration at the top for NPM. <laughs> I always like the different uh, definitions it gives NPM. Again, node package manager. This says it's like Lodash for dates. Lodash is another package you could use. But this date FNS has its own GitHub repository. It also has its own web page that I believe is linked here somewhere. If I scroll down, maybe we'll see that. Oh, here it is. See datefns.org for the docs. So there's all kinds of information about each package as you explore that. I just wanted to highlight that again as we work with these. And now let's take another look at the package JSON because there is a little more detail we need to look at. Look at the packages we have installed here under dependencies or also under dev dependencies. And you can see we get the semantic versioning numbers. Now let's talk about these because this first number means a major version. The second number means a minor version and the third number means a patch. Now the caret we see in front means go ahead and allow an update 
to the minor version and the patch if needed, but do not update a major version. A major version could have breaking changes to your application, so you don't necessarily want to allow those. You can, and if you don't put anything in front of the number, this is saying specifically this version and only this version for this project will work. So once again, if you put the caret, that is saying go ahead and update minor versions or patches, but not a major version. So now if we have what's called a tilde, the little squiggly kind of, let me put it there. This is saying, go ahead and update a patch version, but do not update a minor version. So if you see the tilde, that will allow patches only and not minor versions or major versions. Now, if we got rid of this altogether, let me go ahead and put the carrot back because I'm going to want to replace that, and you just saw an asterisk in here, this would mean go ahead and update everything all the time. Use the absolute latest version every time. That is not too safe, although you might see it. This is what you'll typically see and what is installed by default to your package JSON is to have the caret here. And it's worth noting that when you install, if you specifically want to install a different version or any kind of version. You can just have npm install and then say we would type uuid and then put the at symbol and after that say the specific version you want. If you wanted 8.3.1 then this would install that specific version. However if you just say uuid you're going to probably get the latest version when you install here, but then it's going to mark it to not update any major changes because those could, once again, cause uh, a break in your application. So that could be a, what would be considered a breaking change. I'm going to go ahead and save the package JSON now. And if there were updates or if you wanted to check for updates to say, okay, is UUID, does it have a new minor version or something like that? If we had it like this, remember it would not install the major version, but if there was a minor version or a patch, you could just type NPM update and NPM will check for any updates for your packages. And you can see I had no updates or it would say something about that as well. So there were no updates there. So the only thing that I typically use or might need to use that I haven't shown you on a regular basis would be uninstall. So here we can type npm and then you could use the full uninstall or you can just use un or you can use rm for remove. So let's just go ahead and use rm. And then we're going to uninstall nodemon. But nodemon is a dev dependency. So you always need to add that specific flag if it's a dev dependency. Or if we wanted to install the global version, I would put the dash g as well. Now if it was production, you wouldn't have a flag at all. So let's go ahead and uninstall the dev dependency nodemon. Now this is worth noting. We did uninstall it. So there is no longer a dev dependency listed. It went ahead and kept the dev dependencies in here, but it's just an empty object right now. However, we still have nodemon listed in our script. It's not going to automatically change a script for you. So that could be an issue. If you want to install something that you have in a script, you need to remember to go and check for that as well. Now, nodemon is something I would probably have installed as a dev dependency, so we could just re-add that. But again, worth noting, if you uninstall a package, it doesn't remove it from your scripts. So you need to check that as well. Today, we'll be learning about the Events Common Core module in Node.js, and more specifically, how to both emit custom events and how to respond to those events when they are emitted. Right now, we're picking up where we left off in the last tutorial about NPM modules. And if you didn't see that tutorial, you can just catch up by installing the dependencies you see right here. So for production dependencies, we have the date FNS module and the UUID module. You could also refer to those as packages. Also, as a dev dependency, we have Nodemon installed. And then in the scripts, of course, the start script is node index, but what we would use in development is the dev script, and that is nodemon index. So if we type npm run dev, it will launch nodemon, and nodemon will listen for the changes in our files and restart the server without us constantly having to type that. So again, if you didn't see the previous tutorial, just update your package JSON and uh, npm installs 
to this. And if you don't know how to do that, please do watch the previous tutorial. Okay, let's move over to the index.js. And you can see we're already importing format from the date FNS module. And then we're also importing UUID and it's actually V4. There's different versions in the UUID. So we're importing V4 as, this is an alias, as UUID. So we can call that right here. And you can test these out with these console log statements that we had from the previous tutorial. But what I want to do right now is rename this index file. So I'm going to right click and choose rename. And I'm going to name this log events in camel case js so this is a complete different file and i'm going to make this into a module that we import into an index js that we haven't created yet so we need both of these imports but we're going to make a logging function of course logging events is something that's very useful on a server let's go ahead and also import the fs module so we'll require fs and then we're going to want to use promises. So let's say fs promises, set this equal to require fs and then dot promises. And we also need the path module. So here's require path. And now that we have all of the imports we need, and notice these are the only two that we really needed to use npm for because these are all common core modules here that we imported. Now that we have that, I'll get a couple of extra lines. Let's go ahead and define our log events function that we can export. And it's going to be an async function and it will receive a message parameter. Now inside the function, we need to define, we'll call it date time, and let's set this equal to, and let's just grab this format that we have right here and copy this, because that's what we essentially need. I'll use a template literal, and inside here I'm going to paste the format, the new date, it's got the tab, and then it will just end the template literal and leave it at that. And then we're going to take another definition here and call it log item. And we'll really use the date time. So I'll put another template literal. And we could have done this all in one line, but this gets kind of long if we do that. So I wanted to break it up. And so we've got the date time. Then I'm going to put another tab. And remember, there's a tab in here too. So what we're doing is creating a tab delimited log file. And now I'm going to use UUID and call that to get a unique ID for each log event. And then one more tab, and we'll just put in the message. There we go. And now that we have our log item, let's go ahead and log that to the console so we can see it while we're in development mode here as well. And now we need a try catch block. Let's get to the async await portion of this function. And we'll catch an error if an error happens. And let's just log the error to the console. If we have an error writing to the log, we won't be able to write the error to the log. So this is the best thing we could probably do right there. But in the try block, we can await fs promises. And then let's go ahead and append file. If you remember from our tutorial, on working with files, a pin file will also create a file if it doesn't exist. And now we need to use path, and we'll use path join, and two underscores, and then we'll use the directory name value. And then let's put it in a logs folder. And after that, let's call this event log dot text. And then we still need to pass in the content that we're going to put in the log. Right after that parentheses, we need the comma, and that would be our log item that we defined. Okay, now we can save this much. Now, I am thinking of something that could cause an error in the future, and we'll get rid of these console log statements down here, but I wanna leave it like this for now so we can actually test out getting the error as well, or catching the error. So let's do module.exports and set this equal to log events. Now we're exporting our log events function and we'll be able to use it in the index that we're going to create. So over in the file tree, we'll create a new file called index.js. 
From here, let's go ahead and define log events and set it equal to require and now dot slash because this is once again a custom module, not a common core module or an NPM module. And so dot slash log events. And now we're ready to work with the events common core module. And what we want to do is define an event emitter. And let's set this equal to events, the common core module events. After that, we need to define a class. So class my emitter, and it's standard to capitalize instead of use lowercase on the first my there for a class. And then we want to say extends event emitter. And then we can just have the empty curly braces right here. This is, I know it looks strange, but it's directly from the docs as well. From here, we can initialize the object that we're going to create. So we want to create my emitter, but now, whoops, this needs to be a lowercase m to start out. So don't let it change on you or, or select the option that would select the previous my emitter. And now that we've got my emitter defined, let's set it equal to a new object that is my emitter right here. So we've initialized the object. Now I know that's a little confusing, but that's what it looks like in the docs, so I just stuck with that. And then we've got add a listener for the log event. So then we can say my emitter dot on, and that is how we listen for an event. And I'm just going to call this a log event. We could be listening for any event we want to. This is the first parameter of listening for an event. So we just say which event we're listening for. And then we can call this anonymous function to pass in the parameter message. And now inside this anonymous function, we'll call log events. And once again, send that message that was passed in. So now that we are listening for the log event, we need to go ahead and emit the event to test this out. Now I want to set a timeout, which will hopefully let us understand how everything is processed a little bit better, but we're just going to emit the event. You don't have to have a timeout to do this, I just wanted to put a little delay in there. So once again, we use my emitter dot emit now, not on, on is listening, so emit is emitting the event. Now we'll emit the log event, and then let's go ahead and send our message. And I'll just say log event emitted. That looks good. Now let's put a delay in here with the timeout and I'll put two seconds. That may be too long. It may not be long enough to see the difference. Just depends how long it takes NodeMon to restart the server. So now that we've got that saved and this is our index, let's go ahead and open a terminal. You can do that from the terminal menu or I do control back tick. I'm in Windows. And now I'm going to type npm run dev to launch NodeMon and our index.js. And we get an error. So let's see what we got. I did expect to get one. Notice we did log to the console. So here's what we would have written to a log file. We've got the date, we've got the time, we've got the unique ID, and we've got our message, log event admitted. So that all worked out as expected. But we have an error, and let's see what it says here. Console error is not a function. Well, I should have typed console log here. Let me go back and fix that. We definitely have another error that I was expecting to see, so let's drop this back down. And of course, NodeMon should restart after I change this. So instead of console error, let's put console log. We might have to restart NodeMon, let's see. Yep, now it restarted, and we can see the message that I was expecting to get. So here, once again, we got the log file, and then we got no such file or directory. And that is because a append file will create the file if it doesn't exist, but it won't create the directory. And we didn't have a logs directory yet. So we need to modify our function because if you think about this, when you install some software, it, there may not be all of the directories created that you need. So let's modify this try block to account for not having that logs directory to begin with. If you notice, we haven't used the FS module yet. We had used FS promises. So in the try block, let's say if, 
And then we'll say not, if it not exists is what we're going for here. So fs dot exists sync. And then we want path dot join, two underscores and directory name. And then we're just looking for the directory. So if this does not exist, essentially is what we're saying, then as you might guess, we want to create that. So we'll say await and now use fs promises. Oh, and then we need dot mkdir, which is make directory. And we can say path dot join once again, two underscores in the directory name and create the logs directory, please. So now if the logs directory does not exist, it will create the directory and then it will either create or append to the event log file. So let's make this change. And now if we look back, we can see we got no error on this latest execution. Once again, everything wrote to the console. And now I'll bring this down. And if we look over here, we have a logs folder and we have an event log and there it is. We wrote to the event log. Now let's go ahead and run the program again. We'll need to make a change of some sort to do that. And then we can check the event log. So let's just make a quick change here by putting in a console.log or no, you know what? We don't need to do anything like that. We could even just put in a comment, say testing, save. And we should be able to see some changes once again. If we go back to the event log, oh, we've got another problem. After our message, we didn't put a line break. And so then it just wrote the next log on the same line. So we need to put in a line break after that as well. So let's go to our log events. And where we define our log item, at the end of message then, let's put a line break with a slash in and now this should make a difference. Let's check the event log again. And maybe it made a difference. I'll tell you what, let's try this. I'll just delete this altogether. Now the file doesn't exist. I'll get rid of the testing. Save. Write the file. Let's look at the file. There it is. Now, Back here, once again, I will undo, put the testing back and save. And let's look at the event log. There it is. We've got another log event emitted on a new line and everything is lining up as we expect. Delete testing again and save. And there it wrote a third line to the log. So this is working as expected. So here is a abstracted log events function that you could use. You could accept more than one uh, parameter as well. And if there was a second parameter here, when we would be in the index.js, when we emit this, we would just need to put the next parameter right here. So there can be more than one parameter as well. And this is how you set up an emitter to not only listen for, but to emit events. Now there might be all sorts of actions that you want to emit events for. When we create a web server, we're wanting to emit events to show what requests came in and log all of those so we have some detail of the activity for our web server. And that's what we'll be building next, a web server with Node.js. Today we will be building a web server with Node.js. No framework will be utilized, and this will help us learn more foundational knowledge about Node.js. And then in future tutorials, I will introduce the Express.js framework. We're picking up right where we left off from the last tutorial about the Node.js events module. So let's go over some quick changes and file additions, and I will be providing a link to a GitHub repository in the description below. Okay, in the package JSON, you can see I have changed the name to 05 tut for the fifth tutorial in this series. You can change that whatever you want. Now, I've also got server.js instead of index.js as the main file, and I have changed the scripts accordingly. So it says node server and nodemon server 
instead of node index and node mon index. Other than that, we still have the same dependencies as the last tutorial. So date FNS and UUID are here, and the dev dependency of node mon is here. And those are the few changes for the package JSON. Of course, I have renamed the index file to server.js. You can see everything else is currently the same here in the server.js file that was previously the index.js file, and we will come back to that. I want to delete the event log file that is currently in the logs folder. You can leave the logs folder if you want to. If not, it will be recreated. And that's because we still have the same log events JS from the last tutorial here as well. And we might make a change to that, but I won't do that now either. We'll come back to the whole events topic. What I do want to show you are the other folders and files that I've added. And these are simply to be served by the server so we can make sure it's working. I've got a style.css file. In the data folder, I've got a data.json and a data.txt. And you can just put in whatever information you really want to and style the page or web pages, however you want to. I've got one image in here. Again, you could download the repository and get exactly what I have, or you can use your own. And then in the views folder, I've got a 404.html, an index.html, and a new-page.html. And I also have a subdirectory named subdir, and in this subdirectory is another index.html that will be the default page for this subdirectory route. And so we're going to serve all these different file types or content types from the server today. Now let's make some changes and additions to the server.js file. I'm going to eliminate some of these blank lines. And then when we created a class my emitter that extended the event emitter in the last tutorial, it got kind of weird when we initialized our object and it was also named my emitter. So I just want to name the class emitter. And this is just kind of for my peace of mind. After that, we can get rid of that extra space too. We will leave all of this here. I'm going to get rid of the comments about the uh, listener. I'll also get rid of the timeout that we added because that will not be needed. And I'm going to comment out both of these right now. And then we'll come back to those later on when we need them. Give a little space in between. Now let's go ahead and import the common core modules that we'll need for this file at the top. And the first one we need is HTTP. And so that's one we haven't covered yet that we will today. And we just require HTTP. After that, we need path and we'll require path. And we'll also need FS for the file system. So we'll require that, I think spell require. And we're also going to need FS promises. So that equals require FS, but then at the end dot promises. And those are the common core modules we're going to need. And now we need to define a port for our web server. So not only will it have the address of local host because it will just be a development server on our local machine, but we need to say what port it will be on. And so now we'll just define port in all caps, definitely a constant here. And we should say process.env dot port because if we were to host this somewhere it would use this information and then we can say or and I'll say 3500 today I've seen different ports used and so today we'll be using port 3500 if we were to host this somewhere it would have a different value here now that we have defined the port let's go ahead and create the minimal server we can do that by defining server and let's set it equal to HTTP dot create server. And now that gets a request that we'll just call req and a response in a function. And now we have our request and response headed into the server. And we won't really do anything here at first except let's log the request dot URL and let's log the request dot method. We're not quite ready to launch our server yet because it still needs to listen 
four requests. So we say server.listen, and this should always be at the end of your server.js file. And we give the port value, and then we have an anonymous function. And here we'll just say console log, and inside this console, we'll use a template literal, and we'll say server running on port, and then let's once again give the port value here. And that's really all we need. So once the server starts, we can see this message, and I'll go ahead and press Alt-Z to make it wrap so we can see it. I've got Chrome open over here, so we can eventually request a page as well. And we should see this statement in the console once we start our server. I'm going to go ahead and save the file and then open a terminal window by pressing Control in the back tick. You could also do that from the terminal menu that's hidden behind the three dots right now in my uh, Visual Studio code. And now let's go ahead and start the server by typing npm, I need lowercase there, run dev, and this will start NodeMon that will listen for changes, and the server should start up. And we can see that we now have server running on port 3500. It's not going to serve anything. We're not sending any type of response back yet. We're not using the response. But it will log the request and the request method. So let's go ahead and type localhost 3500. And notice in the console, we've got the request here, which is just the slash, and then the method is a get request, not a post request or a put request or a delete request, but a get request. And so we did successfully log those requests, but there's just nothing that comes back yet. I'm going to go ahead and press Control C for now because we don't need to run the server while we're making a few changes. And now of course it can't serve a page, but that's no worry, we'll be serving a page soon. What we can do is talk about what else we could put in the server. And so after we're logging the URL and the method, and the URL was just the slash as we requested the index page, what we could do is build a path and then serve the file. So I'm just going to copy some code in to discuss it, but this is not what we'll want to do, and I'll discuss why. I'm going to go ahead and expand Visual Studio Code for now too, so we don't have to wrap the lines. But we could listen for a specific path so we're defining path here, because so we've got two semicolons, we just need the one. And if it is just the slash, or even if we specified index HTML, either one of these would work, and this is an if statement, then we could set the response.status code to 200, which means successful. We could set the response header content type to text slash HTML, because we would be serving the HTML page. And then we could go ahead and use path to define the path value and look in our views folder for the index page that we have right there and serve that page. And how we would do that would be to read the file that we currently have. And I didn't bother with uh, handling the error in this version, but what we would do is read the file and take this data and then send the data and we would be sending the contents, essentially, of the index HTML file. This would work, but this is not efficient. We would have a statement for every address that came in, and actually every file, because, of course, we'll be serving some files that are not text HTML. And feel f free to try this version out. I'm going to show another version that we will not use, but that you would also see in a possible simple server, and I'm just showing part of it here. I guess I could go ahead and close it out. But we could put in a switch statement, and we could look at the request URL value that comes in, and here, if it's just the slash, we could go ahead and once again set the status code, set the path, read the file, and then, of course, break out of our switch statement, and we would have to have a case for every value that came in, even a duplicate case, essentially, if this were to be index.html and not the slash. And this would also be very big and you would have to think of every possible file that could be requested. Your default could of course be the 404 if it doesn't exist, 
but this also takes up a lot of space and once again it's not dynamic and so this is not what we want to do today either. A switch statement is useful though, so let's take a different approach What we will still use a switch statement as we construct what our server does today. So we'll start out, once again, let's keep the console log statement with the request URL and method. That could be useful as we monitor things during development. And then let's look at the extension of the request URL that we get. And so we can use the path.ext name method to get that extension. So let's just pass in the request URL. Now once again, if it's a slash, maybe there will not be an extension name, but then we can handle that as well. So now that we've defined the extension, let's also define content type. And now we will use a switch statement to set the content type. And I'm going to paste this in because we'll be looking at all the different possibilities for file extensions. So there's several. And now we can go over this. But what we see up here above is we set our extension and then we define content type with a let. At least we begin the definition and then we can set it in the switch statement. So here we're looking at the extension and now if it's .css we set the content type to text slash CSS and we break. And we go on and do this for every type of request that we expect to get or file uh, content type that we expect to have requested. And you can see there's a couple of different images here. We've got an image slash JPEG and an image slash PNG. Uh, text for text slash plain. We also have JSON, which is application JSON. So all the different types of files we expect to serve. And importantly here, the default is the text slash HTML because this could not have an extension at all. It could just be the slash or it could have the extension of .html. And so we just handle that as the default. Okay, the next part, if you have not worked with chain ternary statements, you may not like me too well right now, but I do like chained ternary statements. So I will paste one in and explain it. What I want to do is set the value of the file path. And now a chain ternary statement like this one can be confusing, especially if you haven't worked with them much or if you have worked with them at all. But let's break it down. We're saying that whatever the result is will be saved here in, in the variable file path. So we say if the content type is HTML and the request URL is just a slash, then this will be the value. And we set the path name using the views directory, as well as the full path name here we get from the dir name value, and we set it to index.html. But if that's not the case, then we look at the next condition, and that next condition is here, and we're saying, okay, if it's an HTML file type or content type, then if the last character in the request URL is a slash, now this accounts for our subdirectory possibly and not just the main directory. And so this would be just a little different because we not only need the views in the file path, but we need the request URL that would specify the subdirectory. And so this is what happens if that is true. And then if not, we go ahead and just check now to see if the content type is HTML at this point, since these other two were not true. And then we would look at whatever was requested in the views folder because that's where the HTML should be. However, if that's not the case, then we're going to go ahead and just use the directory name or the file path and the request URL because this could be CSS or an image or something in one of the other folders that would be specified in the request URL. So another way to break this down is everything that starts with content type is a conditional statement, and everything here that starts with path is a result if the previous conditional statement is true. And then the final one, the final path, because there's two paths in a row, is just the default if none of the others were true. And so you could break this out into an if, else if, else if, else statement if you want to do that. I prefer chain ternaries myself 
and that is what we end up with. Let's go ahead and add one more statement here for the file path, and this will be an if, and we'll say if there is no extension, which means it was probably a slash and didn't have a file extension, and the request url.slice minus one, which is the very last character of the request URL, is not equal to a slash. So maybe we've just requested a file like about or new page. We have a new page over here, but we didn't type the .html afterwards. Well, this will make that work anyway. And sometimes that's cool to do. So this wouldn't really be required, but we're just making our addresses work even if we don't add the .html at the end. So then we'll just say file path plus equals, and then we'll add the .html here. So we still serve the correct file, although we might not have typed in the .html in the URL bar in the browser. So we should probably add a note to this, and I'll just say, whoa, I went too far, here we go. Makes the .html extension not required in the browser. And that's what that statement is for. Okay, now we have our file path and content type. So we're ready to actually check and see if we want to serve the file. And we can do that with defining file exists and setting this equal to fs.existssync. And let's just pass in the file path because now we are checking to see if this file exists or not. So this will be a true or false value that we get back. And we can check that by saying if file exists, we don't need to say if it's true, we're just saying if the file exists, then we're going to serve the file. But if it doesn't exist, we also need to have an else. And there are possibilities if it doesn't exist. This could be a 404, or this could be a 301, which is a redirect. Now we still aren't serving anything yet. We have determined our file path and we have determined our content type, but this is where we would serve the appropriate files right here. For now, let's just go ahead and log to the console. And what I want to log here inside of the else is the path.parse that will tell us the different parts of the file path. And let's go ahead and pass file path in and take a look at a file path that doesn't exist. So we need to start the server again. I'm going to go ahead and change this so we can see the browser as well. And then I'll open a terminal window. And now let's go ahead and type npm run dev. And the server is running. We can reload first and just make sure we get the home page. Oh, I guess we won't get a home page, but we can make sure the request goes through. There we go. And so we'll, we'll add the home page very soon. But let's go ahead and look for something that doesn't exist at all because the file does exist. So when it checked, it didn't get into that else area. Let's just say this is old right here. Okay, there was something that didn't exist. I'm going to expand the terminal window up so we can see this broke out now. And we can see using the path.parse, we get these different parts of the file path. And what we're interested in right now is the base. Notice it's old.html. Even though it didn't exist, that's what we get because it was added in the file path. So that's what we're going to use as we come into this area that does not know if the uh, file should be a 301 or a 404. And we'll determine that with a switch statement. I'm going to go ahead and highlight this and just change that console log now into a switch. And now instead of just path.parse.filePath, we want to put .base at the end of that. So that would be that value. And then we get our curly braces for the switch statement. We don't really need the semicolon there. And we need to put our cases in here. So our first case would be old-page.html. And this is an instance where we had an old page and we want to redirect it to the new page that we see over here in our file tree. So let's handle this redirect first. And this will be response 
dot right head and then a redirect is a status code of 301 and now we need to go ahead and put in the value here for the header and this would be location and then the location is slash new dash page dot html and now that we've handled the redirect we need to go ahead and end the response and after we end the response well we need a semicolon there we break out of the switch statement there and now let's add our next case our next case is going to be another redirect and it's www-page.html and now I'm just going to copy this much because it's very similar here for another redirect and paste it down. We've got a 301 again, but instead of new page, we're just going to redirect to the root, which is the slash. And so that will just redirect back to the home page. Once again, end and break. And now let's have a default as well for our switch statement. And this could be larger if you had more redirects to put in here, but the default should be the 404. And so this is where we're going to serve a 404 response. And let's save this. Once again, I'm going to expand Visual Studio Code because that was wrapping a little weird. But here you can see what we have. Now we're currently not ready to serve the new page or the home page yet. We haven't got anything else being served, but we did handle the redirect. So what we need now is a function instead of repeating the same function here for a 404 or up here for other files, a function that we can call in both spots. Okay, let's scroll back up to define our function and we will put that before the server and after the port. So let's call this function serve file because that's what it will do. It will need to be an async function. And then it's going to need the file path so we can grab the file that's needed. It's also going to need the content type so we can set the content type that is going to be sent. And it's going to need the response object to go ahead and send that response. So now that we have our parameters defined and we have the name of the function, Let's go ahead and start by defining the try block. We already know it will be an async function, so there will be a try and a catch. So we can use await as we get the information we need. Let's go ahead and set the error block first. So we'll log the error to the console. And then we also want to set the response.status code this would be 500. It would be a server error here if we could not read the data from the server that we want. And then we need to end the response. Notice I called the parameter the full word response before we were sending the res for response right here. And that's what we will pass in as we get down there further. But in the function, I'm using the placeholder. Here's the parameter with the full word response. And now in the try block, let's get the data from the file. So let's define data and set this equal to await fs promises and then dot read file. And now we need the file path to read and we'll use utf8. And after we read the file and we are awaiting that information, we can use response and then write head. And inside write head, we'll go ahead and say, 200 status code, and then the content type, there we go, content type, will be equal to the content type value that we have passed in. And then finally, we'll have response.end, and we can just send the data back. Now, some of you may be thinking ahead, and there are some problems that we will have with this, but this is the very basic to start out with, so I want to do that first. Now let's go back down into the code and call the function where it needs to be. So after we have the file path and the file exists, here we say serve the file. So this is where we would call our serve file. And this should have the file path value, should have the content type value, and it needs the response object. And notice here it's res because that's what it's defined as to begin with not in the function definition of serve file, but what we're using in the server. Okay, let's just copy this and we'll make some changes below 
as we want to serve a 404 here. So I'm going to paste this in and then we'll just change a few values. Okay, here we know exactly what file we want to serve. So we're going to use path.join and pass in the directory name. And then we know it's in the views folder. And then we know it's the 404.html file. And we also know the content type. So we can just set that to text slash HTML right away. And then once again, we need to pass in the response object. So let's save that as well. Now I'm going to resize Visual Studio Code again and we'll go ahead and scroll down. And it looks like, of course, NodeMon's already working. And yes, the requests are coming in and we served our 404 already because old doesn't exist. So let's go ahead and back out of here and see if we can serve the index. And yes, the index page serves just fine too. I'm going to go ahead and show the terminal so we can see all these requests coming in. And you can see old was a get request and then it requested the style sheet, requested a fav icon, which we don't have, requested a index page then, and once again the style sheet, and once again the fav icon after that. But we still have some file types that will be issues. So let's take a look at some of those as well. Say if we went to our data folder, data.txt, well, that seems to work okay, even if we aren't sending the accurate file type with it. But what about data.json? That's just text. That's not really JSON like we would want to send back. Even though it looks like it and could possibly be parsed into it, that is not the format that we really want to send. Let's also check our new page because it should have an image on it and the image doesn't work either. So we have some file types creating problems. What should be working is the redirect. So let's go ahead and type in old-page.html and yes, it does redirect immediately to the new page, so that's good. And what about requesting something in our subdirectory? And yes, we got our subdirectory index page. So that also works like we expect it to. Let's go back to the data and see if we can fix that JSON first. So data slash data dot JSON. I'm going to hide the terminal window for the rest of this and scroll back up to the function that we created, serve file, and I'll go ahead and expand the window once again. Let's start by changing data that we've defined here to raw data, and then let's define data separately. So here we have data, and this is going to be equal to a ternary statement. And we'll look at the content type that we already know, and if the content type is equal to application slash JSON, then we'll have a true value that follows the question mark, and that true value will be JSON dot parse, and this would be parsing the raw data that has been read. Otherwise, the false value would simply be the raw data. Likewise, when we send the response, and we're going to need an extra line for this, so we'll just do it on a separate line and keep the parentheses up here and down here. Now, what we need is another ternary statement here, and we'll look at the content type once again. We'll say if it is equal to application slash JSON, make sure I spell JSON correctly, then we're going to have a true and a false, and the true would be json.stringify, and we can go ahead and pass in Oh, not the raw data, the data. And otherwise, it's just going to be data that we send. Oh, and I don't need that semicolon. That would cause an error. And we can save our file. Let's go ahead and resize Visual Studio Code and reload our JSON. And now we can see it is served in a much more expected manner here. And this is truly JSON that has been stringified and of course it was parsed to begin with. Now let's go back to new page where we have a broken image and we can fix that as well. So right now we definitely get our new page HTML, but the image doesn't come through. Now this is because the image would not use UTF-8 encoding. I'm going to expand Visual Studio Code again and let's go ahead and put these values on separate lines as well. 
and now we can close out the parentheses down here on a separate line too. Now we still want the file path here, but instead of just UTF-8, we're going to start out by saying if the content type, and that is not, so we'll say if it does not include, but we're using includes here, and we're looking for the word image in the content type because both the PNG and the JPG had the image in the uh, content type that we have down here in our switch statement, and you can see it right here. Okay, so we're looking for that to see if the content type includes image, and if it does, or if it does not include image, I'm sorry, because we have the exclamation mark, that means if it does not include, it would be UTF-8, but if it does, Let's just put an empty string because a string is expected in that spot, but if we don't specify, then it will go ahead and let the image go through. So now we can save this and go back and check our new image page. Let's go ahead and reload it. And we've got our image. And now that we have the cute dog image, there is one more change we need to make as I expand this. And if you have thought about this, we're sending a status 200 even when it's a 404, because the 404 process is through here as well. So we need to check. We don't want to send a 200 if it's a 404. So right now, in the right head, let's go ahead and break these out as well into separate lines. Just gives us a little more room to work and see everything that's happening. So now, instead of just saying it's a 200 status code, we can say if the file path dot includes once again, and if it includes 404.html, well then we know it should be a 404, and else it should be a 200. So once again, a ternary statement, just determining the status code between a 200 and a 404 here in our function. And we can save that. And now we are close to being finished. We are serving all the files and they are having the correct content type header sent with them, but we haven't logged anything yet. So let's go ahead and remove the comments here and let's copy each one of these. And first let's take where we're going to emit from before we handle the listener. And as we do that, we'll scroll up here to see the server. Now, right after the console log, where we're looking at the URL and method would be a good place to emit. And we're going to emit a log, but what we want to say here is a template literal instead of that generic log event emitted that we had. And we'll go ahead and pass in the request URL. And then after the request URL, we have a tab delimited log file. So we'll put in a tab, then we'll put in the request method and after the request method we'll go ahead and put a comma because we're going to add another parameter to our log event handler and so now what we want to say is which file we want to put this log to and this will be to the request log.txt so we can save that one and we'll go ahead and copy the emitter one more time because we also want to put the emitter up in the error where we could catch a server error. And here we'll log something different. So instead of request URL, this is going to be the error.name. And instead of a tab here, we're going to have a colon and a space. And then we can put in the error.message. And we're going to go ahead and log this to the errorlog.txt. And we can save that too. Now let's go back and grab that listener that we need. And we'll get rid of these extra lines at the bottom. You can see we've used just about a hundred lines even. And let's go ahead and get rid of one of the lines here because by the time we finish, we will have a hundred even that way. Now, where we'll put this is right between the emitter and the port, and we will be listening for a log, but instead of just a message, we're also going to have a file name passed in, and then here, we'll take the file name in the log events function as well. So let's save that too, but we need to go back to our log events function, and here, 
we can say it's really the log name. So let's say log name. And we need to replace the event log that we used as a generic example last time for log name right here. And with that saved, we should be good to go. So let's go back to the server just to have it pulled up. And I'm going to open the terminal window again. And it looks like we're already running on port 3500. So let's switch this over. And now let's reload our new page. And we got several things here, including the log statement, because I believe we're still logging those to the console. So that's kind of cool. Let's look in our logs. And I'll make the terminal window smaller. And here's a request log. So we got a request. We got several requests in. And we logged exactly what we were getting, the request URL, and the method. And they're all get methods. They're all get requests. So what about an error? Well, we're going to have to create an error. So let's do something simple like change something we know is wrong. So where it says read file, let's just remove the E off of read file. We'll save. Nodemon will restart the server. And when we reload, we should definitely get an error. Yes, and we log the error to the console because that's part of our function. We didn't get a page served because we crashed with the error here, or at least it caught it, and that's what we should do. Let's look at the error log, and this is what we would want to check out if we had a problem. It tells us, of course, the date and time, it's the stamp, and there is the error name, a type error, and there is the error message. fspromises.readfill is not a function, and that's because we had a typo with read file, so we can go back and fix that. Now, being in development mode, Nodemon is going to restart due to the changes and all should be well as soon as the server is back up and running. So let's go ahead and reload. And we got our new page again. Of course, we can get our index page as well. And everything seems to be serving as it should. Now, there are some issues here as we look at our typical request log file, what really stands out is these are all Git requests. We didn't put anything in our code to handle any other type of request, really. We just assume the request method is Git. And of course, we would have to put in more checks to see if it was a post or a put or what we might want to do with the information and in interacting with a database. So there could be a lot more to it, but this is a dynamic server that will serve the typical files you would have with a website and even some data files that we have as far as data, uh, JSON and text file here. Now, ExpressJS makes this so much simpler, but this gives us a lot of context to think about and what all goes into creating a web server. So I think you will appreciate ExpressJS that much more once we begin to work with it now that you have created a web server with Node.js only. Here we're at the web page for Express, and you can see the definition of Express. It is a fast, unopinionated, minimalist web framework for Node.js. And this is found at expressjs.com. Now you need to have Node installed already and be able to use NPM, and then you can add Express to your project. And as it shows here, it shows NPM install Express and then dash dash save. You no longer need that and you can actually just type npm i express. Today we're going to reference some documentation, not from the getting started link, but from the guide and go to the routing page. And this way you'll know how to find the documentation for what we're going over today. Let's go to Visual Studio Code. In the last Node.js tutorial, we built a web server using only Node.js. I'm going to start with the completed code repository from that tutorial, and that's what you see right here in Visual Studio Code. But if you don't have this repository, you should be able to easily follow along without it, or you can download or clone it from the starter source code link that I'm providing in the description below. Okay, I'm looking at the package JSON file for the repository. Now, if you just downloaded or cloned the repository, you're still going to need to install the dependencies. Not that we're going to use all of these today, but if you just want to get the repository up to where we are, you could go to the terminal from the terminal menu and choose new ter terminal, or you can use control and the back tick. That's what I use in Windows. Mine defaulted to PowerShell, and that's not what I want. Let me switch that over real quick 
to git bash. That's what I expected it to be. And once I have a git bash terminal, you would type npm install, and this will go ahead and update all of the dependencies or install them if you don't have them. So I'll go ahead and do that as well. And you can see it will just check my dependencies here. It shouldn't take long. And when it's finished, I'll know I've got everything installed that would be in this repository. So currently, I have nodemon as a dev dependency, uuid and date-fns, which stands for functions, all installed as either a dev dependency or a regular dependency. Now, what we want to add is express. So we'll type npm i express. We don't need the dash dash save. That's uh, understood at this point. So we want to install express as a dependency. And it just takes a few seconds and express should be added. And you can see it here in my dependencies listed between date dash FNS and UUID. Now, just to update a couple of things for this tutorial, I'll switch the name to 06tut instead of 05. And instead of Node.js web server tutorial, I'll just put express tutorial in the description. But those are minor changes and nothing that you actually have to do. I just wanted to go ahead and update that. Let's move over to the server JS file where we'll make the rest of our changes today. Now much of what is here, and I can close the terminal as well, much of what is here we don't need anymore. So if you want to make a copy of this file or if you want to rename the server.js to old server.js or something like that to save this code in your repository, go right ahead because we're going to get rid of most of it. We need to keep the path requirement, the path import at the top, and then I'm going to remove everything else down to line 12 where we keep the port definition. And then I'm really going to remove everything for now except where we listen here at the very bottom on the specific port. Now we can go ahead and make some changes. Right at the very top on line one, let's go ahead and import express. So we'll define express and we'll set it equal to require express. After that, let's define app. Now we could use another name here like we've used server, but typically you'll see examples using the word app. So that's what we'll go ahead and define as well. And you set it equal to express and you call express. And so now we can use the app where we've been using server. So we'll have app.listen at the specific port that we have provided. Now we'll use path later. It's the only thing we haven't used up to now. And now let's come down a couple of lines and we can define our first route. So we'll use app and then we specify the HTTP method that we want to uh, route. So we'll use the get method here. So any get request that comes in that looks for just the root, this would be our index page, then we can specify what to do with that. And this takes an anonymous function here, or a function, it doesn't have to be anonymous, but this is what you would typically see and what I will do. And so now what we do with the route it happens right here inside this anonymous function. So let's start out very simply as you might expect and let's just say response.send and then we can say, well, let me use a single quote just because I like to better, hello world. And that's what would be sent in response. And so now we can go ahead and start the server and we will expect to get this at the index page. Now to start our development server, if you remember, as we specified in our package JSON, we can use our dev script that uses nodemon. So nodemon knows to restart anytime we make changes. When we save our file, it will identify those changes and it will restart the server JS. So let's go ahead and open our terminal again. And with the terminal open at the bottom, I'll type npm run dev. And it should take just a second, but the server will start up and we expect to see that server running on port message inside the terminal window. Let me drag this up and see what we get. There we go, server running on port 3500. So now we'll go to Chrome and open up Chrome. Let's open a new tab and let's go to localhost and we've got port 3500 and we get a very small hello world that is simply delivered in text. Okay, let's minimize Chrome and let's drag the terminal down so it doesn't take up quite as much space, but we'll keep the uh, dev server running. 
But let's go ahead and serve our index file that we have in the views folder now. We do have an index.html here. Instead of just sending hello world, we can send a file. And you do that with res, which is the response, dot send file. Now inside of send file, there's a couple of different ways we can specify the file to send in Express. One is to put in the path, say dot slash views slash index.html. And then we can provide options. And one option is to specify the root directory. And this is where we can use that dir name value that is native to Node. And this will tell Node and Express exactly where the root directory name is. And then inside the root directory, we would look inside of views and there we would find the index file. So this should provide the file. Let's go ahead and save. And it says it's restarting due to changes. Once the server restarts, we'll bring Chrome back up. And now that we've got it, let's reload. And now we've got our index page. And I'm going to resize Chrome so we can just see it and the console when we want to, at least when I pull Chrome back up, if I can get it to drop down. Not that we really need the whole thing. We don't have much content here, but we've got that. So now I'll go ahead and minimize and pull it back up again when we need it. So that is one way to do it. Now let me copy this down so we can just leave that in commented. And the other way to serve a file is what we're already used to doing in Node. And that's why I usually do it this way is we can use path.join and then we specify the directory name and then we join in the views folder, and then we go ahead and join in the index.html. And this will work in the same way. So let's go ahead and save this. And now let's bring Chrome back and we can reload. And we should just get the same result. And we do, we still have the index page. So that is more how I would do it because I'm used to using path.join, but you could do this either way. Okay, in the file tree, we can see we also have new-page.html. So let's just highlight all of this, and I press Shift, Alt, and the down arrow, and I can just copy all of it down. And then we'll remove the commented outline, and then we'll change our app.get route here. So instead of just looking for the root, we're looking for new-page.html. And upon that request, of course, we want to switch this to new-page.html as well and save. Now, let's go ahead and look at Chrome and see what we get if we type in our new-page.html. So we have slash new-page.html and we get the new page. So that works just fine. So we can tell that we're not just intercepting the route right here because this is only looking for the slash. So even though this has a slash, this does make it past and this is okay. We get new dash page dot HTML instead of stopping right here because this does read this down like a waterfall. So it would check this route first, but now we know it does make it to this route. However, if you have the same question in your mind that I would, you'd be thinking about what if somebody requests the slash index.html? Well, this is where Express really helps us out because Express also accepts some regular expressions in the routing. So instead of just saying slash here, we can specify and we can say this must begin with the slash and this must end with a slash, and then we can say or, and then we can also say slash index.html. So if that request comes in, it will route also to the index.html. Let's go ahead and save that. And once again, look at Chrome. And now let's switch back to our slash without the index. And now if we go ahead and put slash index.html, we still get the index. And if you remember when we built the node server, we also made it so you could just type in index without the .html. Let's see what happens if we do that. Oh, we get cannot get index. 
So that means it could not find that page. And this is what Express returns by default if it's a 404 and cannot find that. And it's also worth mentioning where we did a considerable amount of code to handle things like the status code and the content type in our Node.js only web server. Here, Express automatically sets the correct status code and content type. So for that 404, it already set the 404. Likewise, for this HTML, and we're sending an HTML file, it already sets the correct content type. And of course, it sends a 200 if it finds it as a successful response. And now we can add just a little bit more regex, and that way we can make the .html optional on this request. And if we put the .html inside of parentheses and put the question after it, that's exactly what it does. So let's go ahead and do that to our new page as well. And so we'll put the .html and a question mark after it, making the .html optional in the request. So we'll save both of those. Let's come back to Chrome, take another look, and now index without the .html. Let's go ahead and reload. Oh, and the server's still restarting as we see down here, restarting due to changes. Let's see if it's going to restart. It's taking just a little bit. May need to restart the server altogether. Do control C to get out of that, and then I'll do npm run dev again, and we'll get that server running again. Okay, with the dev server once again running, I'm not sure why it hung up there. Let's go ahead and refresh the page. And now we get our index page with no .html inside of the URL. Something else we handled in our Node web server that we created was a redirect. So let's do that with this Express server now, and I will copy down the new page request. But now if we're requesting an old dash page with or without the .html at the end, we want to redirect that to the new page. Express makes this very simple, so let's go ahead and remove a lot of what you see right here. And we'll put in res.redirect. And now we are sending that to the new page, but we do need to put a slash here. So we have our new page and we'll go ahead and get rid of that parenthesis we don't need. Now there is one thing missing. And what's missing here is the response code. Now one will be sent by Express, but it's going to send a 302 by default. And a 302 will not necessarily get the search engine to change saying it is a permanent redirect. What we really want is a 301. So we can do that by specifying the status code at the beginning of the redirect and then putting a comma afterwards. And that will go ahead and send the correct status code that we need because we would want the search engines to go ahead and say, hey, this has been permanently moved to new page, there is no more old page. And we can go ahead and check that in Chrome as well. I'll pull that back up and inside of here, we can just type old dash page. We don't even need the HTML and it redirects to the new page. Now, as I mentioned, Express handles these routes like a waterfall. So at the very end of the route, you can essentially put your default, your catch all if you want to. And here, once again, we'll use just for a get request We'll put in the slash and then an asterisk afterwards, which is the all. And that's kind of like if you're used to writing SQL, a select all. So what we have here with regex is a slash followed by anything will default to this route. Let's go ahead and put in our function as well. So we have our request and response and the arrow function. And now inside of here, what we can do is essentially send our file. So I'm going to copy this line and bring it down here. And we do have a custom 404 page. And that's what this is for because Express will send a 404 status code and tell you it cannot find what it's looking for, even if you don't supply anything. But we want to supply a custom 404. And so I'll go ahead and switch new page to 404 here. But what it won't do, because it will find the file to send, is it will not send the 404 status code. It would be a 200 because it could find the file and it would be serving exactly what we told it to. So it wouldn't know to send a 404 at this point. So what we can do is chain in the status code here with a status 404 and just another dot. So that all chains together. So now we have a response 
with a status code of 404 and we're sending our custom 404 file. Let's save this and go back and just request something that doesn't exist. So up here instead of new page, I'll just put page and we get our custom 404. What we haven't talked about yet are route handlers. So I'll just put that here in a comma. We have route handlers, and that's exactly what these are. Following our app get route, where we tell it what we are routing, these anonymous function expressions that we have here following the route are route handlers. And we can chain those or use more than one of those. So let me give you an example of that. So we'll have another app get, and let's say the request comes in for hello.html. And let's go ahead and make that optional as well, since we're doing it with the others. So we have the .html is optional. And after the quote, we put a comma. And now we have our function expression here, the anonymous function and its request response. But then we also add in a next. And this is an arrow function. Inside this function, I'm going to console log and just say attempted to load hello.html. And then after our console log or our call to the console log, we call next. And what that does is it moves on to the next handler or the next expression. And you won't see this often, but you can put a comma and then just put the next function right afterwards. So here we'll have a request and response. We could have a next if we were going to chain another one after this. But if this is the last one in the chain, it won't have a next, it would just be the request and response. And here we can response.send and we'll just go back to our hello world message that we had at the very beginning. And if we save this, we'll go ahead and be able to see the console at the same time. Let's pull up Chrome. And over here, I'll go ahead and request the hello. And now we get hello world in our small text in the browser. And we also got our console log message attempted to load hello.html. So you can see we're calling one function and then when next is called, it goes on and calls the next function in the chain. Now let me show you another way that you might see functions chain together. And this way is really the way you would probably see it more often. I'm just pasting in some very, very basic functions here. So I've got function one that has request, response, and next. It logs to the console one and calls next. Function two, same construction, logs to the console two. Function three doesn't have a next. It logs to the console three. It also sends the response finished and then it is complete. So how would we use that in a route? All three of those. So instead of the commas we saw chaining the anonymous functions, we can say app.get, and let's say this is for the route, let's just call it chain. And we'll go ahead and make the HTML optional as well. And after that, you can provide these handlers in an array. So we'll just have one, two, and three in this array. So all of the route handlers are provided right here in this simple line and we're calling all of the functions that are above. So let's go ahead and save and go to the route chain in the browser. I'll switch from hello up here at the top. Type in chain and you can see in the console we got one, two, three and in the browser we got finished in the small text because it just sent the text finished. And these route handlers work in a way that is very similar to what we would call middleware. And middleware is what we'll be covering in the next tutorial, but you'll get used to seeing this call to next so it can call the middleware. Likewise, we'll make a change for our 404 as well because right now we're just delivering a custom 404 for Git requests and that come in right here with this path. But we can go ahead and improve that using middleware as well. And we'll also talk about how to serve those static deliverables like our style sheet, the CSS, any JavaScript that we want to go to the browser, and anything else like images that we have currently broken on the page when we go to new page, or some data. So we'll talk about how to provide all of those as we cover middleware in the next tutorial. Today, we'll learn about middleware in the ExpressJS framework.
We're going to start out with the code repository from the last tutorial, but if you don't have it, you should be able to easily follow along without it, or you can download or clone the starter source code from the link I'm providing in the description below. So what is middleware? It's really anything between the request and the response, so the route handlers we created in the last tutorial are really middleware too. And we can see one of those right here that I'll highlight on the page. We've got a route handler for the new page route. So you could consider this middleware. And of course, we covered different things you can do with these route handlers, including chaining them. As we see right here, I've got a route handler, a comma, and then a second handler. Or we chained them in an array by creating three separate handlers here and then putting them in an array in the route right here. So just a little bit of a recap, but those are overall considered route handlers, even though they are essentially middleware. So what about creating some specific middleware? where there are three types of middleware. There's built-in middleware, there's custom middleware, and there's middleware from third parties. Of course, the custom middleware is what we create ourselves. So let's get started with the built-in middleware. I'm going to create some space right underneath the port definition, and I'm going to paste in some built-in middleware. And the first thing we should notice here is that it is app.use. And app.use is what we often use to apply middleware to all routes that are coming in. And of course, just like our HTTP methods, get, and of course we could use post, delete, put, and other methods as well. Just like those methods, this all works as a waterfall. So if we put app.use above our routes, then this will apply to all routes that come in. And you can see in here, we're calling express.url encoded. And then this receives an options, options object, there I can say it, and extended is set to false. And that's usually how you see it. You can look in the documentation if you wanna dive deeper into that, but that is typically what you see. So what is this middleware for? Well, it's for handling URL encoded data. In other words, form data. So when that comes in in the URL, then you can pull the data out as a parameter. So we need to add this middleware that is built into Express in order to get that data when form data is submitted. Now I'll add an additional layer of middleware, and this is for JSON, as you might expect. So not form data, but if JSON data is submitted, we need to be able to get those parameters or that data out of the submission. And we use this middleware to do it. So once again, app.use and then express.json. And now this is applied to all routes as it comes in. And finally, for the last piece of built-in middleware that we'll apply today, we're going to serve static files. And this is important because if you remember from the last tutorial, we were not yet applying CSS. We had a broken image in our new page and files that should be available to the public were not available. And that's what this middleware does. It serves static files. So once again, we start with app use and then it's express.static and we supply the path. And here I'm using path join as we have many times before. We supply the directory name value and then the public folder is what we're going to put all of those in. So when we save this, we now need to create a public folder. And inside this public folder, we need to drag our CSS folder and we need to drag our image folder. And let's go ahead and create one more folder in here and let's call this text. And then from our data folder, let's pull down the data.txt and put it inside the text folder. So now we have some files that we want readily available for the public and Express will automatically route those files there because this is applied before our other routes. So it will search the public directory for the requests before it moves to these other routes. Let's go ahead and open a terminal window. From the terminal menu, you can choose new terminal or like me, control and the back tick and it opens up the terminal here. I've got a bash window and that should work just fine. I'm going to type npm run dev to start nodemon for our development server and this should launch everything. And yes, we're already running on port 3500. Let's go to Chrome 
and I've got a blank window open in Chrome so we can type localhost 3500 was already there and we get index and it's already applying the CSS. So now let's go ahead and comment out the middleware. So we're not using those static files and let's reload our index page and see what we get. Now there's no CSS applied. So it is absolutely finding those public files and applying them. However, we didn't really change the path in those files and we should. Now I'll reload this and, and we do see it's applied. But let's take a look at those files. Here's our index. And we were going up out of the views directory and then into the CSS directory. And that's not really there. So this is being a little forgiving. Let's just get rid of that because we know this path is available to the public of course after the directory name there so after the root of the url it should just be css slash style dot css and we can double check that by going to chrome and from there we can just type slash css slash style dot css sure enough we pull up our css file in the browser so it is available to the public Let's go ahead and make these same changes on our new page.html. We can get rid of the dot dot slash for image for the image directory and for the CSS directory and save that. And also in our custom 404, we can get rid of the dot dot slash and save. Now all of those should be working fine and they really were before, but this cleans it up. Now let's go back to the server.js and let's consider adding some custom middleware that we write ourselves. Let's create a custom logger and we want it before anything else because it, we could put it, I guess, after the static files are served, but then we would not log the requests for the CSS or the images or anything like that. So if we put it at the very top, then we'll see the requests for everything as they come through. So we'll just call this custom middleware logger and now we'll start with app.use and inside of app.use we'll put an anonymous function that gets a request response and since we're creating this it needs to have next so we can move on notice the built-in middleware did not need next called it's already built into that but we need to call next inside of our custom middleware so let's log to the console inside this logger and we'll go ahead and log the request method where here's the request dot method and then give a space and we'll log the request dot path as well and now with both of those sent to the log the only other thing we need to do is call next so let's save this and now let's go back to chrome and we can still see our console here let's request the page and you can see we get the get request here, and there's the slash, which is the home page, and we also see the request for the CSS file. While logging to the console is okay for our middleware logger, what we really would like to do is create a log file. And we've already created a log events function back when we were working just with Node. So we can go ahead and use this log events function in our logger as well. Let's create a new folder in the file tree and call this folder middleware. From here, let's pull the log events.js file straight into that directory. And now that we have log events there, we really don't need to change much. And we are already exporting log events as well. So that's good. What we will need to change is where it writes the logs because we don't want it to create a logs folder in the middleware folder. So if our, with our path.join, what we need to do is add in one extra spot here. I did not mean to hit return, there we go. And just go one directory up with the two dots. And now that we've got that, I'll copy it and we need to add it to this path and this path as well. So when the logs directory is created, it is here where we already have our logs directory from the past rather than being created in the middleware directory. And now we need to take log events and import it into our server. So we'll scroll to the top and let's just put it underneath path. And we'll say const 
log events equals require dot slash middleware slash log events. And that completes that. We can save. And now we can use log events inside of our custom middleware logger. Let's put it right above the console log. And we have log events. And log events accepts two parameters. The first is the message. And the next is the file that it should write to or create. So inside for the message, we'll create a template literal. And I'm just going to paste this in so you can see the full message. It is the request method, and then we put a slash t for tab, so we have a tab delimited log file. And then it's the request.headers.origin, which should be saying where the request is coming from, what website sent it to us, and then we should get what URL was requested. So say it's a get method and the request is coming from google.com and they are requesting our index page. After that, we need to tell it what file to create or write to and we'll call this rec for request.log.txt. And now we should be good to go with our log events function. Let's go back to Chrome one more time and let's go ahead and request our index page. It was requested. We see the requests here. And now we also see a request log has been created. And there are two requests. It was a get request both times. And it was undefined because we're just running our node server right here on our local host. And you can see what was requested as well. The slash for index and the CSS style.css. And while this works, once again, let's look at the server JS. While this works, we're really importing a function to use inside of our anonymous function that is our logger that has the request response and next as any middleware should. So we can clean this up a little bit. Let me go ahead and copy the anonymous function and everything inside of it. Control C to do that. And now we'll go back to the log events.js file. And here we can define another function just called logger. We'll set that equal to this anonymous function. And now logger can be our custom middleware that we export. So down here, instead of just exporting log events, which we'll use later or we wouldn't need to right now at all, I'll go ahead and put both inside of curly braces. Once again, we won't be using log events anymore inside of the server JS though. I'm just exporting this for use later when the need arises. So back at the server JS, instead of log events, we'll need curly braces now that there's two functions being exported and we'll import logger from the log events file. And now with logger being imported and all of this logic inside of logger, we can just say app use logger. And now this is much cleaner and should still work in the same way. So let's pull up Chrome once again and let's request the index. And we see the console log still work. Let's look at the request log. And yes, we have two more requests in the request log. Once again, notice that it says undefined here is the origin because we're just using our local host server here as we pull this up. So let's make a request from another domain. I'll pull Chrome back up and now a new tab and we'll go to Google. And on Google, let me go ahead and expand this and open up the dev tools with control shift I. Now that I have dev tools open, what I want to do is just call fetch. And I'm not really interested in the data. We're just going to fetch the destination and let's see what we get. We get a cores error. It says no access control allow origin. But let's go ahead and check our log file. And our log file does show google.com as the request origin. So you may have seen that error we got before from Google that showed the cores error. And that stands for cross origin resource sharing. And now this will lead us to third party middleware. So we can install a dependency. I pressed control C to stop our dev server. I'm going to type npm i for install and then cores, C-O-R-S. And this should take just a second to install. 
and we'll be able to see the new dependency in our package JSON when this is finished. And it says it's finished already. Let's check the package JSON. And here we see cores now added as a dependency. So let's go back to the server.js file. Okay, so we're in the server.js file here, and we need to go ahead and import cores. So we define cores and set it equal to require cores. Once we have that, we need to apply the middleware. So we want it to come as soon as possible, but after the logger. So let's go ahead and apply cores here. So we'll say app.use, and then we can just call cores inside of the app.use. I'll go ahead and put a note here that core stands for cross origin resource sharing. Let's save that and now go back and start our dev server again with npm run dev. And once the dev server has started, we'll pull up Google. It says it's good to go, it looks like. And let's go back to Google and let's make the same request. And now there's no cores error. We get a promise pending, of course, from fetch as we expect to there, but there's no error. And that's the main thing is we can request data now from the google.com domain and it doesn't create a cores error. Let's minimize Chrome and let's look at our request log again. And we once again see Google in there. So the domain, the request origin did come from google.com. Okay, now let's go a little deeper into cores. I don't want to make this a full tutorial on cores because that can get pretty deep. However, cores for cross-origin resource sharing is something that does need to be applied or you will get those errors. However, this just leaves it open. If you had an open to the public API, this would be fine. You're using cores and everyone can use it. But for many applications, that's not really what you want. So let's create a whitelist and we'll define it with a const whitelist. And inside of that, we can have more than one domain. So let's say HTTPS slash slash and then www.yoursite, whatever your.com is, whatever application, web application domain will, that will access this back end node server. That's where you want to put this domain here. But say you might also have a variation. Maybe you've got a variation without the www dot, or maybe you're working on a local dev server and you launch from go live down here, click to run live server. Live server always runs on HTTP colon slash slash 127.0.0.1, which is your computer. And then it gets a port like 5500, I believe is the default. So maybe as you're building a React app, you're running your React app on this port or a different port on your local host, or you use the IP address, which 127.0.0.1 is the same as having local host there, anything like that. So let's add those to the whitelist. And of course, we should add HTTP slash slash localhost, and we're using 3500 here today. Now, you would take these out after development, but of course you would leave in whatever domains should be able to access your data or your backend server, and that would be your web application. Say your React application is at whatever domain, you would leave that in here. So we've created a list that is allowed to access the back end that cores will not prevent. So now we need to create the function that will allow cores to do this. And this is all contained within the cores options. So that's what we'll call this lowercase cores and then camel case here with a capital O for options. And we set this equal to an options object. And the first property is origin and origin can accept a function. So we have an anonymous function here. And it gets the origin, which is not the same as the origin right here necessarily. This is the origin coming from whoever requested it, say google.com, and then a callback function. And again, the two origins, a little confusing, but it's right from the documentation. So that's kind of how we need to do it. So we've got the origin there with the anonymous function. And we can say if the whitelist dot index of 
And then we pass in the origin that is passed in to the function. If that index is not equal to minus one, in other words, if the domain is in the whitelist, then we're going to go ahead and let it pass. And then we can do the callback. And the first parameter in the callback is null, which is usually the error. So there's no error. And then we set the second one to true. And that just means that the origin will be sent back saying, yes, that's the same origin and it is allowed. And then we can have an else. And in the callback here, we have an error instead of null. And we create a new error and we can just say not allowed by cores. And so that is the message to go along with the error. Now that is the first property here in the cores options. We need to add one more. So we put a comma and then we put lowercase here, options, success, status. There it is. And we send a 200. And with that, we can save. And now that we've created the cores options, we need to pass those in right here. And notice we did not include Google in these cores options. Now Google could access without an error before we put in the options. Let's go back and make the same request from Google and see what happens now. We once again have a cores error. So let's go back and let's go ahead and change your site to google.com. Server is restarting. It looks like it's hanging up. Nope, it's going to go ahead and do it. There we got it. And we go back to Google once again, and now it's in the whitelist. And we fetch, and there is no error. So we know our function is working as we expect it to. So when we come back and look, once again, you could change this to your domain, whatever your project, wherever it will be hosted. Say you've created it in React or Vue or even vanilla JavaScript. Svelte even, whatever you might create a front end project with that will access this back end, you want to put that domain in here or maybe variations of again. Remember, you might not have the www or it might be optional, anything like that. So that allows you to put in domains that can access the routes and otherwise cores will prevent them. So very useful third party middleware. I want to go back to Chrome one more time and create that error one more time now that we've taken Google out of the whitelist. At least I thought we took Google out of the whitelist. Maybe I didn't save after we did that. That's exactly what happened. I hadn't saved the server.js file yet. Save here. Nodemon is restarting. It's taking it just a little bit. Maybe I need to go ahead and restart it once again. Every now and then I have to restart it manually. So npm run dev, get the Nodemon server up and running. I'll pull up Chrome and let's see if we can get that error again. So yes, we've got the cores error here. Now let's look back in Visual Studio Code as well. And you can see we got the server still running, but we got this big error. And up here it says our message error not allowed by cores and this huge error here. Now we can handle errors in Express as well, but Express is already handling them. It has the built-in error handler by default, and that's what's happening when we throw this error, it is going there. However, let's go ahead and add a little custom error handling. So we scroll down to the very end. Remember, it's a full chain, so we want this after everything else, even after our 404 here. I'm going to paste this in, and you can see I'm using app use once again, and then this is an anonymous function and it doesn't just get the request response and next, it also receives an error parameter. And then we can log to the console, the error stack if we want to, or just the message or whatever. We can go ahead and send a status 500 server error, and we can send the message to be displayed in the browser. So I'm going to save this and we'll go back to Chrome, but we won't use Google anymore. Let's go ahead and just use the page that we have here and I'll see if I can resize. There we go. I'm going to reload. And look, we got a not allowed by cores, even though we requested our index page. But our custom error did work, and it sent this to the browser. Now, why did we get that? Well, let's go ahead and look at the log. Here's our request log. 
can see it's once again undefined. So undefined is a problem because that's not in the whitelist. So during development, you want to go ahead and make one modification to this function. Right here, after the minus one, go ahead and put in the OR operator and then say no origin, essentially the exclamation mark origin, which would be the equivalent of undefined or false. And we save that and now it should work. Now after development, we probably want to remove that as well, just like we want to remove some of the uh, development URLs that we have up here in the whitelist. So now let's go back to Chrome and see if we can reload our index page. Yes, and now everything is working as we expect it to. Now we can also tidy up that custom error handler. So let's scroll back down to it and we see the function that we have here inside of app use. I'm just going to copy that complete function. And now inside the middleware folder, let's create a new file and let's call this error handler with a capital H there. So camel case, error handler JS. And now let's define our error handler and set it equal to, and we'll remove the function keyword and we'll go ahead and put an arrow after this and we've defined our error handler, but what we want to do that we're not doing yet is also create an error log. And this is where exporting the log events function that we left here comes in very handy. So now we need to import that here, not the logger, but the log events. So let's define log events inside of the curly braces, set that equal to require dot slash log events. And now that we're importing log events, we can go ahead and use that in the function as well. So we'll call log events right here before we log to the console. And once again, this function gets a message first and then the name of the file that it needs to write to or create. So this will be a template literal. And I'm just going to paste in the values once again. Here, instead of anything from the request, such as the method like we were logging before, we're going to log the error name and the error message. And then we'll put a comma and go ahead and specify error log.txt as to where we want to write the error to. And we can save this, but we're not quite finished yet because we need to export this function. So we do module.exports, set this equal to error handler, and now save. And now we need to import error handler into our server. So let's scroll to the top of our server JS and right underneath logger, I'm just going to go ahead and copy this down and let's change this to error handler. And instead of log events, we're importing from middleware error handler and save. Now we need to use the error handler where we previously had the larger function in this file. So it will be much cleaner. So let's go ahead and select this full function, delete that and paste in error handler. And we can save. And we got an error, the app crashed. Let's see what we've got. So if I scroll up, it says app.use requires a middleware function. So something about the function probably didn't get imported correctly. Let's go ahead and scroll up to the top and look at our import statement. And oh yeah, we were using curly braces around logger because it was one of two functions from the file, but from the error handler, it's the only one. So let's go ahead and remove those curly braces around error handler and see how everything goes. It's restarting the server right now and server running on port 3500. That part looks good. So with the server running, the best way I know to create an error would be to go ahead and remove this or no origin for now. And we'll go ahead and save. And then we'll try to reload the index page once again in Chrome. So it's starting the Node.js server. And now that it's running, let's reload. And we've got a not allowed by cores as we expected, an error in the console, and now we have an error log file over here in the file tree. And we can see we got our error not allowed by cores at 1827. 
So let's go ahead and look at the request log and we should be able to line that up with what request happened here as well, and we can. So everything there is working as expected. So now that the error is logging, let's go ahead and put that or no origin statement back in for now so we do not keep getting rejected by cores. We can go back and we can once again request the index page and everything should work well when the server restarts. There we go, we've got the index page now. Okay, there's one more thing to do before we're finished today, and that is to compare app use to app.all. And that's what we're going to do right here as we change up the 404 just a little bit. So with app use, we could do something like this, app use and specify here at the end of the chain, everything basically that came in from the slash, which would be the root. But app use does not accept regex. And also app use overall is more likely to be used for middleware, but app.all is used for routing. And this means it will apply to all HTTP methods. So it also does accept regex. So what we can do inside of this is just put an asterisk. It's at the very end of the page. So we can just say pretty much anything that made it here should get the 404 at this point. Let's go ahead and save the file and test it out. I'll pull up Chrome and here we can put in the slash Dave and yes, there's no page that's Dave HTML. So that is a 404, although the request did log just fine. We can customize our 404 response just a little more. So let's start that out by just setting the response status because we know it's going to be a 404 no matter what. After that, let's check the type. So we can say if the request accepts, and now we'll look at the type, the content type, and we can just say HTML here, and Express will translate that for us. And after that, then we'll put what happens, because if this will resolve till true or false here. So then we can go ahead and look at sending a file or something else inside of here. So what we'll do is say response dot send file, and go ahead and send that 404. Now this is very much like what we were already doing, but now we can check for other types as well that might be accepted. So let's go ahead, I'll just copy all of this down and we'll change some of it. So Shift Alt and the down arrow copies everything. And now we'll say if the request accepts JSON, well then we don't wanna send a file at all. So this will be entirely different. Let's get rid of all of this and say response.json, and we can put some JSON here inside of our response. And let's just say error, and over here, we can say 404, not page, let's just say not found, which is essentially what a 404 is. And really what we're doing is creating a small waterfall effect here with the if, so we could make it another else if here, and then finally, and else for our last possible outcome, once I can spell else, and here we'll just respond and we can set the type to text, just txt for the type actually, and then we can send, and inside the send we'll just put the same text that we have up here, 404 not found. So I'll paste that in and that should work as well. So now I'll go ahead and remove these blank lines and we will test out our 404 once again. I'll go to Chrome and I've already got slash Dave in the URL so I'll just see if I can reload this 404 once the server restarts. And now it's restarted, I'll hit reload and we got the 404 and it is the HTML. Now I would have to use Postman or something else to uh, try out the JSON file or possibly text as well. We would change the headers for that. And I'm just going to let you trust me that that will work for now instead of breaking out Postman or, or anything to just try out those two other routes. But overall, that is what you can do to customize a 404 with app all. And I hope you understand at least a little bit of the difference between app.use, which is for 
middleware and does not accept regex, and app.all, which is more for routing, and it will apply to all HTTP methods at once. Today, we're going to talk about creating routers in the Express.js framework. And we're going to start out with the code repository from the last tutorial, but if you don't have it, you should be able to easily follow along, or you can download or clone the starter source code from the link I'm providing in the description below. All right, in Visual Studio Code, we've got our server.js file. And from the previous tutorial, we've got a lot of code in here. And really what we can do is break these routes out into individual routers that are essentially mini servers for each specific route or mini apps as we create our app with Express here. These will be mini apps and we'll refer to them as routers. So over in the file tree, let's create a new directory and let's call this directory routes. And now inside the routes, we can create routers for each route that we are handling. So let's create a new file here and let's call this subdir.js because we have a subdir directory in our views folder that we haven't handled at all yet. Now in the subdir.js, we need to start out with a few requirements once again. And the first would be express just like we did in the regular app or server.js, if you will. So we have require, express, and then after that, just like we have before, we have applied express. However, now we'll define a router instead of an app, and we'll set this equal to express.router with a capital R. And then we're going to go ahead and need the path module as well from common core module in Node.js. So we'll require path. After that, let's just go ahead and put our module.exports and set that equal to router because that's what we'll always do when we create a router. And then we can import that back in the server.js when we need it. Now we're ready to just pull our routes in. So let's look at the server.js and the routes that we had or did not have at this point for the subdirectory. And I don't believe we had any yet. We were just routing to our specific views for index and the new page. And of course we were redirecting the old page. So we hadn't handled anything for the subdirectory yet. It has its own index and it has a file called test HTML. So I'm going to copy how we handled the index for the root. And then we can just modify that in the subdirectory. And instead of app.get, we now have a router. So let's replace app with router. And now it's router.get. And then we can handle the slash or index for the subdirectory the same way we did for our root. And we have a request and response. And we can get remove this commented line that we had in there before. And then we are sending a file. And we're sending the root directory. We get the directory name here. And then we want to have views, but now we have to think about this because we are not inside the root. So we can't just look directly into the views directory. So we need to come up out of the routes directory we created and then into the views directory. And then we're not only just looking for the index because that would be the root index. Now we need to specify the subdirectory that we have and then the index HTML that's within that subdirectory file. After that, let's copy this down and I can press shift alt and the down arrow. I'm using Windows. It may be different if you're on Mac or Linux. And now we have another git route, but this will be for the test.html. And so we can replace index with test and remove the initial slash. We'll leave the HTML optional. This is regex that we can use within the route. And now we're sending a file once again, but instead of sending index, we're sending test, not text, .html. And we can save that. Now that we've created the router file for the subdirectory, we need to go back to server.js. And underneath where we serve the static files, and we set that, we need to go ahead and provide a route. And we do that with app dot use in the server file. And now let's provide the route that we are providing the router for. And then 
we can go ahead and require the router that we have created. And now this will be in dot slash routes slash, and there's the subdirectory. And after we provide that, we should be finished. And now this will route any request coming for the subdirectory to the router instead of the routes that we are providing below through app.get such as index and new page. So this will match in front of these. And of course, we can put all of these in a router and we will next. But let's go ahead and start the dev server. I'm going to press control in the back tick, but you can go to the terminal menu and open a new terminal window. And if you remember, we type npm run dev. And this will start our local dev server with Nodemon, which will listen for any changes. And it's on port 3500. So let's go to Chrome and I'll go to my blank page. I'll type localhost port 3500. And there we've got our index file and that's fine. But we want to go to the subdirectory and see if this is working. So we've got subdir. And yes, we've got our subdirectory index page. And let's go ahead and see if the test index page in the subdirectory is also working. I said index test.html actually. And there's our test page in the subdirectory as well. Okay, now let's ask for a page that does not exist in this subdirectory. And let's see what we get. Well, we got our 404 page, but there's something important to notice here. In the past, when we've got our 404 page, it had CSS supplied for it. Now, we didn't put CSS on the previous subdirectory pages. That was not included anyway. But if we requested a 404 on any other page that was not in the subdirectory, it does have CSS applied. So why is the CSS not working for our subdirectory? Well, it's because we haven't told Express to use the public folder or public directory, if you will, for the subdirectory. So let's copy this line down with Shift Alt and the down arrow once again. And now we can specify the subdirectory here and tell Express to use that public directory. Before we didn't supply a directory, but the default is the slash anyway. And so that's essentially what we were doing. But we can save these. And now we should be able to go back and request our 404, basically any page that doesn't exist in the subdirectory, and probably get the formatted 404. Yes, now, even though we're in the subdirectory and I requested a page named Dave that doesn't exist, um, we got a 404 that actually has the CSS supplied. And you can even see the request coming through down here for the CSS in the subdirectory, and it now works. And I'd like to make one quick correction from the last tutorial that I did provide information that was correct in older versions. However, in newer versions of Express, Express does support regex inside of app.use. And I said it didn't when I compared app.use to app.all. But now you can have regex there. And so if we are to require a router and we put a slash with an asterisk here, this would supersede the subdirectory router. In other words, all routes would go to this router if we supplied that. Of course, we don't wanna do that. So we wanna specifically state just the slash or we could even get more specific and we could say, hey, it must start with the slash and it must end with the slash. And then, of course, we would only be providing that for the slash right here. But that is because it supports regex and in previous older versions, Express did not support regex inside of app.use, but in the route it now does. Let's go ahead and create a router for this a root directory here. So let's say dot slash routes slash root. And now I'll add the semicolon, Whoa, one more over and save. And now we need to go ahead and create this route because right now it doesn't exist. So let's go over here to the file tree. I'll collapse the views folder. We don't need to see what's open there, but inside of routes, let's go ahead and create this root dot js. And now inside of the root.js file, 
let's go back to server and grab the routes that we were using for the root. And we have our index page, our new page, and a redirect for an old page. And control X will cut those out and we can paste those inside of the root. But we also need those imports and basically everything you would normally start out with for a router. These three imports at the top, express, router, and path. So we'll put those at the top of root as well. And then at the bottom, once again, you want to have module.exports and set that equal to the router. Now what haven't we changed yet is the keyword app here that we were using in the server JS. We need to switch to router as well. We can once again get rid of this commented file. And we have to once again consider the route that we're providing because now we're in the routes folder. So yes, we have the directory name value, but then we need to come up out of the routes folder and then look in the views folder. Now this will be correct now. We're not looking in a subdirectory, so we no longer have to provide it there. Let's go ahead and copy this and paste it into the route for the new page as well. However, the route for the old page is a redirect and this will be okay to leave it as it is. So let's save the root and let's go back to the server. We can also get rid of some of these examples of route handlers that we had, such as the hello right here and the chaining, the route handlers that I had previously provided for the chain route. Let's just delete all of that to clean it up a little bit and save our server JS. It's now restarted, so let's see if these routes are now working with the new router. And we'll come back and just go to the root. And yes, we got the root page. Let's go to slash new dash page. HTML should be optional. And there's our new page and our image is working, which means we're getting our static file routed correctly to the public directory where the image is stored. And now let's go to old page and see if the redirect still works. And yes, we redirected back to the new page. Let's go ahead and type in index instead of just the slash. And yes, we still get the index page. Everything in the new router for the root is working correctly. With our routes working correctly, let's talk about how we would set up an API or a REST API, if you will. And that's what is more important when we're working with, say, the MERN stack, as say, uh, Mongo, Express, Node, and of course, React on the front end. Or you could substitute any database technology for Mongo, but we've got Node and Express here. And we want to organize a API, which is what we would more than likely create with Node and Express, say, compared to a static server for web pages, although you can do that. Uh, it's much more likely that you'll create an API. And that's what we'll focus on here. So underneath these routes, we're going to create one more route. And this will be to employees. And then inside of routes, it's going to be in a subfolder named API and then be employees. And notice this will just be routed by the user going to employees. They will not have to type API. So let's go ahead and save this and then let's start creating that route. Inside of routes, we want to create another directory and that's API. And then inside of the API, we want to create our employees router and that's employees.js. Now up here inside the data folder, we've already got a file named data.json. Let's go ahead and rename this file and let's call it employees.json. And let's give each employee inside of this file an ID and we'll just make these chronological. So we've got one and an ID of two. And now that we got that, we can just go ahead and save our small employees data file. And remember that's employees.json inside the data folder. And we've created the route here inside of server using app use. Now it does not need to have any static files as we'll just be delivering JSON data from our API. So we wouldn't typically have any static files like we would with a web page. So now let's go back to our employees dot js route. Let's start out our route just like we did the others. So we want to define express. We'll set this equal to requiring express. 
And then we want to go ahead and define our router once again. And we'll set this equal to express.router with a capital R and call router into action. And we'll once again need the path common core module from Node.js so we can require path. And after path, let's go ahead and define an empty object named data. And from there, let's set data.employees equal to require. And now let's get that JSON file. So we need to go up out of the API folder, and then we need to go up out of the routes folder, then into the data folder, and then to get employees.json. And so this is kind of like connecting to a database. This is just what we're doing for this tutorial and, and dev. Of course, in the future, we'll work on connecting to Mongo. And of course, you could replace that with your database technology of choice. But once again, just for this tutorial, just for dev, we're just going to import some JSON to simply work with here. So now let's go ahead and create our module.exports and set that equal to router again, as we always do with a router. And now we can set up our routes. Now, instead of just saying router.get and creating another router.post and another router.put, and of course, putting those paths in there like we could, one thing we can do is say router.route and then provide the route. And then we can chain the different HTTP methods that we want to provide for this same route as a get request and a post request can both go to the same route, but there can be a different result for each. So let's handle the get request first. And here's a request and a response. And now inside the handler of the get request, let's just return JSON and let's return all the employees. So that will be data.employees. Now for the post request, we can just come down here and say dot post. And once again, we can have a request and a response. We can handle this completely differently for the HTTP method post than we do for get. And now with a post, we'll get parameters coming in to the request. And we can refer to those parameters with request dot body and then dot whatever the name of the parameter is. And we had a first name and a last name and a post request would be posting a new employee. So what we want to do, I'm not going to put in the full code that we would have in an API at this moment because it's not really about coding an API right now. We're handling routes. So we just want to see how each one of these would work. So let's say the first name that we return in the JSON will return what is sent and that's request.body.firstName. And then let's go ahead and return the last name as well. And that's request.body.lastName. Once again, not writing out all the code for an API at this point, just showing how we can get the parameters from a post request, and then we're just sending those parameters back. But this is how we could handle each route in an API. Now let's go ahead and do the same thing with a put request. I have a request and a response, and this would be the HTTP method that you would use when you're updating an employee, for example. But we could do the same thing. We could get the res.json here, and as a matter of fact, I can just copy this down. And of course, the code would be different if you were writing an actual API because you would be updating at that point. And we'll do that in the near future, just not going to do it yet. And then let's get a delete. Now, a delete would be different. We wouldn't be getting the first name and the last name. We would be getting the ID. So we'll just send the ID back in this case. And that would be response.json once again. But let's go ahead and send the ID back here. And this would be request.body.id. Now you can see we've chained each HTTP method together. And we've got get, post, put, and delete all coming into the same route on our router. They're just different request methods. And of course, this being the last one, we'll go ahead and stop right there. And I'm going to save this, but we're going to add one more route. We have the route coming in with just the slash, just the root, but then also 
we could have router dot route and then a slash but we could have a parameter directly in the url and that's what we're showing here is a parameter and this would be a get request that has a parameter inside of the url so now down here and of course you could do that with other requests too we're going to use a get request so let's go ahead and put the handler for our get request here we have our request and response and now inside the handler we'll once again respond with json and we'll just say here's the id requested and now this is different instead of request.body it's request.params.id and that's because we're pulling the parameter it's a named parameter actually and we're pulling it directly out of the url so here we're responding once again with just what we received just as an example now i'll put in future code we'll go ahead and actually code out an api right now handling the routes and so all of this is inside the router and i guess we didn't need path right here at this moment so we can get rid of that but all of this is inside the router for employees let's go ahead and save this and we can test it out and our server is still running below so we can now check these routes with thunder client thunder client is an extension in the past i've used postman which is a separate program to test apis but let's go ahead and try this extension out you can find it under extensions search for thunder client and it allows you to save different routes you want to test so right here i'm going to go ahead and choose the get route that i created first there it is for all employees which of course there's only two and you can see here is our http method and here is the route and now i'll click send and here's the response i can just make the response full screen but we've got both of our employees returned and that's exactly what we expected so now after testing the get route let's go ahead and test the post route so i'll choose that from our list well let me go to collections i believe i saved everything there there we go let's choose post and now we're once again going to the employees route but it's got post let's look at the parameters and see if those were saved and it should be under body actually there we go and i'm posting a new employee named John Doe. So let's see if we get that in return. We'll send that and let's look at what was returned. Yes, we got John Doe sent back to us. And that's all we're going for today once again as we're not writing out the actual code to add the employee or update the employee and things like that. In the near future, yes, I will. Okay, put should be the next one to test. So now it's a put method at the same URL and once again we are sending some john doe oh actually sending just the id and the first name of what we wanted to update and of course i think i had the put request just sending back the first name and last name so maybe we'll just get the first name back let's see what we get when we test put and yes we just got the first name back and that's what i expected so that works also now let's test the delete route of course it won't actually delete the employee this time around and looks like we're sending just the id and we should get that id back expand and yes in return we've got the id back so that route is also working now there's one more get route where we could get a specific employee and let's see if that one's here or here here we go so this is our route with employees but then it has slash and the number one where we're requesting just one employee not both so let's go ahead and send that and see what we get in return and we returned the id of one so that route is also working and again this extension is called thunder client if you want to check it out for testing the routes in your api now as a challenge before my next tutorial you could go ahead and write out the code to update the json that we were receiving and of course just hold it in memory don't really update the file but you could test out what you want to do here for each of these routes and you could handle each one of those and i'll come back with some code for that in the next tutorial and what i really also want to talk about in the next tutorial is organizing the rest of this api including the server file 
and setting it up because after that, we'll pretty much be ready to connect everything to whichever database technology we would want to. So we'll organize this with an MVC pattern that is model view controller. And of course I can come back and add some extra code here to handle the API data just for the JSON as an extra test. It's not really anything to do with specifically Express. That's just JavaScript and handling how you would basically do CRUD operations, create, read, update, and delete. Today we will organize our Node.js and Express API server with the model view controller design pattern. You may have also heard this design pattern referred to as MVC. That said, remember Express is by definition an unopinionated framework, and you can organize your project however you would like. I'm just demonstrating MVC because it's a popular pattern. We're going to start with the code repository from the last tutorial, but if you don't have it, you should be able to easily follow along without it, or you can download or clone the starter source code from the link I'm providing in the description below. Okay, we're right here in Visual Studio Code, and we've got our server.js file, and we want to use the correct terminology. So we were keeping our data inside of a data folder. And you can see I've renamed it to model. It still has the employees.json file in there. And we're just emulating a database here with a employees.json file instead of connecting to one at this point because you might have MySQL or Mongo in mind or whatever. Later on in the series, I plan to show Mongo. However, right now we're just going to simulate that connection to a database. And now besides that, we have a views folder and really with a RESTful API, we won't have many views if hardly one. Uh, maybe we would have a welcome page that gives some directions about the API, but that's about it. We're not really serving a bunch of static pages or resources. What we will have though is a controller folder. So let's go ahead and create that. Oh, and I said controller, and really I should make this plural because it could host more than one. So let's go ahead and call this controllers and it will hold controller files. So inside of here, let's go ahead and create an employees controller.js file. Now currently we have all of our logic really inside of our routes. So if we open up routes and the API directory and then look at employees.js, our logic is essentially the route handlers. So for router.route, and then we come to the git HTTP method, we've got this handler that returns all of the employees. So what we would want to do would be remove that logic from here and take it to the controller. So we could name this something like get all employees. And then we can just assign that route handler as a function. So now we have a get all employees function that is part of the controller. So let's save that. But what we also need here is the data. So the data that we were pulling in to the employees.js route inside the API is actually will need to be inside of the controller at this point instead of the route. We're breaking that out. And so we'll put that at the top of this file as well. So these functions can work with that data. So I'll save this again. And now back inside of employees, let's pull out the logic from the post. And here we go with that logic. And now we'll call this function a different name. We've got create new employee. And we'll set it equal to that action. And then the next function we'll go ahead and name as well. And that will be update employee. We'll set it equal to what we find here in the put portion of this route. And now we'll come back and assign that to update employee. And finally, as you might guess, we'll have delete employee. And we'll set that equal to the handler for delete. Not copy, but cut. There we go. And we can paste that in here as well. Now I'll go ahead and save that. Now we're not finished with the controller by any means, but we have the uh, first actions in here for these routes. And we haven't put anything back in here yet, but we will. But there's one more uh, function to create here. And this would be called just get employee instead of get all employees. So let's go ahead and get this 
action as well, or route handler is what we could refer to those as still. And let's say get employee. And now we have all of these different functions defined inside of our employees controller. And of course, we're pulling in the data here at the top. But as you might expect, we need to export these as well. So we'll have module.exports. Let's set this equal to an object now. And so we had get all employees. And then we had create new employee. And we had update employee and delete employee. And then we had get employee. And so we're exporting all of these functions now. Let's go back to the employees JS routes and let's import our controller. So let's call this employees controller and we'll set it equal to require. And then we have to consider where we are. So we go up a folder and then up another folder. And once we're there, now we can select the controllers folder and inside there we find our employees controller. Now we could deconstruct those functions here as we import those in, but I think I'll leave the name employees controller because we're emphasizing creating a controller here, and then we'll just put in the functions. And in Visual Studio Code, I believe if I start typing the functions, it's going to import the part that says employees controller for me. And sure enough, it does. So now we can have create new employee and select that. And here we're going to have update employee. And finally, we should have delete employee, not this delete. We didn't quite get that right. Delete employee, there it is. And so all of these actions are coming from the controller or route handlers, we could say. And this still doesn't look right. We didn't get, we've got a D in front of there. Employees controller dot delete employee. That's what we should have. And now here we should have get employee with the employees controller. So this definitely cleaned up our route file here quite a bit, and we've separated the logic into our controller. And that's really what the model view controller pattern is all about. And so we could do that with other routes if we had other routes as well. But now we've really cleaned up our whole project. Let's go back and do just a little more cleanup in the server JS, and we can get rid of some of these views that we're no longer going to use. One other thing I'd like to do is you see we're pulling some things into the server file right at the beginning, and we're starting to use the logger right away, but we're taking up a lot of space here with cores, and we don't have any kind of configuration folder over here in the file tree yet. So let's go ahead and create a config folder, no, not JS, just config folder, and now we can go ahead and create a cores options.js file right there. And back in the server, let's go ahead and take our whitelist and cores options and cut those out of here and paste them into our cores options.js here. And I'm going to put each one of the URLs on its own line just so it's easier to read. And after we define the whitelist at the top, we have our cores options. And as you might guess, we need to do module.exports, set this equal to cores options. And now we'll need to import this back inside of the server. So at the top of the server here, we can just put it right under cores and we'll say const cores options and set this equal to require dot slash dot slash there we go config and now inside of the config folder we have our cores options we can save that let's see if there's anything else we can clean up i've got some extra comments in here of course this being a tutorial that kind of makes sense let's make them a little bit smaller just put form data besides that and the routes look good and we have our catch-all 404 here and we have our error handler, and we have made our server JS much smaller. We're down to 44 lines of code, including some spaces here, and we have pulled that logic out into a controller. So that has really helped clean up, but we're really not going to need these example of a subdirectory anymore. So let's go ahead and get rid of that, and that means we can get rid of the app use for the static files in the subdirectory as well. 
and save that once again. And that means we can delete the subdirectory route from the tree. And we can also go ahead and delete the subdirectory over here in the views. And let's go ahead and delete the new page. And that means we can go into our root routes and we will not be routing to a new page or an old page any longer either and get rid of both of those. And now that's quite a bit of cleanup, but at least we still have our splash page for the index if we wanted to put some directions for our API there. And so we're handling that inside of the root route and that's in our routes folder. And then we have our API directory and that handles the employees routes here. Okay, with everything cleaned up, in the last tutorial, I promised to go ahead and provide the JavaScript code. This is not so much just dealing with Express or Node, but the code, if you were to have an API that was going to update, not the JSON file, but just in memory and kind of emulate an API before we've connected it to a database. So at this point, I can go ahead and provide that code. And if you had went ahead and worked on the challenge that I said at the end of the last tutorial, you can compare your code to what I did. I'm just noticing I didn't change the path to the data folder here either for the employees because really it didn't need to come up to anymore. So you would just come up out of the controller folder and then you're not even going into a data folder at this point, you're going into a model folder. But I'm going to change this, all of this now, but I wanted to say that correction about the path. And let's have the data object set like this. And if you work with React, I'm thinking in more of a Reactful way when I do this, but I've got the employees data set, still pulling it in and just setting it directly to the employees property of the data object. But then I've got a set employees function here as well that I'll use inside of these other functions. Now, as you might expect, get all employees doesn't really need any extra work. We're just returning all of the employees by referencing data.employees, and that's fine. Now to create a new employee, I'll paste in my code and we can review it. There's a little bit more work there. So when we get a new employee, we wanna create the new ID. And instead of importing a package like UUID or something like that, I'm just grabbing the last employee in the JSON array and I'm adding one to the ID that exists there, whatever the last one is. So of course I need to make sure they're in chronological order, which will come into play later. But that's what I'm doing here. Other than that, uh, first name and last name assigned to the parameters we're getting from request.body, and then of course it's first name and last name. After that, we're making sure that a first name and last name are sent. And if not, we're sending a response 400 saying, hey, we didn't get the required data. After that, I'm using the set employees function to go ahead and set the employees to the new information. And of course, the new employee is at the end of the array. And I'm just realizing here, I didn't send a different status when we send the employees back. And I'm sending all of the employees instead of just the new ones so we could see the update. But here we could also send a status of 201, which means it created the new record. And we'll go ahead and save that. Okay, update employee gets a little more complicated, but it's not too bad. So let's go ahead and paste this code in and review it. So here we grab the employee if we received an ID as a parameter, and we should because we're updating an existing employee. And if the employee does not exist, we're returning a response status 400, meaning we did not get good data to update, and we have the message here as well, employee ID is not found. And that would be the end of it if we didn't get an ID. But then if we did, then we're checking to see if we got a first name, go ahead and set the employee that we found to the new parameter value. And the same for last name, and of course to that parameter value as well. And then we filter the array and we remove the existing employee record from it. So then we have an array with the existing, or I mean without the existing employee ID. And then we have the new employee uh, data that we've updated here. So we go ahead and create an unsorted array. And we need to remember it's unsorted because we do need this array in chronological order by ID. And so when I call the set employees 
function from our data object, I go ahead and sort the array by that ID column. And this is a chain ternary statement. This is where it could look a little complicated if you have not worked with sorting arrays before. So we start out with the ternary statement here saying pretty much if the one element of the array dot ID is greater than the other, then return one. And normally, if we were just doing that, then if not, it would be returning a negative one, but we need to have a zero if they're even as well. So then we chain this into another ternary, and there it returns a minus one or the zero at the end of that. And then of course we send the employees after they've been updated by set employees. And that puts the array, the JSON array, back in the order we need it right there. Okay, scrolling up to get a little room to put in the code for the delete employee. We paste this in, it looks very similar. We find that employee, but if we didn't get the ID, we send the 400 response just like above. We also create a filtered array, a filtered array just like above we did in the update. But then at this point, we've deleted the employee, so all we need to do is set the employees to the filtered array. And then we once again return the employees. And finally, the get employee. And of course, this is handling a request for the data of just one employee. So we find out who that employee is. And once again, if the employee doesn't exist, we send that same response that we did not get good data. But if the employee exists, all we need to do is return that specific employee. And then we're down here to the exports. So I will include all of this code inside of the git hub repository for the end. This will not be the starter code, but the beginning. And then you can see this and compare to yours if any of my explanation did not make sense. And it looks like I've got an error here in the code. I think I missed the ending curly brace. There it is, they should be yellow, at least the way I have my Visual Studio Code set up. Tab that over and save, and all looks good now. now I think I still have an issue here. The delete employee did not close out. If I close that out, then I can remove that. There we go. Almost had a bigger mistake that would have taken me longer to fi figure out. So save that, and now it looks like get employee, delete employee, update employee, create new employee, get all employees, that all looks like they're defined correctly and there's no more error here in the file. Getting rid of the extra space and let's go to Thunder Client, but we also need to go ahead and start the server up because I don't think we have done that yet. And with the dev server open, type in, I mean the terminal open, we'll type npm run dev. There we go and start the dev server, and then we'll be able to test out our API. Running on port 3500, that's what we needed. We'll open the employees API collection that I'd created in Thunder Client. And now this you'll have to create yourself, of course, if you haven't, but let's test git employees and see what we start with there. So we've got a git request, and we're going to the employees route to see the results. And we've got the two starter employees, Dave Gray and John Smith. Okay, now let's go to post and let's post a new employee. And if we go to body, you can see I'm sending some raw JSON here. We're posting employee John Doe. We'll send that post request. There's a 201 rec created response like we wanted to send. And now we have John Doe here and he has an ID of three as we expected him to. So now let's go to the put employee and same route with a put request. We'll go to the body and see what I'm sending in the JSON. And let's change this. Let's update the second employee. So it's right in the middle and change his name to David. Now let's go ahead and send. And now let's look at our employees that were sent back. And yes, second employee is now David Smith and they're still in the correct order. He did not get inserted at the end. It's not out of order. And so that all worked as we wanted it to. Now let's try the delete employee. And let's look at the body once again, what's being sent in the request. And we're going to delete employee number three. So let's go ahead and do that. And now if we look, all the employees were sent back. Now we only have two employees once again. And now let's finally 
request an employee. This is get an employee, and we're going to request employee number one. Send that request, and it looks like we received the information back for employee number one. So all of our routes are working as expected. Once again, I'll include everything that you saw today in the employee controller, if you're curious about the API code, I'll include that and more in the GitHub uh, link that I'm going to put in. And don't mistake the final code or the starter so source code. I will have a link to both. Today, we will add user authorization to our Express API. We're going to start with the code repository from the last tutorial, but if you don't have it, you should be able to easily follow along without it, or you can download or clone the starter source code from the link that I've provided in the description below. We're going to get started by simulating a user's database table in our model directory with a user's JSON file. So let's open the model directory and let's create a new file and name it users.json. And now we really don't need to put anything in here, but I'll go ahead and just put in an empty array as if it would hold JSON, but it's not right now because we're going to write over this really. Now, user authorization requires two routes, a registration route to register a new user account and an authorization route to authorize the user after they have created an account. But we're going to start in the controllers folder because that's where we'll really handle the routes and what we do with them. So let's go ahead and create a new controller and let's call this register controller.js. Okay, in the register controller, let's start out by pulling in our users from the users database that we're simulating with that JSON file. I'm going to create an object and set this up much like you would see with use state in React, where we have our users state, and we'll go ahead and require those users. And this will be slash model slash users dot JSON. And after we do that, let's go ahead and have a set users method for this object as well. And here we can say function, pass in the data, and now, oops, I'm so used to writing an arrow function, but this will not have an arrow. And it's users equals data. There we go. And now that we've got our set users function and then our users pulled in, so we'll have our users database object that contains both of these, just a quick way to simulate that. So if you're used to working with React, this should look kind of familiar, even though it's not really the use state. And if you're not, I hope you're familiar enough with JavaScript to understand how this will be the users. And of course, we'll set the users using our setter function right here. Okay, now we need some other things because we're going to work with that JSON file. So let's go ahead and pull in FS promises. And that's the file system, so we require fs, but then after it we put dot promises. And then we're also going to need path, so let's require path. Well, there we go. If I can type path, we'll get it. And now we're going to need to install a package called bcrypt. And bcrypt will help us hash and salt the passwords that we come in so we can securely and safely store them in our database. So let's go ahead and open a terminal window. I press control back tick here in Windows to open my terminal window. You could also go to the terminal menu and choose new terminal. But here we're going to type npm i and then b crypt. That's b c r y p t. And we'll go ahead and install this package. It shouldn't take long. And when it's complete, we'll check our package.json file to ensure that it has been added to our project. And it looks like we're about ready to do that now. So let's see. We've got it installed. Let's scroll down here and I'll choose package.json. And yes, bcrypt has been added to our package.json file. So we'll go ahead and close that out. Now we can require bcrypt at the top of our file with our other requirements. So set that equal to require and pull in bcrypt. Okay, now that we've done that, let's go ahead and define our handler for the new user information that we'll receive at this register route. So I'm going to call this handle new user, and this is going to receive a request and a response. Now what I forgot to do was make this an async function, which we need to do. We can use async await with bcrypt 
and we might need it somewhere else too. Now, when we first pull this information in, the request is going to have a user and a password. So let's destructure that from the request body. So we'll get the user and the password, let's set this equal to the request.body. And now we can say if there's no user or there's no password, we'll go ahead and return right here with a response. The status will be 400, which stands for bad request. That's an HTTP status uh, code. And then JSON will go ahead and send a message down. And we'll say message. And now we'll say username and password are required. And I'm noticing that we're not wrapping lines, so I'm going to press Alt-Z in Windows. That's what goes ahead and tells Visual Studio Code to wrap the lines of code. It may be different if you're on Mac or Linux. Okay, so we're sending that response if we did not receive the user or password. But now at this point, we'll know we have received both the user and password. And this is where we would, let me go ahead and put a comment here, check for duplicate usernames in the database. And now since we're connecting to our JSON file to use as our database just as a simulation for this tutorial, we can go ahead and check for a duplicate in that JSON by doing this. Let's go ahead and define duplicate and then we'll set that equal to usersdb dot users, which will pull in the users. Then we can use find and now out of each user, let's go ahead and call this person so it just doesn't get confusing by too many users or using the word user over and over. This will be person. And then we're seeing if the person dot username from our user database is equal to the user that has been submitted, the username that's been submitted by the user. And therefore, we can see if we get a result as duplicate. And then we can say if we have a duplicate, then we want to return a response. It's response.sendStatus, and it's 409. And that is a conflict, is what that HTTP status code stands for. But if not, we're going to start a try catch now. So here's our try, and of course we have a catch afterwards where we would catch an error. And now let's go ahead and fill out that error block first. So if we get an error here, we're going to send a response with a status of 500, which would be a server error. We'll have a JSON, and let's go ahead and send a message here as well. And we can just pass in the error.message that is received. Okay, but in our try block now, we need to go ahead and create our new user and of course also use bcrypt to hash the password. Okay, I'll put a comment right here that we're going to encrypt the password with the next line. And this is where we'll use bcrypt. So let's define our hashed password and we'll set that equal to await and then use bcrypt. And now, oops, I'm sorry, we don't want compare, we want hash. And inside of that, we pass in the password that we've received from the user, we're going to hash it. And here we determine the salt rounds. So it not only hashes the password, but it adds a salt to it. And that really helps protect the uh, password if your database is somehow compromised, because at that point, if a hacker were able to figure out the hash, they could crack all of the passwords in the database. But adding the individual salts makes that much more difficult and unique for each one. So here we'll pass in 10 salt rounds, which is essentially the default or the standard there. And that will add the salt and the hash all at once. And bcrypt does a great job of storing those together at the same time. So that's really all we have to do there. Now that we've got the hashed password, we're going to go ahead and store, I'll put store the new user. And this, remember, is just going to our simulated user table that we're using in the JSON. So here I'm going to say new user and define the new user object first. And we'll set this equal to username. We'll pass in the user. And then we'll have a password that we're going to store. 
and this will be our hashed password that we've created. Now let's set the new data with usersdb.setusers, and here we'll pass in all of the data that we have. So we're working with immutable data. Instead of adding to the existing array, we're going to create a brand new array and then set all of that in the database. Very similar to using state in React here. So this will be dot, 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 users, db, dot, users, and then we'll also add the new user all in this new array that we are setting as the new users or the new users data. Okay, now that we've set that, let's go ahead and write it to our JSON file, which is our database in this simulation. So we'll have fs promises dot write file. And now I'm going to break this out into separate lines just so we can see everything better. I'll go ahead and close our terminal window too. So now on the first line, I'm going to use path.join and we're going to pull in the directory name. And after that, we need to go up out of the controllers directory. And then we need to go down into the model directory. And then we need to go ahead and write our users dot json file so this will overwrite any existing file there and once we've done that we need to specify the data we're sending and this will say json dot stringify and we're going to pass in our users db dot users okay from there let's just log to the console so we can see all of the users or at least the one user that we add but we'll log all in case we go ahead and test it more than once and add more than one user. Log those to the console, and then we need to send a status. And that status is 201 to say the new user was created. And let's go ahead and send some JSON again with a success. You could put message here or whatever you want, but we'll put new user, and then we'll pass in the user so we get the username and we'll say created. And I needed to make this a template literal. Instead of using single quotes, we need back ticks. And that way we can pass the user straight into the string that we're sending back. So we've created the new user and there's the response. And that's basically it, except at the very bottom now, we need to use module.exports. And let's go ahead and put this in an object so we can pull in the full name of the controller when we import it, just like we have previously done with the employees controller. And there we're finished with the register controller. So now let's go to the routes folder and we'll need to create a new route for this. Let's just call this register.js. And now at the top of register.js, we need to pull in express again, and this will be equal to require express and then we need to define our router so we'll set the router equal to express.router and then we'll need to go ahead and pull in the controller so let's call this register controller and we'll set it equal to require and then we need to come up out of the routes folder and then we'll go into the controllers folder and from there, we'll choose the register controller. Okay, now that we've got that, let's define our router or our route that we're looking for here. And it's a post, and this will come in at the slash, just the root. And then we'll pull in our register controller dot handle new user. And after that, we can use module exports on it. I can spell module. We'll set this equal to router as we do with our routes. And now finally in the server JS at the very bottom of our file tree, we want to go ahead and add this route with the other routes. So I'll just copy this down to start off. And we have this slash and this will be app use and now we're going to use the register route and we're going to require routes slash register. And we can save that. I'm going to collapse this open editor so we can see all the file tree at once. And if you remember 
In our package JSON, we have NodeMon installed as a dev dependency, and that will help us go ahead and start this dev server. So I'm going to press Control Backtick once again to launch a new terminal window. Again, you can do that from the terminal menu as well. And now I'm going to type npm run dev to launch our server. And we should get a message here saying what port it's running on. And it looks like we've got an error. Let's see where the error is. Cannot find module model user JSON. Oh, and that's because I named it users JSON. So we didn't import that correctly. Let's go back to our register controller and change that to users.json and we'll save. And now we should see NodeMon restart and we're running on port 3500. Okay, now we can check our route and I'm going to use an extension called ThunderClient to do that. And you see ThunderClient up here in the top left. If you don't have ThunderClient installed, you can do that or you can use something else like the app Postman would be a good one that is normally used to check API routes with. But you can find ThunderClient in VS Code extensions. And I've found it's pretty good to check APA, API routes with in a dev environment. So here it is on the left. I've got the circle with the lightning bolt. And we can go ahead and create a new request. And I, you can also save collections. And I've got a collection here already with the request that I want to make. So I'll look at this first one and you can see it's a post request and it's going to http colon slash slash localhost port 3500 and this goes to auth. I don't want the auth. We created the register one. Let me find that. There's the register one. Okay. Now if I click on ThunderClient or the file tree or anything else, it will hide this. And I've noticed that ThunderClient has a much better appearance when we hide that bar over here. So now we have the request on the left, we'll get the response on the right, and I can still see the Node.js uh, console down here at the bottom. So with the register route in here, and it's a post route, I need to check the body and make sure I'm sending something. I'm going to send user walt3. I believe I'll just create walt1 this time around. And here's a password. And of course it's unencrypted right now, but we'll see what we get in the Node.js console, because remember, we're going to log to the console, the users, and that should also include the password, if I remember correctly. And of course, we'll get the response over here that the client would get. So I'll click send. And on the right, we've got success, new user, Walt1 created. Now here at the bottom, it's got just a little more information, so we need to pull this up so we can see more. And there you see, our users JSON and it created Walt1 and here is the encrypted password that is both hashed and salted that Bcrypt helped us create from the password that we passed in. So now let's go ahead and pull this down and let's create one more user. Let's just create Walt2 and we'll send this. Success, new user Walt2 created. And now let's once again look at the node console and you can see now both users were logged to the console here in node and they have different passwords as well that are encrypted. And of course we could break all that down, but I'll let you look at the link to Bcrypt and I've got another good article on that as well. I'll link to both of those in the description below. So make sure you do that. Okay, we have tested and handled the registration. But of course, now we need to go ahead and handle the authorization as well. I'm going to close the terminal again, and I'm going to copy the import of the users DB with users in, set users, and I'll go ahead and create an auth controller now in the controllers directory. So we'll call this auth controller.js. And now the first thing I'll do is paste in the users DB where we import in our users JSON that simulates our users database table. And we're also going to need bcrypt again. So let's set this equal to require and bcrypt. And now we can begin constructing our function. Let's call this handle login. And let's set it equal to an async function that has a request and a response. Now inside the function, we'll start out just like we did inside the register controller where we expect to get a user and a password 
parameter both sent to us and if we don't we'll send back that 400 HTTP status code that says it is a bad request. So we can paste those right in. I'll press Alt Z again so the code wraps. So they start out the same way, but after that there are definitely some differences. And what we need to do now is try to find the user that's sent in. Before we even concern ourselves with the password, let's just see if the username exists. So I'm going to call this found user and set it equal to usersdb.users.find and then we'll look at each person in the users table and we'll say person.username equal to user and find works this way until it actually finds somebody and then if it finds somebody it will return that value and if not of course it will be false or undefined at that point so now we could log this and take a look, but let's just say if we do not find a user, if we do not have a found user, we'll go ahead and return response.send status. And we're going to send a 401, which means unauthorized. And I could put a link to MDN that lists all of the HTTP status codes in the description below as well. I think I will do that. So there, if we do not find the user, we know, hey, that's it. There's no need to look any further. This is unauthorized and so it won't work. But now if we do find a user, we need to go ahead and let me put a note here, just say evaluate. Now if I could spell evaluate, there we go. Evaluate password and we'll use bcrypt to do that. So let's say match is what we're going to define and we can just say await bcrypt.compare and let's pass in the password that we receive with the request and we're going to compare it to the user that we've found and the password that exists for that user. And now if we do have a match, if the passwords match, we can reply with the JSON and once again, we can send a success message and we'll just say, oh, back to X again, and we'll say user and pass in the user value. And from there we'll say is logged in. But we could also have an else there. And if we do not have a match at this point, then we'll say response, send status, and once again, this will be a 401 unauthorized. And we can save that and we're essentially finished with the function except for adding the module.exports here once again. And we'll put it in an object again and we'll say handle login. But the other note that I wanna to add to this, and we're not doing it in this tutorial, but we will in the next, is this is where we would create a JWT to send to use with the other routes that we want protected in our API. So we'd actually create and send a couple of JWTs, which would be a normal token and then the refresh token. So let's put create JWTs that would be right here in this spot. And we'll just leave this note here for the next tutorial. But now we've created our handle login in our auth controller. So we once again need to create here we go, scroll in the tree. We need to create a route for auth. So we'll just put auth.js right here. And we can copy most everything we have in the register and just change this over in auth. So at the top, we need express and router just the same, but instead of register, this is the auth controller. We can select all of those with control D and change them to auth. And after that, instead of handle new user, it is handle login that we want from the auth controller and save. And our auth uh, route is complete. Now let's go back to the server once again, and let's add the auth route as well. So let's just copy down. I press shift alt and the down arrow to copy a line down in Windows. And I'm going to put in the auth route here. I'll press control D to select both and just put auth and save that as well. With that complete, let's go back to Thunder Client and we'll look at our auth collection. There it is. And let's see if we can pull up the correct route. This is the auth route, that's great. So I'll hide the rest and we get a better look here. 
I want to see that terminal again, so I'm going to press Control and backtick to pull up the node terminal. And here we are on port 3500. So we're sending another post. This is going to localhost port 3500 and the auth route right here. So let's look at what we're sending in the body. And we want to log in with Walt1 and the password that we had previously submitted as well. So we'll see the client, what the client receives here on the right, and we'll see if anything is logged. I can't remember if we logged anything to the console this time around. But let's go ahead and send this. Well, we at least logged what route we hit here in the console, but now this says user Walt1 is logged in. Let's go ahead and try to log in with the user we don't have, like Walt3. And now we get our 401 unauthorized, which is exactly what we wanted. And I'm just thinking now, earlier, we didn't send something to register that already existed. So let's try to register a name that we've already registered. We registered Walt2 last time. This is going to the register route. So now let's try to register. And we got a 409 conflict. That's exactly what we expected there as well. So it appears our routes are working correctly and everything seems good. So this is handling authorization with username and a password on the back end, and we have simulated a database by using users.json. But in the future, we could connect this to MongoDB, MySQL, or some type of database technology, and you really wouldn't use just a JSON file in production, or at least I wouldn't recommend it. But we will come back in the next tutorial and learn how to protect routes with JSON web tokens. Today, we will add protected routes to our Express API by using JWTs. Let's discuss the JWT strategy we're going to implement today. So what are JWTs? What is the acronym JWT and abbreviation for? Well, I'm very excited about the upcoming launch of the James Webb Telescope, but in this case, that is not the correct answer. Concerning our Node and Express REST API, JWT is an abbreviation for JSON Web Tokens. JWTs can be considered to be a form of user identification that is issued after the initial user authentication takes place. When a user completes their login process and they are authenticated, our REST API will issue the client application an access token and a refresh token. The access token is given a short time before it expires, for example, 5 to 15 minutes. And the refresh token is given a longer duration before it expires, possibly several hours, a day, or even days. While no security measures are perfect, we do want to consider the risks of cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery. I will provide links about both in the description below. Our API will send and receive access tokens as JSON data. To avoid the previously mentioned risks, it is recommended for front-end client applications to only store access tokens in memory, so they will be automatically lost when the app is closed. They should not be stored in local storage or in a cookie. Essentially, if you can store it somewhere with JavaScript, a hacker can also retrieve it with JavaScript. Just keep access tokens in memory, which you might also refer to as the current application state. Our API will issue refresh tokens in an HTTP-only cookie. This type of cookie is not accessible with JavaScript. Refresh tokens do need to have an expiration, which will then require users to log in again. Refresh tokens should not have the ability to issue new refresh tokens because that essentially grants indefinite access if a refresh token falls into the wrong hands. So the overall access token process involves issuing an access token during user authorization. The user's application can then access our REST API's protected routes with the access token until it expires. Our API will verify the access token with middleware every time the access token is used to make a request. When the access token does expire, the user's application will need to send their refresh token to our API's refresh endpoint to get a new access token. Of course, the refresh token is also issued during user authorization. Our REST API's refresh endpoint will verify the token and cross-reference the refresh token in our database too. Storing a reference to the refresh token in the database will allow refresh tokens to be terminated early if the user decides to log out. And again, refresh tokens need to be allowed to expire, so indefinite access 
cannot be gained. We're going to start with the code repository from the last tutorial, but if you don't have it, you should be able to easily follow along without it, or you can download or clone the starter source code from the link that I've provided in the description below. Let's get started today by installing the node packages that we're going to need. So I'm going to press Control and the back tick. You could also go to the terminal menu and open a new terminal window. From there, I'm going to type npm i, and then we can add all of the packages that we need all on one line. So the first one is .env. The next one is JSON web token, with no spaces there. And then the last one is cookie-parser. And we'll press enter and all of those packages will install. And then we'll check our package JSON just to make sure the dependencies have all been added. And that was fairly quick. Let's go ahead and look at the package.json. And we can see under our dependencies, we've got the cookie parser, we've got .env, and we've got the JSON web token package. With that complete, I'm going to close the terminal window. And over in the file tree, I'm going to create a new file at the root level, and I'm going to name this dot. ENV, just like that. And now we can put our environment variables in here. I'm going to use all caps and type access underscore token underscore secret and set that to an equals and then we'll get the value in a second. And then I'm just going to copy that down and change the word access to refresh because we're going to create an access token and a refresh token. So let's save this much for now open the terminal window back up, and now we can type node in the terminal to go into node, and now we're running node at the command line interface. Node has a common core module called crypto, so right here at the command line we can type require, and now we can put crypto in here, and from there we can add random bytes, with camel case with a capital B, the number 64, and then dot to string, and we'll say hex. And this will give us a random crypto bytes string that we can use as our access token secret. So I'll press enter, and now I'm going to copy this, and we don't need the quotes at all inside of our dot env. Now control C to copy, and I'll just paste this in here as our access token secret. Now I can press Alt Z in Visual Studio Code to get that to wrap so it doesn't go beyond the edge of the screen. So that is our full crypto line that we just created there. Now let's go ahead and create one more. I can press the up arrow in the command line just to pull that command back up, press enter, and it generates another random crypto line here that we can copy and paste right into our .env file. And with that, I'm going to press Control S to save and close the terminal. Actually, I'm going to open the terminal back up real quick because we didn't exit node. We press Control C and then it says press Control C again. So we press it again and now we have exited node at the command line. Now I'll close the terminal window. One other thing we want to do with the .env file is make sure it has been added to our git ignore file. You do not want to send your environment variable values that you're storing in the .env file, or you could just say you do not want to send your .env file to GitHub. You want to keep this in your dev environment, and then when you host somewhere, whichever host you have, they should have a way to put the environment variables into their hosting service, then you can pull those out. Now we need to go to our controllers folder and open up our auth controller that we've created in the last tutorial. And we left a note for ourselves that this is where we want to create the JWTs on line 15. Before we get started on line 15, let's go ahead and pull in everything we will require today. So let's define JWT, set that equal to require, and then pull in our JSON web token package. After that, we need to go ahead and require dot env, and then we need dot config after that. And after that, we need our FS promises because we have not integrated Mongo or any other database technology yet. So we are still working with simple files and JSON values. So we need this FS promises and we'll set that equal to the FS module. And after that we need dot 
promises. And then finally, we need the path module. We'll set that equal to path. Now let's scroll down so we have just a little more room to work on the screen. And we're back here and now line 15 turned into line 20 where we're creating our JWTs. And let's define our access token. We we'll use camel case with a capital T on token and we'll set this equal to JWT.sign. The first thing we need to pass into the JWT is a payload. So what we're going to use is our username object. You don't want to pass in anything like a password or anything that would otherwise hurt your security because this is available to all if they get a hold of your token. So what we want to pass in is just the username. I'm going to do this on a separate line. And so we'll create this object with username. And here above we had a found user and then we can say username. Now this is coming from up here where we found the user that was logging in. After that, the second thing we need to create our access token is our secret that we defined in the .env file. So we access this by process.env.access token underscore secret. And then finally, what we need is an options value here and we can say when this token expires. And this is camel case expires in. And we're going to make this very short for this tutorial. That will allow me to show the token expiring and see what happens. But what you might want to do in production would be maybe five minutes or 15 minutes, some small window of time, but 30 seconds might be too short. It is all a preference though. And with that defined, let's go ahead and highlight all of this. And then I'll just press shift alt and the down arrow to copy it all down and we'll just make a few changes to go ahead and create our refresh token as well. So I'm going to type refresh here instead of access. We're once again going to pass in the username, but then we need the refresh token secret. And now a refresh token needs to last much longer than the access token, but you do want it to expire at some point. And so I'm going to make this one day and I'm going to give a link to the package, the JSON web token package on npm.js. And there you can see another link and more documentation on the different values you could put in here. But one day is what we're going for. And then we want it to expire and we want our users to have to log back in. You could make an indefinite refresh token, but that means if someone gets a hold of it and they're not the correct person, they will always have access and you do not want that. With both tokens created, I'm going to scroll up for a little more room again and we want to save our refresh token in the database, which will also allow us to create a logout route in the future that will allow us to invalidate the refresh token when a user logs out. So let's start by doing that. And once again, we're just working with our JSON files for now and we haven't connected this to an actual database that we will do in future tutorials. But of course that lets us modulize these tutorials and then we can uh, attack say Mongo or go over to Postgres or anything we want to in separate tutorials. So for now, just the JSON file and I'm going to define other users. We had a found user. So now we'll set other users equal to the users db dot users dot filter and now for each person that we have we're going to say person dot username not equal to and now let's have that not equal to I believe it was the user that we came in with the request right here however we also have our found user dot username and I believe I'd like to use that since we have found it so let's say found user dot username and now that creates an array of the other users that are not the username that is logged in. And now let's create a current user. And we're going to set this current user equal to the found user. And then we're also going to add in the refresh token that will be saved with this current user. And now let's set our users once again and we can say users db dot 
set users. And in this new array, we'll go ahead and add the other users. And then we'll add the current user that we just created. I really don't know why I'm putting spaces there. Really don't usually do that in an array. And okay, let's go ahead and put the semicolon. And let's write our new users file. This would be await and then fs promises dot write file. And I'll go down to a separate line. I'm going to scroll up once again, just to put that in the middle. We'll say path dot join. We'll pull in the directory name. Then we need to go up one directory. And then we need to go into the model directory. And then we need to go ahead and name this users.json as our users file is. After that, what we want to put in, we need to JSON stringify and pass in usersdb.users, which will write our new users file. And so I should have put a little comment here at the top. This is saving refresh token with current user, which again, doing this will allow us to invalidate that refresh token as the current user logs out, if they log out before their one day has expired. So as a quick review, we have created the JWTs once we have authorized the login, which was with bcrypt in the previous tutorial. But now that we authorize the login, we create the JWTs, we have a refresh token that's being saved into the online database and an access token. And yet we still need to send both the refresh token and the access token to the user. The easy part of this is to just remove what we were sending in our JSON and instead send the access token. And we can send that as JSON. And on the front end, the front end developer, or as a full stack developer, if you're developing the back end and the front end, you really want to store this access token in memory. Uh, it's not secure in local storage and any cookie that you can access with a JavaScript could also be accessed. So anything that really that JavaScript can access where you would store it, it's not really that secure. So if you store the access token in memory, which has a very short lifespan, we only gave it 30 seconds here, but like I said, maybe you'd give it 15 minutes. By keeping that in memory, you're not storing it anywhere vulnerable. After that, the refresh token well, what we're going to do, I've definitely seen tutorials that also just send it along in the JSON, but that kind of creates a dilemma for the front end developer or as you develop the front end, because you do need to store the refresh token. We want to send it as a cookie. And I know I said a cookie could be vulnerable to JavaScript, but if we set the cookie as HTTP only, it is not available to JavaScript. So that's what we want to do. So let's say res.cookie. And now here we can name the cookie. I'll just name it JWT. From there, we wanna pass in our refresh token. And after that, we want to give options. And the first option, I'll give a space here, HTTP only, set that to true. And after that, we want to set a max age. Here we go, and now I'm going to set this to 24, which would be 24 hours, 60 times 60 times 1,000. And this is in milliseconds here, so what we're really getting is one day, is that's what that is equal to as we set the max age of the cookie. And I'll go ahead and cap that off here. You could set it for longer as well. Now, a cookie is always sent with every request. But the nice thing about an HTTP only cookie is that it is not available to JavaScript. And while it's not 100% secure, it's much more secure than storing your refresh token in local storage or in another cookie that is available to JavaScript. So let's save this. And now we know we are sending our refresh cookie that is HTTP only to the user. We're also sending the access token Oh, here, we're sending our refresh token is what I meant to say in a cookie that is HTTP only. We're also sending the access token as JSON that the front end developer can grab. And we're also storing the same refresh token in a database here that can be cross referenced when it is sent back to create another access token. With our auth controller complete, let's now go look at the middleware folder 
and we need to create a new middleware file here. And let's call this verify jwt.js. And we're going to need jwt and .env once again in this file. So I'm back in the auth controller just long enough to copy these two and then go back to the verify jwt.js. And I'll paste in our required packages right at the top. After that, I'm going to create verify jwt, set this equal to a function that has a request, response, and next as middleware should. And now let's define the auth header at the very top. And this is going to be equal to request dot headers. Oh, and then we need a bracket, not a dot, and then authorization. And of course, we need to check to see if that is actually received. So now we can say if no auth header, we're going to send a response, which we need to return, and then just send the status 401, which stands for unauthorized. After that, I'm going to go ahead and put a console log statement to just go ahead and log the auth header for when we test this, we'll be able to see that in the console. You'll see a line that looks like this and it will say bearer and there will be a space and then there will be the token after that. So we can define our token now and we can set this equal to the auth header and then we can call split on that space that I just described and we'll put the space in here on the split and then we need the token, so it wouldn't be in the zero position, it's in the one position after that. And now we can verify the token with jwt.verify, and here we'll pass in the token first. After the token, we'll pull back in our secret, and this will be the access token secret because that's what we'll verify with this middleware. And after the access token secret, there will be a callback that gets an error. And then we'll call this, you could call it token if you want, we'll call it decoded because it will have decoded information from the JWT. And now we'll say if we have an error, let's go ahead and return and send a status once again. This status will be 403 forbidden because at this point we'll know we received a token but something about it wasn't right. In other words, it may have been tampered with. And so this means we have a invalid token. So we'll send a 403 instead of a 401, which means you are forbidden from accessing this. And then we'll set the user equal to decoded.username. Remember we passed in the username to the JWT. So now it's been decoded and we can read that. And then we'll call next from our middleware. And that pretty much wraps up that whole middleware function right there, except we need to remember to export it. So we'll say module.exports, set that equal to verify JWT and save. With the middleware now complete, we can add it to a route or routes that we want to protect. So let's open up routes and API and go to our employees JS file that has all of the employee routes in it. And we need to import that middleware here. So we'll say const verify JWT equals require. And now we need to go up out of the API folder up out of the next folder, the routes folder, and then go to middleware and then choose verify JWT. And once we have that, we can just put it, let's say in our Git route, if we only wanted it in the Git route before we call the controller. And so it will go through the middleware first and then go to the employees controller here. So let's save this. And now let's test this with ThunderClient. So over here to the left, I'll open up ThunderClient and we're going to need to log in first. So I'll go to our collections and I have an auth collection that I created and I want to go to the auth route. I'll click this and now I'm going to click over here again to hide the tree so we can see better. And I'm also going to press control and backtick to open our terminal window. We haven't started the server yet, so that's something else we need. So we need to type npm run dev to go ahead and start our server. 
and it's running on port 3500. And so you can see the route we're going to go to is a post route. It's localhost 3500 slash auth that we had previously set up to log in with the password. So in the body, we're sending walt1 and password and the password that we had in there previously. And this is in the user's file that I have. If you haven't done this, you need to go ahead and either create this in the file or use the register route that we previously created and create a new user and then this will work. But we're right now, we're going to log in with user walt1 and this password using this route. So I'll go ahead and send and you can see over here on the right, the response we get is a 200 and we get this access token. This access token will only be good for 30 seconds though. So let's see if I'm fast enough to come back here to our collections, open the employees API. And now let's look at this and I need to go ahead and in auth, I need to send a new access token. Now we can send and we got our employees back, but this will expire. And notice down here, we also got the console log statement I put in. Here's bearer, and then the space, and then the token. So now if I send this again, the token should have expired. And now we get the 403 forbidden, because the access token that we sent was only good for 30 seconds. Now let's look at the employees.js file again, and I will go ahead and click the file tree so we can see our files also we're only applying this verify JWT middleware to the Git route right now. And this is a good way to do this if you have select routes that you want to protect or verify, but not all of them. However, if you know you want to protect all of the routes in your API, there's an easier way to do this. So let's go ahead and remove this and we'll pull this out of here as well. And I don't think, we'll just retype it in the server file because that's where we're headed next. So we've removed the verify JWT from the employees JS file altogether. Let's go to server JS, our main file. And here we can just pull this middleware in. So I'm going to do it right underneath the error handler that we had middleware for. So we'll say verify JWT, set this equal to require. And here we want to go into, we don't need to go up at all, actually. We just want to go into dot slash middleware slash verify JWT. And now that we have that, we can use this just like we've used other middleware in our file. But we probably don't want to use this verify JWT middleware for all the routes, probably not the root route that we have here. Definitely not to register a new user or we'd never be able to register in the first place and not even to auth because they have to visit auth first to get the token, but we do wanna put it before the employees route. So I'll put an extra line there. And then right here, we'll say use verify JWT. And if you remember, this works like a waterfall. So in this order, everything after this line will use the verify JWT middleware. So any route we do not want to have verified with a JWT, we need to have above this line right here. So let's go ahead and save this once again. And now we can go back and let's log in again and get another, well, we close up the API there. There we go. Here's our auth line. Let's log in and get another 30 second access token. Here we are. Okay, now, Let's go back to the employees. And once again, we can just use the Git route before it was forbidden because it had expired. But now let's go to the auth tab here in Thunder Client, select all, delete that, paste in the new token and submit. And we've got our employees list once again. But if I continue to submit, it will expire as soon as the 30 seconds is up. And there is our 403. And just to show that this is on all routes now, let's go back to our employees API to the post route for posting an employee. Here in the body, we've got John Doe. So that looks like we could go ahead and post to the employees for John Doe. Let's see if we can send this and we get unauthorized. So our verify 
JWT middleware is working on all routes. Okay, let's go back to the file tree. We can close the terminal once again. We can close out of Thunder Client for now. And let's close up the middleware. What we do want is to go back to the controllers and we're going to create a new controller here called refresh token controller.js because we're going to have a refresh token route. And before we get started on our refresh token controller, because we're going to need it, let's go back to the server JS quickly. And at the top of the server JS, we pulled in the verified JWT. We also need to go ahead and define cookie parser, the other package that we had required at the beginning of the tutorial. And let's require cookie-parser, there we go. But we'll define it with cookie parser, capital P, camel case right here. So I can go ahead and copy that. Now, much like where we used the express.json and express.url encoded that we use for form data, and of course, express.json is for JSON data, we just want to add middleware for cookies right here. So we'll say app.use, and now we'll pass in cookie parser, and we want to call that into action right there and save our server.js file. Now we're ready to go right back to that refresh token controller, and we'll begin by copying the auth controller. Control C, I'll just copy everything and paste it in, but we will make some modifications. So we need the user's DB. We will not need bcrypt because we are not doing user password authentication there. We do need JWT and .env but we won't need FS promises or the path in this either. So we can remove those dependencies. Now, instead of handle login, let's call this handle refresh token. And this does not need to be async. So we'll just have the request and response here. After that, we won't be looking for a password, but we will be looking for a cookie. So let's say const cookies and set this equal to request.cookies. And so we will have a similar if statement here at the beginning, but we'll be checking for a couple of things. One is to make sure that we have cookies. But now let's use optional chaining with a question mark and a dot, the optional chaining operator, and put JWT after it. So we're checking to see if we have cookies, and then if we do have the cookies, we're also checking to see if there is a JWT property. And this is saying, of course, if these do not exist, then we're going to return something here. And we're going to return a 401, and we do not need a JSON message after that, so I'll just eliminate that portion of it. And save this. It looks like I may need to go ahead and press Alt-Z to wrap any lines that exceed the edge of the screen. So there we've got a 401 if the cookies do not exist, and maybe we have cookies, but no JWT. Either way, that gets a 401, which is unauthorized. Now, let's go ahead after we've confirmed that at least, and let's log to the console cookies.jwt. So when we run this, you'll be able to see what values we get from that. And likewise, let's go ahead and define the refresh token now that we've received, now that we know it exists within the cookie, and we'll set that equal to cookies.jwt. And once again, we do want to find a user, but now we're receiving a refresh token and not a username or a password for this. So we'll say person, and there is a refresh token that should be saved with each user if they have created one. And so here we'll just match that to the refresh token that we have now defined here. So this would be our found user then if that user exists. And once again, we can say if we do not find a user, let's now send the status forbidden here. And I'll just highlight that. Okay, we're not evaluating a password here. We are evaluating a JWT though. So these lines will change as well. So we can get rid of the const match line. And instead, well, we can even get rid of the if match here as well. And instead of that, we'll type jwt.verify, and now we'll pass in the refresh token that was received, 
Now we'll say process.env dot refresh token secret. And then we'll have an anonymous function that once again has error and decoded, it's a callback function. And before I type the rest, I think I'm just going to get rid of this because it doesn't need to be there at this point either. So let's just go ahead and clear it out now. And with that cleared out, we can finish our function here for the token verification. And if we do not have a valid token, we can say if we have an error, or we can also check the found user dot username because we did have the username encoded in the token. So if it's not equal to the decoded dot username, in other words, maybe it was tampered with again, then we can return a response with a send status and say 403 once again. Otherwise, everything is good and we're ready to create a new access token to send because the refresh token has verified. So we'll set this access token equal to jwt.sign. And then inside of the access token, we'll once again have a username. And this username will be the decoded.username because it should be the same username that was verified before. And after that, we can say process.env dot access token secret if we can find that access token secret there we go and then we need to put an expires in once again so let's put expires in and let's set this to 30 seconds as well however remember you might want to set this longer in your production app this is just for the demonstration of this tutorial so i can show it expire and then of course after we've created this access token we need to go ahead and send the access token so we'll send this json down and it'll say access token and once we've created that much all we need to do is export it so now instead of handle login we once again have handle i believe it was refresh token yep And we should be able to save that. And I don't know why I put a semicolon there. It's not really needed. So once we have saved that, we should be good to go with our refresh token controller and we can create the refresh token route. Okay, in our routes file now, we can open that up and we can look at our auth route. I'll just highlight all and copy and we'll create a new route called refresh.js. I'll go ahead and paste that in, but instead of the auth controller, we need the refresh token controller. So I'll spell all of that out. And instead of handle login, we need handle refresh token. And before we're finished with our refresh route, let's change the HTTP method from post to get as well. So this is now a get route for refresh. Okay, now we need to insert this route into the server along with the other routes. So we'll go to the server.js file and you can see we've got root, register, auth. And of course we want this to also be before we verify the JWT because the refresh route actually issues a new access token. And that's what verified JWT verifies. So what we wanna do now is just copy a line down. I pressed Shift, Alt, and the down arrow in Windows to do that. And I'm going to change auth to refresh. And now the refresh endpoint will receive the cookie that has the refresh token. And then that will issue a new access token once the access token has expired. So we'll save this and we should be ready to try it out. So I need to open up the terminal window again and we can see our server is running on port 3500. Now let's open up Thunder Client and we're ready to check out the refresh route. But first we need to go to the auth route and here it looks like the auth path. I'll hide the tree over there. And so now we're going to localhost 3500 auth. We're once again going to authorize Walt here with his password. So let's send this and we got a new access token, but what we also get from our auth route is a cookie. 
And this cookie has our refresh token, and here's the JWT name for the cookie, and here's the refresh token. Now a cookie is sent every time. We don't need to paste it in in an auth area like we did with our access token. The JWT cookie is sent every time we make a request to the domain that it's associated with. So we'll go back over here to Thunder Client. We'll come down to our refresh route, and I'll hide that tree. Now we're going to localhost 3500 refresh, and you can see we don't need to post anything in the body. We don't need to post anything in the auth because we have the cookie that we're going to send. So let's send this cookie. And now we got a new access token, and you can see we also logged our information as we set it up in our path to log the uh, refresh token that we received from the cookie down here. So we've got a new access token and our refresh token is used to do that. So now every time we hit this refresh route and we send our cookie with the refresh token, we should get a new access token. And you can see every time we're getting a different access token over there. So that is what refreshes our access and that's why it's called a refresh token and so now we have a new limited time access token to use again in production you might want to set it to five minutes or 15 minutes instead of 30 seconds or something like that but then our refresh token has the longer duration that we store in an http only cookie and that's because we don't want it to be available via JavaScript, so it increases our security. Nothing's 100% perfect, but it's the best way to go, I believe, for that. So we're sending the HTTP-only cookie that has the refresh token, and that issues us the new access token. Now that we've finished testing the refresh route, one extra measure of security or one extra step we can take is to offer a logout route. And with the logout route, we could actually then delete the refresh token and not let it last for the full duration. And that just gives our users the opportunity to log out and of course delete any existing tokens. And of course the access token should also be erased on the front end when the login or log out link or button is clicked as well. Of course we're working on the back end so we won't be doing that today. But let's go ahead and add this new controller for the logout. So we'll have logout controller.js and now that we have that let's go ahead and copy our refresh token controller and we will just make some modifications to handle the logout because we need the same requirements at the top we've pulling in the users so we can check our database we've got the JWT requirement and we've also got env I'm going to close the terminal window and now I said we had the same requirements. We don't quite have the same requirements, I'm sorry. We don't need the JWT or the .env. What we do need is the FS promises that goes with accessing our database because we're just using a JSON file. So we'll require fs.promises. And we once again need path. So we'll require the path. And again, these are only to access the current JSON file we're using for our user's database. This is a mock database. This will be replaced, of course, with Mongo or Postgres or whichever database technology we work on in a tutorial in the future. So we've got this down for the requirements and let's move forward with the logout. So instead of handle refresh token now, we're going to handle the logout and we'll have a request and response. And then let's just add a note here for the front end, if you're doing full stack development, like on client, also delete the access token. We can't do that here on the back end. You need to do that in the memory of the client application. Just zero it out or set it to blank or whatever when that logout button is clicked. What we can do though, is take care of the refresh token. So here, once again, we need to get the cookies as they come in. Now let's erase our logs here we were doing for the cookies and the cookies JWT before, if you wanted to see those in the console. And we'll once again verify that we have got cookies and then that we also have a JWT in the cookies. And if we don't, well, that's okay, because we were just going to erase it anyway. So let's send a status 204. That means it's successful, and there's essentially 
no content to send back. That's what that status is. So you've had a successful request and we're not sending any content. And this needs to be send status instead of just status. There we go. Response.send status. We've got that. Now let's go ahead and define our refresh token. And we'll do that in the same way, setting it equal to cookies.jwt. Now let's see if we have that refresh token in the database. So that's what we're checking here is refresh token in DB. So once again, we try to find a user that has this token. So setting this equal to the refresh token, just as we did in the previous refresh token controller is exactly what we need. And if we don't have a found user at this point, we can go ahead and clear the cookie. So we're going to do something just a little different here and it won't be forbidden either. So we'll get rid of that. And let's go ahead and look at how we clear the cookie first. So if we don't have a found user, but we did have a cookie to get to this point, we can just go ahead and erase the cookie that was sent. And that's going to be with response.clearCookie. And then inside there, we'll look for the JWT cookie. And then you have to pass in the same options that it was set with. So once again, we'll say HTTP only, set that to true. And that should be all we need to do there, except for sending the proper status. So once again, we're going to return and send a status, not a 403, but of 204, which once again means this was successful, but no content. Okay, I'm going to scroll up just a little bit, and now we can pretty much erase everything here, and we're going to create some new content below. Because if we've reached this point, that means we did find the same refresh token in the database, so now we need to delete the refresh token in the database right here. And we're using a file system, of course, for that instead of Mongo or Postgres at this point, but we will change that in the future. Right now, let's define other users, which would be all of the other users that are not the user that we found, and set that equal to users db dot users dot filter, and we'll just filter this out. We'll pass in the person, and now the person dot refresh token is not equal to our found user dot refresh token as well. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to press Alt Z to wrap that line of code so we can see all of it. And that's all the other users. So now our current user is going to be equal to our found user. And then we're going to set the refresh token to blank. So we'll leave the refresh token property, but now we're just erasing it from the user. And now we can update our users DB with our set users. And we'll go ahead and pass in our other users. And then we'll pass in our found user. Oh, and I'm sorry, that's not found user. That should be the current user that we just defined. There we go. So found user was before we erased the fresh token. Now the current user has the updated refresh token that is zeroed out or blank, if you will. Now let's just write this to the file. So we'll await fs promises dot write file. And now on a separate line here, I'm going to say path dot join, pass in the directory name, after that, we'll need to come up one folder, and then we'll say in the model folder, and then we'll name the users.json file. Okay, then we need to go ahead and use json.stringify and write in the users db.users. And that should update our users file. And so after that, we need to go ahead and delete the cookie, which we saw how to do before as well. So we use clear cookie and we reference a JWT and we need to pass in the same options as well. HTTP only set to true. Now I will add in production, both when we send the cookie and when we delete the cookie, you also want to add the flag secure true. And that will make it only serve so it only serves on HTTPS, 
we're just using a dev server that uses HTTP, but you want a secure connection with HTTPS. So we don't add this in development, but we would in production, the option of secure and set that to true. Okay, and after that, we want to send our status again, which once again is a 204. All is well, but we have no content to send back. And after that, we need to change our export from handle refresh token to handle logout and save. Okay, with the controller complete, let's create our route file. And we can just go here to the refresh file we created, select all and copy. And now I'm going to create a new file in the routes called logout.js. And now I'll just paste everything in from the refresh route and we'll change that. So we need express, we need the router, but instead of refresh token controller, we'll select all three of those with control D and I'll just type logout. And this will be a git route again and the export to router is correct, but we do not have handle refresh token here. We also have handle logout as the function for the controller. And with that complete, now we can go to the server and add that route as well. We won't need to verify a JWT to log out, so I will just once again shift alt and the down arrow to copy a line down, and I'll change refresh to log out and save. Now let's open a terminal window again. Oh, and we've got an error. So let's see what our error is here in Node. Await is only valid in an async function. Ah, we did not do that in our controller. Let's go back to the logout controller. And we used await when we used fs promises. So let's make the handle logout an async function and save. And let's see if node restarts. And yes, the server is running on 3500. All looks good there. So now we can go to Thunder Client and we'll hit our auth route to make sure everything is logged in. We're going to log in our user Walt1, and we've got an access token, and we've got a cookie. So now let's go back to Thunder Client, and I have a logout route that is a git route as well. So we have git, localhost 3500, logout. You don't need to pass anything in the body or the auth when we log out, but let's go ahead and do that. And we hit log out and everything seems to be fine. We can see our cookie has now been erased. So now if we go to any of the other routes, like refresh that would use our refresh token cookie, we don't have a cookie to refresh with. So now let's try localhost 3500 refresh and it's a git route and see what we get. Well, we can see in the console, we logged or attempted to log a cookie, but it didn't exist here and we're not getting a response. So let's look at that. I can cancel this here in Thunder Client. Let's go ahead and look at our refresh controller and see what's going on there. So refresh token controller, and here is where we're logging the cookies. We can get rid of these lines actually now, so we don't need those. But let's see if we can figure out what is going on. And yes, here's the error. I said response.status401. It needs to be response.sendStatus401, just like we had down here with sendStatus403. So if I've typoed any of those others throughout this code, it looks like I had send status everywhere else. But just in case you see that, to actually send the status, it needs to be send status instead of just status. Status is chainable if we're sending a response after that. But now this should work. So let's once again go back to Thunder Client and we'll hit our refresh token route, although we don't have a cookie, and we'll see what happens. Ah, we immediately got our 401 unauthorized because now it sends the status. So that's correct. Let's go back and log in again with our auth route, localhost 3500 auth, send that. We have an access token, we have a cookie, and everything seems good. So all routes are working as expected. Okay, I thought I was at the end of the tutorial, but after playing around with some front end code, there were a few things I thought I needed to go ahead and clear up or include. One is here, this is front end code, by the way, this is not what we were working on in Express. If you use fetch to access 
what we had set up, say our auth route, well, you're going to need to include a credentials option, again, on the front end to have fetch send the cookie. Now, if you use Axios, I believe there is a with credentials flag that needs to be set as well. And we could do that in a future tutorial. But right now, just looking at credentials for use with fetch. So you have to set that to include, but that sets off a chain of events. So even though this is required here to send the cookie, then what happens is I'll pull up Chrome here. We get a cores error and you will be blocked by cores because the value of access control allow credentials in the header of the response is blank and it needs to be set to true. So cores will block this if you don't have that set before you reach the cores check. Now what is happening is a pre-flight options check. It's an options HTTP method request, but then you also need to have this same access control allow credentials set to true when you do send the cookie back as well, because that's what's expected with fetch. So there's a way to fix that, of course. And now let's look at some of our backend code. And let's start in the config folder. And I went to cores options first. And we did have what was called a whitelist in here, which eh, that's traditionally what it's called. And I've seen that in articles as well. I don't like the name so much either. Uh, just maybe in modern day, it sounds a little racist or something. So we've switched that to allowed origins, which is what it is. It's a list of allowed origins. And I put it in its own file because we're going to use it in middleware also, but I only want to update it in one place. So we have our allowed origins, formerly called the whitelist in the tutorial, and we're exporting allowed origins. So we import that into our cores options and use it here. But then we also create middleware called credentials. And now this credentials middleware, of course, has a request response and next and we import allowed origins here also. All we're really doing is to say if the uh, origin that is sending the request is in our allowed origins list, so it's just a little bit of extra security, if that is the case, go ahead and set this header on the response because that's what cores is looking for, access, control, allow credentials, and we set that to true. So now that we have the middleware created, we go to the server file and we pull that middleware in, and then you want to use the middleware. We're using credentials right here, and of course I'm importing it right up here above. You want to use that before cores, because if cores sees that that response header is not set, it throws that error. So that will fix that issue. And I would hope that would be the end of the issues, but no, there was one other issue. And let's take a look at what that was. I'm going to open Chrome again, and I had to do a screen capture. Now, I was in the Dev Tools in the Network tab, and I was looking at the Auth Request. And then I could pull up the cookie, and then there was this little triangle. And the reason I had to do this screen capture is because I had to mouse over the triangle for this message to pop up. And it's very small print. I'm zoomed in quite a bit already just to see this. And it said the set cookie header didn't specify a same site attribute. So that defaulted to same site equals lax. And then it was blocked because it came from a cross site response, which means our front end application was not on the same domain as our back end API. And that's often the case. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that's why they blocked it. it says the set cookie had to have been set with same site equals none to enable cross site usage. So that tells us something else, another option we need to go and put in our set cookie response. So let's look back at the back end code here. And then where did we set the cookies? Well, let's look at the controllers. That's where the cookies were being set. And I believe the auth controller is what sets the cookie specifically. And so not only do we have HTTP only true, but then we went ahead and set same site 
to none as they request here. And then after you do that, they give you another message in the same spot. And that says secure must be set to true. Now previously, I didn't have secure set to true there because I thought you could only use it with HTTPS even during development. But no, it's working in the dev server even though we're just using HTTP. Then after that, I went ahead, I've got the code wrapping by the way, because down here on the next line, you still have the max age option. Now when you delete a cookie, you need to set the same options. However, and I'll put a link to the documentation in the description below, however, max age actually does not need to be set or in there when you delete the cookie. It's one of only a couple, like the expiration and max age are the only two options that don't need to be identical when you delete the cookie. So when we go to the logout controller and we have our res.clearcookie, we need to have HTTP only, same site, and secure all set as before, but max age does not need to be in here. And we've got that in here a couple of times in the logout controller as well. So we did make those changes, but after you do that, everything should work as intended. So it's just a couple of things I discovered as I was working with this front end code. And of course, it is good to test it out with actual code and a browser besides using an extension like ThunderClient because ThunderClient showed everything was working as we expected it to. But of course, we ran into a few issues with Chrome. And now I've walked you through how to fix those as well. Since creating the last tutorial, I realized there's a lot of confusion concerning the concepts of authentication and authorization. They're often used interchangeably or simply abbreviated as auth, but they are not the same things. Authentication refers to the process of verifying who someone is. Authorization is the process of verifying what specific resources a user has access to. When we log in with a username and password, we are verifying who we are, and that is considered to be authentication. After logging in, our Express API issues users JWT tokens. JWT stands for JSON Web Tokens. While it's true that the tokens confirm the authentication process has already taken place, these tokens also allow access to our API endpoints, which provide our API data. This is authorization. A hint towards this fact is that a JWT token uses the authorization header. Today, we will expand the authorization process by adding user roles with specific permissions to our API authorization process. We're going to start with the code repository from the last tutorial, but if you don't have it, you should be able to easily follow along without it, or you can download or clone the starter source code from the link I've provided in the description below. We're going to start by going to the config folder in the file tree and creating a new file, and we'll call this file roles underscore list dot js. In the roles list, we're going to create the user roles. Now this could be in a data table in a database. This is just how we're going to do this. And you'll find that user permissions can be constructed in an assortment of ways. And we're going to apply a fairly simple structure today with three different user roles. So we'll start out with our roles list constant, and we're going to set this equal to an object. And the keys will actually be the names of the roles. So we'll have admin, and then we'll have a code that identifies the role. And then after that, let's create an editor role, and we'll call this 1984. And then let's have just a user role, and we'll give that 2001. Okay, now that we've created our roles list object, all we need to do here is module.exports and set that equal to roles underscore list. Okay, we've saved that. Now we're ready to go ahead and modify our users model that we have in the users.json file. And you might find that once it has been written by the read and write file process that we use in Node, we're using this user.json's file, it might all be in one line. But I believe if we go ahead and just 
put a return and edit and then save in Visual Studio Code, it should go ahead and format that file for you. So it's a little easier to read. Now this is what we had after the last tutorial. We have a username Walt1 and a username Walt2. They all have their own passwords. And of course we're tracking the refresh tokens. I'm going to copy in the file I've created. It adds one more user. And so you can copy this file out of the completed source code that I'm going to link to. There's a starter source code link and then a completed source code link. Or you can go ahead and use the register route, create your own new user, and you can see I've added Dave1 as well as our Walt1 and Walt2. Dave1 just has the role of user, while Walt2 has the roles of user and editor, and Walt1 is not only a user, but also an editor and admin. So you can see we're going to support multiple roles. I'll go ahead and save this file. Once again, you can copy it from the completed source code or just create your own third user if you want to. And we'll just edit these manually. Now there could be a admin area for whatever service you were creating. And that is where these additional roles could be created. But what we will do is just ensure when everyone registers, they're given the user role. And then of course, later on, you'd think an admin that was in charge could add the additional roles if those roles were to be granted to other users. So now we can collapse the model folder and the config folder, but let's look inside the controller folder and let's look at that register controller that we have. What we want to do is add that role of user with the 2001 code when any user registers. You can see we're creating our new user right here on line 19 and we have the username and the hashed password. So let's just go ahead and add this extra role. I'll break this out on separate lines and that way we can see the new part that we add. And what we want to do is just in between username and password, add roles, let's keep that lower case. And after that, let's put this in an object. So then we have user, and then we have the code 2001. And then remember to put a comma after roles, so it goes before the password, and save. Now let's go to the auth controller. And when we authorize and create the access token, we will want to send this information in the access token. So we're going to change our payload for the JWTs. Now first, when we know we have a match and we have verified our user, so everything is good, we want to go ahead and grab the roles that we put in our user's JSON file. So let's go ahead and define roles and set this equal to object.values and then we can pass in the found user that we have above and we want found user dot roles. And so now we'll get those values inside of roles. And now let's change our access token payload just a little bit. Since we're not just going to send the user name, let's create a new namespace here with user info. And then this will be an object and inside this object will have username. Let me go ahead and add the closing curly brace for the object here. So we'll have the username, but then, oh, we don't need that closing curly brace, but then we also want to add some more information here inside of the user info object. And the next one will be roles with quote, and we'll just pass the roles that we've created. It looks like I actually did need that extra curly brace, or at least we need to indent here. And then we're going to need to close out our payload. That looks correct, I believe. And if you want to break this onto another line, you can do that as well. We'll go ahead and save, and there we go. It gets formatted a little bit better already. So we're using this user info as a different namespace, and that's good because this is considered to be a private JWT claim because there are some res reserved abbreviations and words for public JWT claims. And you can find out more about that at 
jwt.io, I believe. I'll confirm that and leave a link in the description below so you can check out more information on the JWT claims if you're interested. Now there is no reason to send the roles in the refresh token and ideally the access token will only be stored in memory on the front end, but we don't have control over that. So when we do send the roles, we're just sending the codes and not actually the word admin or editor or anything like that. So we just are kind of hiding what each one is by using codes. But at the same time, ideally that access token would only be stored in memory anyway. But there is no need whatsoever to send the roles in the refresh token. The refresh token is only there to verify that you can get a new access token. Okay, now speaking of the refresh token, we need to go to the refresh token controller and add some of the same code because that refresh token does issue a new access token. So right underneath where we have verified the, or we've actually decoded the refresh token here and we have the decoded and now we have no error and everything is good. So we wanna come down to this line right before we create the token. And here once again, let's define roles and set it equal to object.values and we'll pass in our found user once again and the roles that are associated with that user. And now we can use the name, new namespace as well. So we'll use user info again, and then we'll create an object. And inside this object, we'll have the username, which is the decoded username, but then we'll also wanna put the roles once again. So now we'll have roles, and here we can just pass in roles once again. I need a comma, it looks like. And now let's save and it will format a little bit better. And that looks correct. So we have user info with username and roles. Now that we've updated our tokens to include the roles, our access token specifically, we're ready to go to middleware because we're going to have to create some new middleware to verify those roles. But first let's look at the verify JWT file that we already have. I'd like to make a couple of quick updates. One is when we define the auth header. This works and especially when we have control of the front end as well and we know we would define authorization with a lowercase a. However, it can also come in with an uppercase. So instead of this, let's go ahead and just say dot authorization, which is essentially the same thing that we had, but then we can also say or, and then we could have request dot headers dot authorization with a capital A as well, just in case it comes in with a capital. Now we know we're going to grab it either way. After that, Let's go ahead and change our if auth header as well. And let's look for an optional chaining method here. So we say if we have, or if, if we do not have the auth header actually are saying, and also starts with, and here we wanna have bearer. And this is, supposed to be a capital B by the standard. So we don't really have to look for lowercase and uppercase like we were here. So we're verifying that, first of all, if we do have an auth header or if it starts with this. And we're actually looking to say if we don't have an auth header and then this optional chaining says, okay, well, even if we do have an auth header, if it doesn't start with bearer with a capital B and then the space after bearer, then we're going to return a 401 because it is not a correctly formed authorization header that starts with bearer and then the token as it's supposed to. It looks like we left in a console log from the last tutorial. Let's go ahead and take that out where we were just viewing the bearer token in the console. And now after we decode this token, when we're verifying the JWT, we also want to set the roles here, not just the user on the request. So let's have request.roles, and we'll set this equal to decoded, and now we've got a different namespace. So it's dot user info dot roles. And we need to make the same change up here when we get the username, because now it's decoded dot user info dot username. 
And now we've got the correct namespace for both and we can save our verified JWT middleware. And now it's time to create our new middleware. I'm going to collapse the open editors so we have a little more room. And in this same middleware folder, let's create a new file and let's call this verifyroles.js. Inside of verify roles, we're going to create middleware named verify roles. And it's going to accept a lot of parameters if we want it to. It's however many roles we want to pass in. And the way we do that is with the rest operator. It looks just like the spread operator, but it lets us pass in as many parameters as we wish. And we're just going to call them allowed roles. Now from there, we need to go ahead and have a middleware function. And you know that takes a request, response, and next. So what we need to do, and this allows us to pass in the allowed roles by having this on the outside, but we need to return a middleware function, essentially an anonymous function here with request, response, and next. And now inside of this function, we'll have everything that our middleware would do. So the first thing we need to do is say if we do not have a request, which we should because our verified JWT will come before this, but let's go ahead and do that just to be thorough. And then let's use optional chaining to say, okay, even if we do have a request, it needs to have roles or this should not be valid. And if it's not valid, we're just going to return a response and send the status 401, which is unauthorized. Now we need to define a roles array. Let's keep that lowercase, camel case actually, roles array, and set this equal to the allowed roles that were passed in. Now we're spreading those into a new array here. Now that we have this, let's go ahead and log this to the console. These will be the different roles that we're passing in. And of course, there will be the codes associated with the roles. But let's go ahead and log roles array. So when we go ahead and test this, we can see everything that we expect to. And we'll be comparing this to the request.roles that we just set inside of the verified JWT that will be executed as middleware before the verifies roles middleware. Okay, so we'll log both of those just so we can see what's going on. But now we know we have an array of user roles that are coming from the JWT, and then we have the roles that are passed in that will be allowed, and that's what we're going to compare. So we're comparing arrays, and I'm going to define just a result here. And let's set this equal to request.roles.map, which map creates a new array. And we'll have a role, and for each role, essentially, we'll compare to the roles array, and we'll see if the roles array includes the role that we're passing in. And if it does, it will return true. That's what includes does. And if not, it will return false, it's a Boolean. So we'll have a new array and we'll have a true or false for everything that was in the request role. So if we had three different roles here, we'll have possibly true, 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 or true, false, true. Who knows for sure, but that's what we'll have. So we need to filter this array. And all we need is one true to know that the role can access the route that we're uh, verifying. So what we want to do then is chain find, and we can just say for each value, the true and false in the new array that was mapped, each value, we'll check the value to see if it's equal to true. And if it is, it will return. If it finds a match, it will return the very first one it finds. Or if it finds no matches, then we won't have a result. And so that's how this works. I'm using two higher order functions here essentially. So we're mapping over the roles that are sent from the JWT and they're assigned in the verified JWT to request roles. And we're mapping those, comparing them, and getting true and false results back to the roles array that will be passed into this route. 
So we'll pass in uh, however many rolls we want to. This array could possibly only have one roll, or it might have three or four, or however many we're checking for or want to allow to this route. So once we compare those and get all the true false results, we're just using find to say, hey, find the first true. And if there is any trues, it will be good. And if there's not, it won't. And that's what we'll do next. So we'll just say if there's no result, essentially we did not find a true result, we're going to return and then we'll say res send status. And again, we'll send a 401 unauthorized. Otherwise, we'll just call next because everything's good and we're ready to move on and we're going to let the route be accessed. So let's save our middleware and we'll know when it runs, we'll see the arrays that we're comparing in the console. And before I forget, we also need to add module.exports and set that equal to verify roles and save. Now let's collapse the middleware folder and open up the routes folder and then the API folder, and let's go to our employees.js that has the different routes, get, post, put, and delete. We have a couple of imports to make here, so let's go ahead and define our roles list and set this equal to require. And now we need to go up and up again, and then we'll look in the config folder, and then we'll find our roles list. And after that, we need to go ahead and define our verify roles middleware. Set this equal to up a folder, up another folder, middleware. And now we're going to verify roles. And I'll save just because I've completed the imports. But now we need to add this to the different routes. Now let's just leave the git route open because any one could access that. Or if we wanted to put verify roles and at least verify their user, but they already have to have the JWT because we required that ahead of time. So they'll have to have the JWT to access the Git route. So kind of the user is the default. But after that, in the post route, let's put in verify roles. And now we can pass in the different roles list values that we want to let access this route. So we'll type roles underscore list and now dot admin will work. Remember, this is the key and then the code is the value. So admin is the key. And then we could also put in roles underscore list dot editor. And that makes sense because you could have an editor that could post a new value as well. Okay, then I'm going to copy the uh, verify roles that we just added here. And it's like maybe I'll put a space here. And then in put, I'll do the same thing and add the space. But now in delete, let's say only an admin can delete anything from our database. So we'll save that, which gives it just a little bit of a change. So now everyone can access the get route, but the post route should be limited to any user that's an admin or an editor. The same for the put route, but then the delete route could only be used by an admin. I think we're ready to test this out now. So let's go ahead and open a new terminal window. You can do that from the terminal menu or I'll just use control and backtick. I'm on Windows and I'll type npn run dev to get our dev server up and running with our API. And then we'll test this out with Thunder Client. Okay, I'm going to drag the terminal window up just a little, give it some more room so we can see the console log notices that we get. And from there, I'm going to click on Thunder Client here on the left. If you don't have Thunder Client installed, you can get it through the extension over here and then just search for Thunder Client. And there you see it. And now that you have it, or once you have it, you'll be able to click on it over here on the left, circle with the lightning bolt, and you can create collections. And of course, we've done this in some previous tutorials if you have followed along in the series. 
I've got an auth collection here and the very first thing we'll need to do is authenticate a user. Let's look at which user we're going to authenticate first. Let's just do Dave1. Remember, this user only has the user permissions. It does not have an editor or an admin permission. So I'll send and I get the access token. I'll copy this access token and now when I go to the employees API and go to get employees, I'll go to auth here, paste in the new access token and send and everything is good. But if I do this for post, if I'm in time within the 30 seconds it was given and send, I got a 401 unauthorized. So that means our verify roles is working. As we look down here, we've got the two different arrays logged to the console too. So this is the array that has the roles that we were looking for, that we passed in. 5150 is the admin, 1984 is the editor. But you can see our user only had role 2001, which is just a user. Okay, now let's go back to my auth collection here and the auth route, and let's change who we're getting a token for. So now this will be Walt2. He is an editor and also a user, but he is not an admin. So we can send this, we get a new token. I'll copy the token. And now we can go back to the employees API and we can post a new employee, or we should be able to. We'll put in the new token here and send. And yes, we posted John Doe, so he's now number three, has the ID of three in the employees list. But if we go to the delete route and go to auth, I'll post in the same token and attempt to delete. And, oh, we're out of time. We got forbidden. So let me go ahead and try to re-verify here. We once again got Walt2. We get a new token. Get that new token once again. I didn't copy it right the first time. There we go. Back to employees. Now we'll attempt to delete. I'll pass in the auth token and send. And we got a 401 unauthorized. And that is because the role did not verify. Now you can see you had to have the 5150 code, which is admin, that was passed into the route. But Walt2 only had the 2001 and the 1984 code in his roles list. Okay, once again, let's go back to the auth route now. And we will change to where we are authorizing Walt1. One. Walt1 one should be an admin as well as a user and an editor. And so we'll send that, get a new token. And now we can go back to our employees delete route that was just denied to Walt2. Paste in this new token and attempt to send the delete request. And employee ID 3 is not found. That's because Nodemon restarted, I believe, and of course employee ID 3 isn't in there. So let me go ahead and request another token and we'll see if we can create ID 3 again quickly and then delete it on the same. So here's our new token for our admin user. Copy that, go to the employee's post route, paste in the auth and created. Now let's go to delete paste in the new auth, and we deleted with an OK. So I just had to be quick enough to beat the 30 seconds with that token. But here you can see the user, our Walt1 user, had 2001, 1984, and 5150 in his roles, and the API route needed the 5150. So when it matched, everything was good. Hey, just a quick note on testing with Thunder Client, and I want to point this out in the controllers, and then under the auth controller. But when you're testing with Thunder Client, it honors the cookie setting for secure true or not. So if we were to set a cookie and then use the refresh token here, you would need to remove this or the cookie would not work with Thunder Client. However, this is required, as I noted in a previous tutorial, 
when working with Chrome. So just a note, if you're testing the refresh endpoint with the refresh cookie, you'll have to comment this part out or at least take it out for testing purposes with Thunder Client. But then when you work with Chrome and in production, you'll both want that secure true back in here when you create that refresh token that is saved in a cookie. We did not use that today and the refresh token does not store any information about the user roles and it shouldn't. However, just wanted to note that for you in case you were testing out that refresh token with Thunder Client. So there you have it. We created our Verify Roles middleware and you can see both of those that we've been logging to the console. I'll go ahead and delete those now before I commit it to GitHub and get the console logs out of there. But there's our Verify Roles middleware and you of course saw how we applied it to the routes in our API for our employees. And you can just pass in the different roles that you want to let access that given route. MongoDB is the M in the MERN stack. It represents the database in the stack. The front end application of the MERN stack is handled by React. Along with Node.js and Express, MongoDB completes the back end REST API. Traditional SQL databases are built in a relational structure. Related tables reference each other with joins as data is queried. These relational tables also normalize the data. That means data is not duplicated in the tables. That's the dry principle, which stands for don't repeat yourself. And that's applied to the structure. However, with NoSQL databases like MongoDB, you can throw all of that out. MongoDB stores data in collections. The individual records in the collections are called documents. The documents have a key value structure and look a lot like JSON. A collection holds all of the data about a user, for example, instead of breaking it into related tables. And likewise, duplicating and distributing the data where deemed necessary in a NoSQL structure is permitted. So why choose NoSQL databases? And what are the advantages of using MongoDB? Performance is key. The speed at which a collection is queried is very fast. Flexibility. It's very easy to make structural changes like adding a new field without wreaking havoc in your total structure. It is much like adding a new property to an object. Scalability. NoSQL can support large databases with high request rates at a very low latency. And finally, usability. As you'll see today, we can get up and running with MongoDB in the cloud very fast. Let's get started by going to mongodb.com. Okay, we're at mongodb.com, and I already have an account, so I'm going to choose sign in. If you don't have an account, you'll want to sign up for a free account, so you can just click try free. I'm going to click sign in, and then it will take me to a page that probably uses my Google ID or allows me to log in with an email address. Yes, there it is, so you get those options. I'm going to log in with my Google email address or my Google account, and then we'll meet back up after you have your account or you've signed into your account. Okay, I'm signed into my account and I'm on the projects page where I can create a new project. And you see, I already have one project here. Now, if you're not on this page, once you're signed in, just click the little leaf in the top left and it says view the organization home because that's where this is. So once you're there, you'll want to create a new project. And now you want to name the project. I'm just going to name this one Mongo Tuts, short for tutorial, and click Next. And then it asks you to go ahead and set permissions or members. And it'll probably assign that to your default account to start out with. As you can see, I have project owner right here. So I'm going to click Create Project. With the project created, you can see I now have Mongo Tuts up here above database deployments. We need to build a database. And of course it gives you the big shiny button right in the middle to do so. So please click that. And then it gives you choices. And we're just going to go with free today. If you want to get one that you pay for, that's fine. I'm going to choose free over here on the right. And then it will say create a shared cluster. And right now I'm just going to keep all the defaults. So free, shared, it has AWS, it has one of the USA regions for me because I'm in the US. You may want to pick a different one if you're not and maybe it already defaults to something close to you. 
and then it just has these other default settings. And I'm going to go with all of that, even the default name here, cluster zero, and click create cluster at the bottom. Now it says new clusters take between one to three minutes to provision. So I'll come back when this is finished. My cluster zero has now been created and we're given this screen. So what we wanna do is click browse collections. We don't have any collections yet, so we get this and it says load a sample data set or add my own data. We're going to choose add my own data. With that, it asks for a database name and a collection name. So let's just call this company DB. And then we can call the collection name, let's go with employees. And I'll just keep that all lowercase. Company DB is capital company and capital DB at the end. And I'll click create. And with that, Mongo has created our company DB database and our empty employees collection right here. What we should do now is concern ourselves with database access. So let's create a user that can access this new collection and database that we have. So create a database user. We click the big button that says add new database user. And then it gives us password, certificate, and all of that. We'll just stick with password. And it put in some old information for me. Let's put in something different here. Let me go with uh, Mongo tut once again and then for a password I'm just going to and we'll go ahead and show whatever the password is I'll go with testing one two three kind of like a mic check okay so we've got mongo tut testing one two three I think we'll keep all of the default options here and we want the read and write to any database and of course I'll come back later and uh, delete this user but for now We'll use it for the tutorial and we'll click add user. And once we have the user, we need to go back to our cluster. So let's click Mongo Tuts. And that takes us back to our cluster. And it says we are deploying your changes, current action configuring MongoDB. So I'll give this just a second and then we're going to click connect. With the configuration now complete, let's go ahead and click the connect button it tells us we need to set up some security. This part is required. And what we're going to do is allow access from anywhere. We don't really know where we're going to host our back end yet. So this is good for development right now until we actually know what IP address we had. So let's just add in the zeros. And that means it's good from anywhere. We already created a user. So now let's click choose a connection method and we're going to connect our application. This gives us a connection string, and this is what we want. Notice it's already put in the Mongo Tut user I created. Now I'm going to have to put in the password, including getting rid of the less than and greater than around the password. And then also I need to replace my first database with the company DB, which was the name we gave the database. So I'm going to copy this and we're ready to close out of this now and open up Visual Studio Code. We're going to start with the code repository from the last tutorial in the Node.js and Express and now MongoDB series. But if you don't have it, you should be able to easily follow along without it, or you can download or clone the starter source code from the link that I'm providing in the description below. So let's get started by going to our .env file. And inside the .env file, it looks like I need to go to the end of the line and hit return so we have another line. I'm going to create a database underscore URI and set it equal to our connection string. But now we just need to replace a few things in the connection string. And I'm going to press Alt-Z here. I'm using Windows and it will wrap the code in Visual Studio Code it may be different for you on Mac or Linux if you have those. Okay, so we're replacing the password. And if you remember, I put in testing, lowercase, one, two, three. And then instead of my first database, we named the database company DB. And now we can save this file because we're using the process.env to pull this value out when we need it to connect. And speaking of .env, we actually put it in about three different files before, and really we could have just put it at the beginning of the project. It's not like when we require other 
uh, things like the JWT here that need to go in individual files as they're needed, this can just go at the beginning of the server.js. So I'm gonna pull it out of our middleware verify JWT.js file and save that. And I believe it's in a couple of controllers that we can uh, remove it from as well. But in the server.js file, I'm going to put it at the very top. You just want it in there as soon as you can get it. And we'll save it. And now I believe, let's check these controllers real quick. Is it in the auth controller? Yes, it is. We can remove that. And it's in one other controller, if I remember right. Not the logout controller. Let's see if it's the refresh controller. There it is. And we can remove it from that as well. And I think that will take care of it. So let's close out of the controllers. I didn't save the auth controller. Need to do that too. Okay, close out of those, and we're going to do some work here in the server. Well, really, before we do anything in the server, we need to go to package JSON because we're going to install Mongoose. And I'm going to press Control and the back tick. You can also go to the terminal window or menu to open a new terminal window. And here, we need to install the Mongoose package. So it's npm i mongoose and return. Now Mongoose JS is a library that makes working with Mongo much easier. Kind of like you could consider React makes working with JavaScript easier than vanilla JavaScript. It's just a helpful library. So let's take a look at their page real quick. It's mongoose, there we go, js.com. We bring up that page and you can see it says an elegant MongoDB object modeling for Node.js. Perfect, exactly what we need. And it has some great documentation as well. So we can refer to this as we go. Today we'll be working with a connection. Let's go back to VS Code and see if our uh, package installed. It looks like it has, so let's check our dependencies. And we see Mongoose listed right here on line 20. So we are ready to begin working with Mongoose. So now let's go to the server.js file. And underneath credentials, let's go ahead and require Mongoose. So we define const Mongoose and set it equal to require. And then we just bring in Mongoose and save. Now after that, we need to go ahead and create a connection configuration. So as you might guess, we're going to do that in our config folder that we have up here. So I'll highlight that and click create new file. And I'm going to call this lowercase db and then uppercase con. So it's camel case really, dbcon.js. Now let's start this file by requiring mongoose as well. So we'll once again bring in mongoose and require mongoose. And now we need to create a function that we're going to export and let's call it connect db and set this equal to an async function. Mongoose is async. Let's go try and after try we'll have our catch with an error block here and we'll just console.error and pass in the error. And then up above, we need to go ahead and try to connect to Mongoose. So how we'll do that is await. We've already got async above. And then we use Mongoose and we choose connect. And from there, we need to bring in that DB URI that we defined back in our .env. So we can just refer to process.env.database underscore URI. And then there is an object. And what we need to do is pass in a couple of options that will just prevent warnings that we would get from MongoDB otherwise. One is use unified, if I spelled that right, topology, and we set that to true. And the other one is use new URL parser, and we'll set that to true as well. And then we should be pretty much finished, except we once again need to do module.exports, as we have many times before for functions we've created and exported. And it is connect db, and we can save the file. With our function created, let's go back to server.js now, and we need to import that. So say const connect db is going to equal require 
and then we need to go into config and from there we need to pull in dbcon and save. And now let's go ahead and connect to the DB the very first thing. If it fails, we don't want to listen for any other connections anyway. So this is connect to MongoDB and all we do is call connect DB right here and it's ready to connect. However, there is one issue to address here. So let's scroll all the way down to where our app listens for requests. Now we don't want to listen for requests if we don't connect. And so if our connection fails for whatever reason, we need to avoid doing this. And we can do that. Let's go back to the documentation for Mongoose and where we had connections here in the documentation, we also have connection events. And let's look, we can listen for the connected event and there's also the open event, which is equivalent to connected. So let's go back to our code and use that. And we can do that with Mongoose, which is why we required it for this file in particular. And we'll have mongoose dot connection. And then we want once instead of on, because we'll just listen for this event one time and we'll listen for the open event. It's a little shorter to type than connected. And now we'll have an anonymous function. And inside this, we can console log first. And inside there, we'll just say connected to MongoDB. And after we've connected to MongoDB, let's just go ahead and cut and paste in our app listen. And we'll put it right there. And now we're only going to listen for requests if we have successfully connected because that is when the open event will be emitted by the connection. And so then our console will let us know we've connected to MongoDB and we're listening for requests on whatever port. And of course here in development, we are defaulting to port 3500 as set at the top. Okay, all of that said, I've left the terminal window open. Let's go ahead and type npm run dev and I'll drag it up so we have a little more room and let's see if we connect. And we're connected to MongoDB and the server is running on port 3500. Okay, in the next tutorial, we'll create schemas and data models with Mongoose and relate that back to our MongoDB collections. In the previous tutorial, we went over what MongoDB is and we used the Mongoose JS library to connect our app to MongoDB. Today, we're going to create Mongoose schemas and data models that will allow us to perform CRUD operations on our MongoDB data collections. We're going to start with the code repository from the last tutorial, but if you don't have it, you can download or clone the starter source code from the link I've provided in the description below. Let's get started today at mongoosejs.com. And from there, we're going to click read the docs and it instantly takes us to the schemas in the docs. And that is because as you see on the page, I'll highlight it, it says everything in Mongoose starts with a schema. Each schema maps to a MongoDB collection and defines the shape of the documents within that collection. So you can see why they're very important. And here you see an example schema. They have a blog schema and they're declaring data types for the different fields inside of the documents that will be created with the data model. And they also have some options here, such as date. They're not just saying it's a string for the body. They're also saying it's going to be a date. They can have default data and there's other options available as well. And if we scroll down just a little bit further, you can see the permitted schema types. And here we have string, number, date, buffer, Boolean, and a few others. Object ID is an important one that will be created automatically for us. So we will not have to specify an ID as you don't see one specified in their example either. So now let's go to Visual Studio Code and get started creating our schemas for both our employees' data and our users' data. Okay, I'm in Visual Studio Code and I've got the source code from the last tutorial. It's linked to below as the starter source code if you want to download or clone that. 
Right now we're going to go to the model folder and we've got employees.json and users.json because we were just using the Node.js file system to write to both of these files. And we're going to get rid of that eventually here as we replace everything with MongoDB. For now, just keep those files and we'll create new files for our schemas. And the first one will be called employee. And I'll spell that with a capital E and then just JS. And that's a naming standard. It won't really have an impact if you don't use the capital E. However, it's pretty much the consistent standard that I've seen. So first, let's define mongoose and require that. There we go. And now that we've got mongoose pulled in, we also need a schema with a capital S and that's going to equal mongoose dot schema once again with a capital S. Now that we have that, we can define our schema and let's call this employee schema and that can use camel case. We'll set this equal to a new schema, once again, capital S on schema. And now we can map out our data. And if you remember, our employees data was very simple. It just had a first name and a last name. So that's what we'll declare here. Now remember, uh, we will automatically have an object ID created for us. So we don't need an ID field here. And now we can say first name is type string. And then we can also say it's required and that accepts a Boolean. So we'll say true. That is absolutely required. And then we'll do the same for last name. And know what? We could just copy this down. Shift Alt and the down arrow for me on Windows in Visual Studio Code and make that the last name. And let's get rid of the comma there. And that's basically our schema. Very simple. We've got two string fields, first name and last name. Now at the end of the file, we need module.exports. And we're going to set this equal to mongoose.model. Now we're creating a data model right here. And we'll set this equal to employee, and that is uppercase uh, first letter and then not plural, once again, just like the name of the file, employee. And then we'll use the employee schema. Now by default, Mongoose, when it creates this model, will set this to lowercase and plural. So it will look for an employee's collection in MongoDB and the employees collection will be all lowercase and once again it will be plural and we can see that if we go back to the docs and we go to the models link in the docs there we go it says this in bold right here mongoose automatically looks for the plural lowercase version of your model name so in the example they give they have the word tank they defined here for the model and they passed in the string tank with a capital T, but it says for the example above, the model tank is for the tanks collection in the MongoDB database, and that's all lowercase and plural. All right, back to Visual Studio Code. Let's save this file and let's go ahead and create a user schema as well. Now our user data had just a little more to it. So this will be a little more interesting than just the first name and last name that we had in the employee schema. I'm just going to copy these imports here because we need the exact same thing at the beginning of basically every schema we create. And now I'm going to say user schema, camel case, this is equal to new schema, capital S on schema. And now we have a username in our data. And this is kind of like the first name, last name in the previous schema. It's type string and then required is true. After the username, we have roles. Now the roles data is a little bit different. So we had user, which was a possible role. And now let's specify some data or some details about the user role here inside of an object. And now we can set this to type number and we can put a default value. So if not specified, any user that's created will automatically 
be assigned the value of 2001. And that was our basic user value that we had previously uh, applied. And then the next role was editor, and that had a number. And then the next role was admin, and that had a number. Notice we're not providing default values, and we're not even saying they're required. Not everybody's an editor, not everybody's an admin. So these will only be added to the data that we decide to add them to as an admin could make those decisions. Okay, now that we've defined the roles, let's put in the password field. This is much like we had before. Type will be string and required will be true. And then after that, if you remember, we also store a refresh token. And when a user's created, they don't have a refresh token, but after they're authenticated, they get one. So this is a string, but it does not have a default value and it's not required because it's not always there. So now we've created our schema for our users and let's go ahead and export this. We'll say module.exports, set it equal to mongoose.model, so we're creating a data model, and this will be user, singular, and then mongoose will once again look for users, all lowercase plural, but we'll match our file name, so user, and then we'll use the user schema that we just created. Okay, we've created two basic schemas for our data, user and employee, and then we created models to be associated with those. Let's go ahead and implement the user schema and model, and let's attach that to one of our controllers, and let's do it with the register controller first. That makes sense where we'd create a new user, and now you'll see how much easier Mongoose makes interacting with the MongoDB collection than it is to write all of this stuff that we have been doing with the file system module and interacting with JSON files. So let's simplify this file and just switch it over to using MongoDB. So we're going to get rid of the user DB that we had up here. And let's just bring in the user model. So I'll define user with a capital U and set this equal to require. And now we need to go up out of the controller folder and into the model folder. And then we need the user model. After we do that, whoa, I lost something there. User model. There we go. After we do that, we can really get rid of the FS promises and path. We're not going to be writing to a file anymore or need that. We do still need to keep the bcrypt import. And now let's start making changes as we handle the new user here. And the, it'll start out the same. We need the user and password to come in from the request. And if we don't have those, we're going to send the same information back. That's a bad request. But now when we check for duplicates, we're interacting with a different database. So now this will change just a little and we'll still define duplicate, but how we get the duplicate is completely different. Notice we already have handle new user as an async function. So right here we're going to await and then use our user model and call find one. And now we'll pass in some information here. We're looking for a username that matches the user that we defined from our request. And after that, we need to call exec here at the end. Now not every mongoose method needs that on the data model, but this one in particular does. And that is because we could pass in a callback afterwards, like a error result, for example. But if you don't do that and you're using the async await uh, pattern here, then you need to put exec at the end of find one. And you can check that in the documentation under find one to uh, reference if you need that, or when you use any method that you're not sure of and you're using async await, you should check that. But this is going to return any user that matches the user that was passed in. And of course, we don't want a duplicate, so this is the same. If there is a duplicate, we need to send this 409 conflict there. After that, we need to handle the password in the same way. 
But after the password is created, our code is going to get much simpler. Let's go ahead and keep the new user, even though we will define this a little bit differently. But we're not going to use this or the FS promises. We don't need that console log there. Let's go ahead and keep the status 201 though, because that is what we want to send when we create the new user. With Mongoose, we can create and store, so I'll put create and store the new user all at once. And so what we'll do, instead of defining new user here, I'm going to define result, and I'm going to set result equal to await, then our user model dot create. And now we are creating a new user. And let's look inside to see what we're passing into the create to make sure we have everything we want or we don't want. Well, we do want the user name. And then we don't really need the roles here because remember, we have the default data in our schema. So it will be added automatically. So we can remove that. And then we pass the password and an object ID will be created automatically also. So this is all we really need to send through our data model and the username and password will be sent by us and then a role will automatically be created, a role value and an ID for the document will also be created. Now result will return the record that is created. So we could go ahead and log the result just to view the record in the console and I'll save that. I do want to discuss a couple of other ways a record could be created that you might see somewhere. I prefer to do it this way because it happens all at once. Just the user create and it is created and we get the result back. But you might also see something like const new user equals and then a new user with the model. And then of course you could set new user dot, I'm sorry, username, there we go, and set that equal to whatever data you had and use a dot notation that way to set the values. And at the end of all of that, you would want to save. So then you would say const result equals, and then you would have your await new user, and you would call save. And that would also work. However, that's just a little bit longer process. You might also see something like the new user being created and then passing that data in like we did inside of user create. So instead of using dot notation, you might see something like new user equals, well here we define new user, but then it's equal to a new user and you're passing in the values inside of the parentheses there. And then you would still need to have the result equals await new user dot save after you did this. And so this happens all at once when I use user create. And if I do it this other way and create a new user, then you have to have another line to actually save the new user. So I prefer the user dot create. Let's go ahead and save this. And now we're ready to test our register controller route. So let's open up a terminal. You can do that from the terminal menu or press control back tick, at least I can on Windows. And now I'm going to type npm run dev. And that should start up Nodemon and start our API server here just on localhost port 3500. We've got our message connected to MongoDB. Server's running on port 3500. I'm going to use Thunder Client to test everything out like I have in some previous tutorials. If you don't have it, you can install Thunder Client as an extension, and then it's right here after you have on the left. I'll click that, I've got some collections, and under Auth, I should have a registration route to test. And now I'm going to hide the left-hand menu over here because it looks much better and it's easier to read when it's the full screen. So here's the register route. See what we're sending in the body. Okay, I've got a user named Steve1 to create and then it's got a password and that's really all we need to send. Let's see if the register route works. New user Steve1 created and here's our object in the console. So now we can see what we've got. Username Steve1 
The role was created with user 2001. We've got our encrypted password and we've got a new object ID. And then notice this other field as well that's always added the two underscores and the V and the zero. You should always see that as well. If you're curious, the V is the version key and it keeps track of this and we can also increment this manually if we want to. Okay, now that we created Steve1, let's create another user and I'm gonna go back to my Walt1 that was an admin previously, so let's create him as well. And now new user Walt1 was created and if we look here in the console, we can also see that Walt1 was created down here and here's his information. Now, let's go to MongoDB and inside of MongoDB, we can check our company DB here, and we should be able to refresh. And now we have a user's collection as well, and you can see it has two documents. So let's look at the user's collection. All right, and we load the documents up, and here are the two records, or we could call them documents, really. I'm used to saying records with SQL. This is a NoSQL database, and it has collections instead of tables, and it has documents instead of records. So in either one of these, we can expand the object and see our user 2001 that was created. So we wanna make Walt an editor and an admin. So inside of MongoDB, here we're at mongodb.com and logged back into our account and we're looking at our collection inside of the company DB database that was created. And we'd created the employees uh, collection before but we had not created users. So when we created the first user, it also created the user's collection, which is interesting. But after that, we want to uh, edit Walt here, and we can do that right inside of mongodb.com. So let's edit, and now let's go ahead and add another role. Add field after user, and we'll put in editor, and the value for the editor was 1984. Okay, now we've completed that. Now let's add field after editor and we'll add admin and the value for the admin was 5150 if I remember correctly. And so now we've gone ahead and changed that information but we still need to click update here to update the document. Now the document is updated and Walt has all three roles in his document. Oh, but notice what happened here, and you wanna catch this if you do it, because I certainly just made the mistake. This was entered as a string, and this should be numeric data. So we want to get rid of that. We, we don't really need to remove that. We need to change the data type over here on the right. Notice how user 2001 is INT32. So we wanna choose that type here on the right, and make sure we have the right data type as we make changes here on mongodb.com to any given document. Okay, those changes have been made. Now let's update. And now we have the correct data type in Walt's roles, 2001, 1984, and 5150. Okay, going back to VS Code, and I'll close out of Thunder Client and close out of the terminal as well, but let's go ahead and show the file tree because we have changes to make in the controllers we need to go ahead and implement our user model instead of the JSON file we've been using in the refresh token controller, the logout controller, and the auth controller. And then we need to implement the employee model in the employees controller and change how some of this works, just like we did in the register controller. And that's what we'll be doing in the next tutorial, but my challenge to you is before then, go ahead and make the changes on your own and then compare to the tutorial that I released that makes the same changes. Today, we're going to apply the user and employee models to the remaining API routes and update the asynchronous CRUD operations accordingly. And before we finish, I'll show you an easy way to deploy your REST API to the web. We're going to start with the code from the last tutorial. If you don't have it, I have a link to the starter source code in the description below. Let's get started. We're looking at the user schema, and then of course we create a model here at the bottom. That's where we're starting, and we applied it to the register controller near the end of the last tutorial. 
and you can see we imported in the user model and this replaced what we had previously in the tutorial series which were JSON files. Now we're using MongoDB and we're interacting with MongoDB by using the mongoose schemas and models that we've created. So now let's apply our user model to the next route and instead of register, let's just move up one and go to the refresh token controller. Okay, you saw I copied the user model import from the register controller file, and I'm going to paste that right over the user's DB that we had previously defined to interact with the JSON file. So now we're bringing in the user model, and now we can update the handle refresh token function. We'll start out the same here where we define the cookie and of course get the JWT from the cookie if it exists, but then as far as checking to find a user, we have to do that differently. And let's go back to that register controller for just a second, because we did a very similar thing. We used user.find1 and we passed in the name of the user. Well, this time we won't have the username, but besides that it will be very similar. So let's highlight all of this where we were finding the refresh token inside of the JSON and let's paste in our user find one but now instead of the username we can just put refresh token here and that's because the property name and the value name or the uh, variable name are the same so instead of refresh token colon refresh token we can just put refresh token there we still need the exec here to execute and that is because we're using async await and that means we need to put async up here above which I almost forgot so let's put async up here by handle refresh token and make this an async function and we'll use await here and then we search for the refresh token inside of a document within the user collection. After that everything essentially remains the same because we have defined the found user if we found the refresh token or not and of course if not it's a 403 forbidden but after that we're using the same definitions as before so there's nothing else to change in the refresh token route so we can save the file and move on to the logout controller okay we'll start the same in the logout controller and we will not need the fs promises or path either so we can just highlight all of that and paste our well that's not the user model is it so let's change that control Z to undo that. I'll go back here to the register controller where I copied the user model import before. I'll copy that again, back to the logout controller, highlight all of that and paste because that's what we need is the user model imported. After that, we already have the note here on client, also delete the access token. Again, this is the logout route and that's fine. The next three lines, just as before, are fine and then we need to say is the refresh token in the database well that sounds familiar that's just like we used in the refresh token controller so we come back to the refresh token controller I'll scroll up where we had our await user find one and passed in the refresh token copy that come back to the logout this is already an async function that's good so now we can once again define the find found user in the same way and now after that, this remains the same, but now this gets much simpler where we delete the refresh token. We're no longer interacting with any of this JSON here. So let's just highlight all of this and delete, and we can make a few changes. We can say found user dot refresh token, and we can erase it simply by setting it to an empty string. And then we can set a result and we'll set that equal to await found user dot save and that will save our changes back to our mongodb document that is stored in the user collection and after we do that we could go ahead and log the result if we'd like to see that because that will return the newly updated information and that's just for our purposes there you would of course delete that before you put it in production and that's all the changes so we can save that and again uh, remember that found user this is a document now that we have found if it existed and therefore we're able to update that document with the save okay i'll scroll back up to the top and i'm going to copy that user model import one more time because we need it in the auth controller 
Once again, I'll highlight the users DB that we previously had and paste in the user model instead. I'm going to go ahead and delete this line between bcrypt and JWT. We need both of those, but we can go ahead and once again delete FS promises and path, which we should no longer need. These first two lines are the same. We'll keep both of them, but then once again with found user, I think you see the pattern now. Now we're back to looking at a user name though. So we can take this and go back to the register controller where we had the username with find one and copy that line, go back to the auth controller, and then we can paste that in as we find the user and save because the next line is fine as well. And then the password is evaluated and we're not changing anything about that. And really we won't make any changes until we come down here once again to where we were interacting with the file and we will be saving the refresh token with the current user. So once again, we can delete everything we had here down to the response cookie. And let's leave a blank line in between. And then we can once again say found user, which is our document that we have found and set the refresh token. We're going to set that equal to the refresh token that we now have here in the auth controller. And then let's define result again and let's set result equal to await found user dot save. And that will update the document back at MongoDB. And let's go ahead and log that result again as well. So that should also look very familiar. And that completes the auth controller. So I know we tested the register controller, the register route in the last tutorial, but now we'll want to go back and test all the rest of these. So we've got the refresh token route, we've got a logout route, and of course, we've got the auth route as well. So now let's test those once again with Thunder Client. If you don't have Thunder Client installed, it's an extension for Visual Studio Code. And you get that right here under extensions and search for Thunder Client, and then you'll have it on the left. And this is Thunder Client. It allows you to save collections, which I've already saved to match up to this. But before we can test it, we actually need to start our dev server. I'm going to press control back tick. You could also go to the terminal menu at the top and choose a new terminal window that way. Then we type npm run dev to launch our dev server. And we should be running on 3500 and connected to MongoDB here in a second when it gives us our information. And there we see both connected to MongoDB, server running on port 3500. So it's now ready to test. So I've saved a collection named auth. And then here we have different routes. If I can see which route we have here, it looks like this is the register route. Let's go ahead and try that. I'm going to click Thunder Client to hide the left hand side so we can see better. And let's look at the body to see what we're going to register. We're going to register a user Walt1 with the password. I believe he's already registered, so we should get a 409 conflict back. Let's see what we get. That's exactly right, 409 conflict. So let's change this to Tom1. I don't believe I have Tom1 in my collection of users. So now we'll send this. And 201 created, so we have a new user created. Our register route is working. Now let's go back to Thunder Client and look at the other routes. That was the register route. Now that we've registered, let's test the auth route. Now let's see who we want to authorize. Well, I believe Walt1 was already created. We confirm that, so we can just send in this information to authorize, and we send it in, and we've got a new access token back and everything is okay, he is authorized. And of course you see down here, we're logging these responses that we're also getting back, these console log statements that had the result. And that's what we see here is the user that we've pulled in is Walt1. Okay, I'm going to pull this down and I'm going to authorize again because if you remember right, uh, we only get an access token the way we have it set that works for about 30 seconds. But really, I guess we're not testing that. So wait a minute, we're not, we're not too worried about that because we're going to test either the logout or refresh token route. Let's test that refresh token route that I have in a separate collection. And so with the refresh token, we're sending a cookie. It says no cookies available, but I think we have a cookie. Let's try it out. 401 unauthorized, we did not get a cookie. 
I think we're running into our secure site error where Thunder Client doesn't let us test, even though we need that secure site option in there for Chrome. So let's take this out temporarily. I'm in the auth controller as we issue the refresh token. Let's take this out and put it in a comment near the end. In production, once again, you would want this back in there. However, we can't test it with Thunder Client with it in there. So let's go ahead and save now. And once we've got the server updated, let's go ahead and run the auth again. And then we should be able to test the refresh. And now we're up and running, connected to MongoDB, server running on port 3500. Let's try this again in Thunder Client. We'll go to the auth first, hide this over here. I'll go ahead and log in. And we've got a cookie. Let's go to the refresh now and come back before we were unauthorized. But let's see if this works now. And yes, it does. Our cookie works. You just have to take that secure out while testing with Thunder Client. So the refresh route is working. We have tested the register route. We have tested the auth route. We've tested the refresh route. What is left is the logout route. So once again, we'll probably need a fresh login to ensure we are logging out correctly. So let's go to the auth. And now let's see who we're logging in. It looks like Walt1. That's fine. We'll send that. And now let's go to the log out route and we'll come over here in Thunder Client. And it looks like we actually don't need to send anything. It's just going to log out the refresh token. That's right. So we'll just send. And 204, no content. That's fine. We didn't expect any content to come back. But we can see down here because we logged the result, we logged out. There's the route. We went ahead and logged out and we logged out our user Walt1 and we set the refresh token to an empty string. Okay, those updates using the user model were not too bad at all. Let's go back to the file and what we want to do now is update the employees controller with the employee model. And this will be just a little bit more work than what we had previously had. But we'll start out once again by eliminating the JSON file. And let's go ahead and import our employee model. So we'll have const employee, and we'll set that equal to require. And then we need to go up one folder, find the model folder, and then employee. That is correct. And now let's look at our get all employees route. Well, before we just grab the JSON and return that. Now this will be just a little bit more uh, to do with MongoDB. And of course, this will be an async operation. So let's remove this response JSON for now. And we'll define employees. And let's set this equal to await employee.find. And by calling find like this, it will return all of the employees. Then we can say if there are no employees, we're going to return. And then we'll send a response with a status 204, which is no content, and then JSON, and we'll send a message here. And in our JSON message, we'll just say it's a string, no employees found. And after that, we'll assume we do have employees if we've made it this far. So we'll say response.json, and we'll send the employees. And I can see I've got an error. I put brackets instead of curly braces. Go ahead and eliminate that bracket and replace this one as well. And we should be good. So let's go ahead and save this. Now let's look at the create new employee function, which will also be async. So let's start here. And with that, we can probably go ahead and change quite a few things that we have in here. So I'm just going to highlight all of this and remove it. And after that, we'll start out with an if statement, but different than we have below. This will be if a request, and now we can use optional chaining to say as a body, and then if it has a first name, because we need all of that, or we can say the same thing about the last name. Essentially, we're saying if there is no first name or last name, and we would expect the request to have a body, but for some reason, if it doesn't, we'll catch that as well. So if we don't have any of those, let's go ahead and send a response here, and we'll return 
Spots.status, and this would be a 400 because it would be a bad request. And here's JSON curly braces this time. Message, and our message will be first and last names are required. And you can see we had something very similar below, but it was just a little different than that. So now let's eliminate that as well. And let's just go ahead and delete these lines too. And we'll start over just a little bit and put an extra line there. And we'll do a try catch block. And of course we have the catch after. And there's our error. And if we catch an error, let's just console error the error. Okay, but in the try block, now let's define a result and set this equal to await Use our employee model, and now we're create. We'll create a record here, and we'll say first name is request.body.first name, and last name would be much the same pattern, request.body.last name. And I'll put my semicolon here and save. But we still need to send a response. So we'll say response.json. Oh, let's put a status first. And the status here would be a 201, which stands for created. And then we'll send the result back with the record that we have created. Okay, let's scroll down now and look at the update employee. Once again, it will be an async function. And after that, we'll start out a little differently. So let's go ahead and delete. And well, we don't need to delete that line. Let's just delete the top line to begin with. Okay, so we'll start out with if and once again, request, and let's use optional chaining, body, and now we're looking for an ID. And if we don't have the ID, we'll return response status 400. And after that, we can just give a message in JSON. And let's see if it's the same message that we have below. Not quite the same. So here, let's add a little message different and we'll say, message and ID parameter is required. Okay, so we've confirmed we now have an ID if we make it to the next spot. And here we can define our employee. So we'll say const employee and set this equal to await, call our employee model and we'll use find one here. And now, remember MongoDB uses an underscore ID. It automatically generates that. And we're going to compare that to request.body.id that is passed in as a parameter. And after that, we need to call the exec at the end to call that function into action. Now let's go ahead and delete the next line here. And we can say, if there's no employee, return status, let's change this to a 204 because it's not really a bad request at this point. It just means that they requested an ID that doesn't exist. They might have issued the request properly. But now let's say something just a little different. We'll say no employee matches and ID. And now let's get rid of this at the end and get rid of the not found part. No employee matches whatever ID was passed in there. Okay, so we're sending our status 204. We'll save that much. Now let's look at this. If the request.body, and let's go ahead and optionally chain first name and last name. And then we can say employee first name equals the request.body first name and last name is the same. That's fine. So we're just optionally chaining. That's all we changed there that's different than we had before. And now this gets much simpler here. We're not sorting any JSON data or uh, creating new IDs or anything there. So let's remove all of that and we'll just say const result equals await employee. Notice this is the employee document we've created or we've found. Actually, we didn't create. It's the employee here, not the employee model, but employee.save. And now we've saved any changes we've made to this employee document. And then instead of data employees, we'll just send the result we've defined here and save. And that is our update employee function. Okay, let's scroll up and take a look at delete employee, which should also get a little simpler. 
but we're going to start out much like we did before. So we'll say if there is no request and we'll optionally chain body and then we'll optionally chain the ID and we're going to return response.status 400 and that should also be JSON and here we'll have a message and our JSON will say employee ID required and put the semicolon there. And now we need to define our employee again, which will be much the same as we had before, really. It's the find one with the body ID. So let's just scroll up here and copy exactly what we had before and come down. And here we have defined the employee ID again. And so then our employee not found will probably be the same as well. So we can copy that and come down here as well and just copy this over and paste. And then after that, we will not be filtering. So let's just remove these lines here once again. And we'll say const result equals await employee.delete one. Now instead of find one, and here once again, this will be underscore ID, and then it will be the request.body.id that was passed in. We do not need an exec after delete one. And then we will put in the result. And if you're wondering why we don't need the exec here, it's just all based on the documents. So once again, look at mongoosejs.com and those docs, and you'll see which different methods you need to put that after and which ones you don't. And finally, let's check the get employee route as well. And we need to put in a check as we had before with the other. So let's check the request. If there's no request dot params this time. And then of course we're looking for an ID once again. And we have a similar message at the end. So let's just copy this over and paste it in because that is required. And now we need to find an employee again so we can copy the same line as we've defined the employee before. And we'll come back down here and set employee equal to the find one statement. If we don't find the employee, well, that's a repeat of this. So I'll just copy this return line here and paste it in here. And then we're already set because we just wanna return the employee as we were before, as this is the get employee route or handler just for the one employee. And of course, we're expecting that ID parameter to be sent in. So let's save that. And we have completed our async functions. Let's put async with that as well. And if we didn't with the others, it looks like I also forgot to do that with the delete employee. Let me check the rest. Uh, we need to have all of these functions as async functions and they complete the different CRUD operations, create, read, update, and delete for the employee's collection. Before we test the routes, there is one error to fix. Notice I was using params as we're using a git route to pull that in, but I put request body.id in the function and this needs to be params.id to access that value that we get from the URL in the route. Okay, so now that we have fixed this and we're now using params, let's test the routes. And we need a JWT to be authorized. So let's go ahead and use the auth route. You might wanna change your code to timeout or for a longer timeout duration than 30 seconds. Mine is set to 30 seconds, so I've got to be a little fast to test these routes, but let's go ahead and get authorized. Now we've got a new access token. We can jump back over here. I'll open the employees routes. I want to get all employees. And now for the authorization, I need to paste in the new token. And we get our one employee, Walt Walters. I'm going to copy his ID, open the terminal window, and just paste his ID down there because I'm going to need it to test the individual get employee route. So we'll come back now and get authorized once again, collapse the employees API routes and check the authorization, get a new access token. Once we've got the new access token, go back to the employees API, go to the get an employee route, an individual employee, and 
I'll paste that token in here and I need the ID to put in the URL. And I'll paste that in and send. And we get Walt Walters back. Once again, now that we're using the request.params.id for this route because the user ID is read directly from the URL as it is a Git request. Okay, let's get authorized once again and then we'll come back and test the post. Here is the auth route. Again, we'll send, get a new token. Back to Thunder Client, open the employees APIs. Look at the post an employee. Here's the new auth. Paste that in. Look at the body. We've already got Walt Walters. Let's change this to Dave. Walters is good. Now we have Dave Walters as an employee that was created, a status 201, which is created. One more authorization to go so we can test the put, I guess two more, and then the delete as well. So let's go here and authorize once again. New access token. Come back to the put route. And let's see what we need here. Let's put in the access token. And in the body, oh, we need to specify the ID once again. Well, let's, and we change a first name to David. Let's go back, and I believe in the Git employee route, I still have that ID that we used before. Oh, and it's still down here in the node uh, terminal as well. So we could pull it out of there. So let's reauthorize. New access token. We will come back to the employees, use put. And for put, we need to put in the new access token. And then in the body, we need the employee ID. So I'm going to paste that in here and we'll change Walt to David. And now we have David Walters. And of course, there's already a Dave Walters as well. So the put route works. And now we want to delete. And we'll, of course, we'll delete this same user that we still have the ID handy for. So let's reauthorize one more time. Get a new access token. We have the new access token. Copy that. Go to the employees routes. Delete an employee, paste in our new access token, and in the body, we once again need the employee ID. We paste in that ID, and we get returned the employee that was deleted. So David Walters is no longer in our collection, but it was returned by the delete route uh, as a confirmation that this employee was deleted. Okay, so from here, what you should do is go ahead and create a user's JS in the routes and then API folder and allow some user information to be requested. Maybe get all users and maybe delete users and set that up so it can be accessed in the route by admin only, such as roleslist.admin, because that's the users. And I'll let you do that on your own, but I will put it in the completed repository that I will post to link below. So there'll be a link to the starter code and then a link to the completed code as well. But before I go, I want to show you how you can easily launch a repository and if that repository create or has a node application like this REST API, it will easily be deployed. Okay, there are several places on the web where you can host your node project and even a REST API using Express and Mongo like we've created. I'm going to show you one of the easiest ways to deploy a project like this, and we're going to deploy to glitch.com. So I'm going to put in another bold statement here and say, will not start, let's just say deploy by clicking the button above. Okay, now that we've put that in, I'm going to copy and paste some code, but I'm going to just change which project it was for. So this code will put a button on the readme of the repository that I share to glitch, or not to glitch, to GitHub. And then when the button is clicked, it will launch 
on glitch. So here we have to put in the name of the current project. And so I am put Mongo Async CRUD, I believe I named this project. And I'll save. And we can verify here by, I'll go back and let's see, I named this Mongo Async CRUD, that is correct. So I'll open up the terminal window and I'll push my changes to GitHub that I've already initialized the repository. So I'll add the file and I'll commit messages updated readme and I'll push to GitHub and I need a passphrase set up with mine. And there we go. I've pushed that to GitHub. And so now if we go back and look at the readme, for this repository, there should be a button that's available and it says remix this and that will allow you to go ahead and launch this application on Glitch. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll just click the button. It takes just a minute to load the project and it will be up and running except for one thing. And that one thing is the values that we have decided to put in our .env. Remember the .env file should be listed in your git ignore. So it is not here. And notice the uh, remix button is much larger once it gets to glitch. That's interesting. Okay, so once again, looking at the git ignore, you should have your .env file here. So the secrets that you have stored in the .env need to go in the .env that is provided here at glitch. And you can, of course, click this to learn how to use environment variables. We've already talked about that. So you can add a variable. And here is where you would type like access token secret, I believe is what we named one of ours. And then you would paste in your value for that. You would do the same for the refresh token secret. And you would also want to do the same for the uh, string. You put in the connection string that we used for Mongoose and MongoDB. But this is just an example to show you how you can go ahead and launch that. So what I'm going to do is leave that button in the readme and I'll put a little extra note in the readme saying remember to add your own values in the .env because you can click that button right there in my repository and from there you can bring back up this project in Glitch. And if you create an account at Glitch, you can save it there as well. So that will help you launch any future node application you might create. And this would allow you to put a button in your repositories and launch them as well. And I think you'll like working with Glitch also. I use it for several things. And I should add that once you're on Glitch and you have your project launched, it will give it a name like this. And then you'll have your live project. You can click change URL here and you'll see the URL for your project. So that would be the URL for your API. So that is what you would want to go to for your API. And then the uh, endpoints would go, of course, after this if you're trying to pull up any specific endpoint. So we have covered a lot in this series. And of course, there is much more depth you could go into as you dive into the docs. But I feel like we've covered the create, read, update, and delete for Mongo and MongoDB. We've built a full REST API with Node and Express, and we have added user authentication. We have talked about authorization and uh, JSON web tokens as well to protect those routes. So if we talk about next steps, you would want to take what we have built and what we have built here on the back end using Mongo, Express, and Node could be combined with React for the MERN stack. So if you haven't learned React, you want to check out my nine hour beginners tutorial for that. And you can combine that knowledge with this back end course knowledge to complete the MERN stack. However, you could also add whichever front end technology you wanted to this back end with Mongo, Express, and Node for whatever application you wanted to create. Remember to keep striving for progress over perfection, and a little progress every day will go a very long way. Please give this video a like if it's helped you, and thank you for watching and subscribing. You're helping my channel grow. Have a great day, and let's write more code together very soon.